Yes, I'm serious. Today, we'll be doing 100 limits, and of course, we'll be doing them in one take. I know, finally, right? And you know the deal. The file is in the description for your convenience already, so go ahead and download them and work out the questions along the way. We will cover everything that you have to know for Calculus 1, Calculus 2, including how to determine the limits from the graph, and then how to do the algebraic limits, and also the definition of derivatives, L'Hopital's rule, and we also talk about the epsilon delta definition, and also, yeah, this kind of very long limits at the very end. So, yep, you're going to have tons to learn in this video. I don't know how long it's going to take, but let's just go ahead and get started. Here we go. So we're given the graph of the function. So this right here is just going to be y is equal to f of x. And then you can see a better picture on the file. So seriously, look at the PDF. All right, so first off, we are going to find the value for f of 3. So the way to read this is that x is exactly equal to 3. This is not a limit question. So we go to x is exactly 3. Do not look at the open circle, but rather you have to look at the closed circle, and the value for that is 4. So the answer for this right here is 4, and then we are done. Then we are going to take a look at the limit as x approaching 3 of the function. So here's the deal. You see how we do not have the plus or minus here? We actually have to do both. So look at when we have the positive version right here. This means we are approaching the 3 right, when x is 3, from the right. So you can use your right hand, and then you're approaching, and look at the y value, and you see the y value is approaching 2. So when x is approaching 3+, plus, we get 2. So keep that in mind. And then we also have to do the minus, meaning that you can use your left hand, because we're approaching 3 from the left hand side. So you can start right here, because it's approaching here, and you see it's like this. And the y value is also approaching 2. So when x is approaching 3 minus, we also get 2. And 2 and 2 are the same. So the answer for this right here, when there is no plus or minus, well, the answer is just equal to 2. Right? Keep that in mind. And you see how these two questions are very different. This is the typical look at the graph, look at the closed circle question. And this right here, you really have to start to worry about the calculus part for limits. All right, now let's see f of 2. f of 2, we go to x is equal to 2, uh, that's the vertical acetal. Right? There's no dot. Well, technically, the reason I put tons of cut is just because of the vertical acetal. But yeah, we do not have the value of the function over there. So in this case, what we say is undefined. And there's a small difference between undefined versus does not exist. Both of them kind of mean that we do not have the answer, but undefined is when we are talking about the value of a function or computation. So just keep that in mind. If the limit doesn't have the answer, then we say the limit doesn't exist. All right, here, lastly, we have the limit as x approaching 2. Well, again, we do not have the plus or minus, we check both. If we go to the 2 from the right, you see that the curve is going straight up, so that's past infinity. And if we approach 2 from the left-hand side, you see the curve is also going straight up. So both are going straight up, meaning positive infinity. So be sure we check both, all right? So that's pretty much it. However, let me just give you guys two more, like, uh, extra practice. Yeah, this is not on the file to make you guys feel special. Because we have the horizontal as the best will, and that's the case when x is approaching past infinity. This means x is all the way to the right. And when you have the picture right here, you see how it's impossible for us to include everything? So you will just have to kind of just assume that, okay, it's just going to follow this pattern. The y value is going to approaching 1. All right? So you are not going to see like this and then say, oh, no. No, nobody will do that to you. Hopefully, that's not the case. Especially on the test, if you are given a graph, nobody will do that to you. However, though, if you are using a graphing calculator, if you are graphing like a weird function, maybe you have to worry about it, but yeah, that's a different story. Anyway, <clears throat> limit as x approaching negative infinity f of x. This case, we are approaching left, 
all right and then if you look here a better picture from the file it's actually approaching one as well so this is more like this right? it's more like that yeah so here are some terminologies that we'll also like to go over you see how when x is approaching infinity we get one this means we have a vertical so this means we have a horizontal asymptote when y is equal to one right that's the horizontal dash line right here and likewise we also have one so you don't have to write down the one twice so we have a horizontal asymptote at y is equal to one and you see how when x is approaching two the function this limit gives us infinity this means the function is going straight up sometimes you may have negative infinity meaning go straight down that's the case that we have vertical asymptote so vertical asymptote at x equals 2 so that's the vertical dashed line right over there so there you have it this is the first question and we have just a couple more to go and um, yeah so let me just erase this um, for the first couple questions just maybe use the timestamps to navigate especially uh, because I will have to take some time to graph the function so yeah I will try to I will also try to give my best graph possible for you guys on the board let me see if I can there we go okay number two right number two again look at the file much better that way anyway I'm just gonna give you guys the important values so here we have a uh, two right here of course that will be important and you will see that the curve looks like this and then we have an open circle here and this is at negative three and then when we have the other piece is up here and then we have a closed circle and then we have this part and of course this is our function um couple parts first part f of two let's do this first so this means when x is exactly equal to two go here and look at the closed circle so up here and look at the y value three done f of two equals three and you guessed it part b we will have the limit as x approaching two this right here is going to be slightly different than the ones that we did uh, from the first question. Firstly, we will have to again do the plus or minus on the side because it didn't have that. So you really have to check both. So before we answer this question, let me just do this in blue. What's the limit as x approaching 2? Let's do the positive version first. So in this case, we are approaching 2 from the right. So we we'll see, okay. The y file is approaching 3, right? So just kind of look at this and then approaching 3. So this is 3. However, if you look at the limit as x approaching 2 minus, meaning from the left hand side, just the left hand, right? starting from here and then just kind of go to 2. But you see the y value is approaching negative 3. So this right here will give us negative 3. And notice that 3 is not equal to negative 3. Therefore, the answer for this, we do not have the answer. And again, just like what I said earlier, when we are talking about limits, the way that we answer it is does not exist. So I'll just put on D and E. I really don't know why I like to put on dots. But anyway, I will spell this out at least one time. This abbreviates does not exist and the reason that we really say does not exist is because when we ask the limit we like to ask is there a number or does there exist a number that the function is approaching when x is approaching a certain number if it's a no then you answer it does not exist there is no such a number so i think that's the reason why c limit as x approaching infinity of the function well this means x is all the way to the right and again don't worry about like this being like no no 
when, when the curve is like this, you see that the Wi-Fi is approaching zero. So yeah, this is zero. And then if the question also asks you for like, okay, what's the horizontal asthole? From here, we can say the horizontal asthole is y equals zero, right? So if the question is asking us for limit, we get zero. Or if the question is asking us, find the horizontal asthole, we do that and then we say y is equal to zero. All right, d limit x approaching negative infinity of the function. This means we go all the way to the left and the y value is approaching zero. And you do not have to write the horizontal twice because they are the same, right? So, yep, that is number two. And then again, we just have a couple more to go. How are you guys doing? Are you guys taking your Calc 1 or Calc 2 classes? Let me know. And uh, I'm going to check. Yeah, periodically, because I'm using my phone, I want to make sure that uh, my phone is recording and uh, I'm also charging it. Hopefully nothing goes wrong. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, though, number three. This right here looks a little weirder or more weird. Anyway. Okay. So here is the picture. Firstly, I will give you guys the horizontal as the hopes. It's like we have a horizontal dashed line here, and then likewise here, this is going to help me to draw the pictures. And then we have a curve goes like this, and up, and then flat, and then, okay, and then flat, and then like this, and then like so. And when let's say here is two, and then let me just get rid of that, and then we have a closed circle here, and the void point for the closed circle is negative one, and then here is one, and then here is actually. I will just tell you because my picture is going to be really bad. So yeah, this right here is meant to be one point five. And this right here is meant to be y is equal to 2, all right? So yeah, it's, yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll try to fix it a little bit. Okay. Maybe slightly better, maybe worse. Ah, uh, this is worse. Do you think I'm going to edit the video? No, I'm not. So just be patient and then use the timestamp to navigate, as I said. Anyway. This right here is two, all right? This is horizontal asthole. Let's finish this equation as quickly as possible because the picture doesn't look nice. Anyway, here is number three. And um, first question, part A, what is the value for f of two? That means x is exactly two. You look at the y value, the dot right here, right? So it's negative one. So f of two is negative one, done. B, you can guess it. What's the limit as x approaching two of the function f of x? Well, when we're talking about the limit as x approaching 2, we do not care when x is exactly 2, right? So the answer is actually not negative 1. But rather, you see how the curve is approaching, what? The y is approaching 1.5. When we go from the right, and then if we go from the left, the curve is also approaching the y value 1.5. It's pretty much the y value of this open circle, especially when you have the left and right point the left and right end, like they are approaching to the same open circle. So it's that 1.5. And in this particular case, you see how originally we have a curve, but like we're just missing that, like that little hole, right? This right here is actually called the uh, removable discontinuity. So removable, removable discontinuity. And the reason that it is removable, it means that imagine if you just fill in the open circle, guess what? The curve right here will be continuous. That's why you can remove it, meaning that because you can just fix it easily. You can fill in the circle and then no more discontinuous business. <clears throat> All right, number three. 
limit x approaching infinity up, 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 and we have a horizontal as stop here. Y is 2, right? So it's 2. And again, here it tells us horizontal as stop y equals 2. And then last question limit as x approaching negative infinity all the way to the left and the y value here you can look at the picture on the file it's approaching negative 2 and guess what if the question is asking us to find the horizontal asymptotes in fact we will have two horizontal asymptotes this is the first one and the other one is y equals negative 2 the truth is when we have a function it can have at most two horizontal asymptotes in this case, you can see that we have one here and one there. You may say that, hey, this picture is just that we just graph it randomly, right? But in fact, inverse tangent also has two horizontal asymptotes. And you might be wondering how many vertical asymptotes that we have? Infinitely many, because if you look at tangent x, it does have infinitely many vertical asymptotes. By the way, that's it for this right here. All right, number four. It's a funny looking picture, kind of. It's pretty though. Okay, 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 like this, okay. And then the Y value here is two. And then open circle here. And then we have a wave. Okay, something like this. Yeah, and then just kind of continue like this. So here's the deal, whenever you are given like a picture like this, uh, just kind of follow along what's the trend of the curve. In, in this case, it continues. It's like a sine or cosine. It's more like a sine curve because it starts with zero right here, right? Okay, part A. Let's find the value for f of zero. This means when x is exactly zero, right? x value exactly zero, we look at the closed circle, Go up here, the y is 2. So the answer here is 2. Done. Yay. B. <clears throat> the limit as x approaching 0, f of x. What do you guys think? I'll tell you first. The answer does not exist. Why? Because again, we do not have the plus or minus, so we actually have to do both. And if we look at the limit as x approaching 0 plus, the y value is approaching 0, right? The y value is approaching 0 when we go from the right. So this right here is 0. However, if we look at the limit as x approaching 0 minus, use your left hand, you see the y value is approaching 2. And again, when we are talking about the limit, we do not care about when x is exactly 0. Right? You see, approaching and the y value here is 2 when we go from the left hand side. And you see 0 and 2, they are definitely not equal. That's why the limit does not exist when x is approaching 0. However, though, if this is the question, then this is the answer. If this is the question, that's the answer. So you, can have to, you, you will have to in answer it individually. But for this, does not exist is the answer because the positive and the, neg the minus version they do not equal. <clears throat> All right, limit as x approaching positive infinity. Do we have any horizontal asymptote? No, because again, if you follow the curve, it keeps going up and down, up and down, right? So the value of the function does not approach to a y value as x goes to infinity. So here, this right here, we also say doesn't exist. Right? Doesn't exist. D, limit as x approaching negative infinity f of x. This means x is up approaching to the left all the way, right? So, ready? 
So again, this if this is the picture, then all the way at all the way that way, then uh, do not just say hey, it's going to come down. No, 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 nobody is going to do that to you, all right? If, if a test is like that, then people will be upset. But anyway, though, yeah, that's the case. So the answer is past the infinity, and because the Wi-Fi is all the way uh, out, all the way up. So this is D, and then this is number four. First page done. Cool, huh? But I know it's just a lot of graphs. That's why. And I know I dropped the microphone. Hopefully, uh, it's okay. Because in fact, this is my new microphone because the previous microphone. Yeah, it, I don't know what happened, but I, it just got bad. And uh, I, I'm pretty sure it's because I dropped a lot. No, but I dropped a few times. Yeah, let me just use that. I don't know how many is the last, but anyway. Number five, number five. If, because I dropped it earlier and then the stone went back and then I broke it, that was suck because I, I cannot hear how the sound is recorded right now. This is question number five on the 96 questions to, to go. Anyway, all right, number five. This is a famous question, right? So the curve looks like this. Somewhat like that, right? And in fact, here we still have an open circle. I would like to tell you guys the function. Well, no, not yet. Let me just give you guys the questions first. Let's go over them without knowing what the function is. Firstly, what's f of zero? Here, if you look at this right here, f of zero, right? when x is zero, which is right here, if you look up, that's just an open circle. There's no answer for that, right? So f of zero right here is an defined. So that's the answer for that, okay? And then if you look here at part b, if we do the limit as x approaching zero of the function, this right here, if you look at the y over here, it's actually one. So if you approach from the right, the y value is 1. If we approach from the left, the y value is also approaching 1. So the answer for this right here is 1. All right, so that's pretty good legit. C, limit x approaching infinity. As you can see, the curve is like this, right? And then it's going to get like uh, more flat and flat. In fact, this is not like sine curve. The y value is actually approaching zero. So in this case, it's zero. And again, if you look at the picture here, it's much better to see it, right? The y value is just approaching zero. Similarly, the left hand side, it does not go up like down like that. It's not like a wave. The wave kind of die down. So d limit x approaching negative infinity f of x is also equal to zero okay all right so as i said, said earlier i will let you tell you guys what this function is because we are going to see this again later on this function is rather famous this is actually just uh f of x equals to sine x over x all right so that's why you can see that when x is equal to zero it's undefined because we actually have a zero on the bottom, so it does not work. And then from number two, I would like to tell you this is what I call the limit, because this is perhaps the most debatable or controversial limit or whatnot. When we have the limit as x approaching zero of this function, sine x over x, per number two, you can see that right when Per part B, you can see that the y value is approaching 1. So, yeah, the answer for this right here is 1. Keep this in mind. This is one of the secret weapon. And later, I will just change the x to theta, and you will see uh, how we will utilize that. All right? So, this right here, I also want to tell you guys that the limit as x approaching infinity is 0, likewise, x approaching negative infinity is 0. One quick way to see is you can put infinity to the top, 
Well, sine is in between of negative 1 and 1. But if you have infinity on the bottom, guess what? It's like 1 divided by infinity, which is 0. Or negative 1 divided by infinity, which is 0. Yeah. So either way, but like, if you look at the picture, again, the wave kind of died down. That's why it's 0. And then likewise, that it's also 0. However, if we look at the typical sine curve, which is like the one that we did earlier, so this is sine x, then the limit as x approaching infinity of sine x, this right here doesn't exist, right? Doesn't exist. Likewise, the limit as x approaching negative infinity of sine x, this right here also doesn't exist. Uh, but when we divide it by the x, then we end that with zero. So um, some of the crazier cases that you might have not seen before because uh, yeah, it's the starting of calculus. So maybe you have not seen this kind of function with this kind of curves before, especially that one. So I want to just mention that. But we will encounter that a lot more later. Cool. So the first five questions, <coughs> Are the ones that I gave you guys the graph and then you are going to figure out the limits and then the next five I will just give you guys a function and then we are going to see how to get the limits so ladies and gentlemen number six consider we have the function 1 over x minus 2 you have a couple ways to do the following questions um, by a couple Wait, I mean like two ways. One is you come up with the graph first. Two, you don't use the graph, so kind of up to you. I will show you guys both. Let me show you how we can do it without the graph. Suppose this is the function. Part A, we want the limit as x approaching 2 of the function f of x. All right, here's the deal. If we do not use the graph, then I will just put a 2 into this x and see what happens. And uh, if I do that, I'll just do some scratch work right here on the side because this is not like a legitimate computation. Put a 2 into this x, we get 1 over 2 minus 2, which it looks like we have 1 over 0, right? What does this mean? Well, let me tell you. If we have a number over 0 when we are doing limits, either we get positive infinity or negative infinity. What I mean by that is just that we will have to worry about the sign if it's positive or negative when we are doing this. But how though? By putting 2. No, we cannot put in inside 2. So that's the deal. Here's the thing. Again, when x is approaching 2, there's no plus or minus. We actually have to do both. Let's check the limit as x approaching 2. Let's do the positive version first. And then the function is 1 over x minus 2, yeah? So let's see. When we, two, when we put 2 plus into here, we are going to get 1 over 2 plus minus 2. 2 plus is just like a number slightly bigger than 2. Just think about it like that. And you can think about it as like 2.0001. So earlier when we do like 2 minus 2, not so much, this is better. 2 plus minus 2, this right here is approaching 0. 2 minus 2 is 0, but this right here is a little bit more than 2. So this 0 is actually a little bit more than 0. So this is technically 0 plus. Okay, And then on the top we still have the 1. So we have 1 over 0 plus. And when we have 1 over 0 plus, when we're doing limits, this right here, positive over positive, we get positive, and then you get infinity. Whenever we are doing this kind of like computation, if we have 0 plus or 0 minus on the bottom, if the top is non-zero, then you are going to expect to get either positive infinity or negative infinity. And again, just work out the sign. So this right here gives us positive infinity. Okay? And then, Let's see if we have the limit as x approaching 2 minus and then 1 over x minus 2. Same thing. Put this right here now. We are getting 1 over 2 minus and minus 2. 
This right here is a little bit less than 2, like 1.999. This minus that, yes, it's like 0, but technically it's less than 0, just a little bit. That's why it's 0 minus. On the top it is 1. 1 over 0 minus. 0 minus is negative, because again, just think about this as 1.999 minus 2. We get negative small number. 0 minus is a negative. So we will end up with, again, you have infinity, but just have to work out the sign. Positive over negative, we have negative. So this right here gives us negative infinity. So you see, this and that, they are not equal. So it's like a, it's like a sad face. That's why the answer for this right here is does not exist. Okay, does not exist. Okay, part B, let's look at the limit as x approaching infinity of the function f of x. So for this one right here, let's see, if we put infinity to the function, then we are going to get 1 over, right, 1 over infinity minus 2. And let's see if we can reason it out along the way. Infinity minus 2 is still infinity. So we still have the infinity on the bottom. And we have a 1 on the top. If we have a finite number over infinity, guarantee we get 0, right? 1 divided by infinity, yeah, approaches 0. So the answer for this right here is just 0. Imagine one dollar, yeah, share with like 1 billion people, like uh, 100 billion people, how much money is each person going to get, and that kind of thing. Anyway, limit as x approaching minus infinity of the function. Put negative infinity into our function there. So we are looking at 1 over negative infinity minus 2. Minus infinity minus 2 is still minus infinity. And then we have 1 over that, right? But guess what? It's approaching 0. Don't say negative 0. It's the same as 0. Yeah. So that's why when you have a non-negative number, sorry, when we have a non, when we have a finite number over infinity, we get zero. So this right here is just zero. Done deal. Now, let me show you guys the graph for this. If we have 1 over x minus 2, it's just like 1 over x, which is like this, like that. But because it's a uh, x minus 2 on the bottom, we actually have a vertical as the right here at 2. Then we have a vertical as the like so. And then the curve looks like this like that. So, if you have this picture in your mind earlier, this question will be much easier because you can see that the limit as x approaching to 2 from the right, this right here is past the infinity, as we mentioned earlier, and then uh, you get negative infinity when we go from the negative side, right? So, that's that, and then they are not approaching to the same y value, that's why this doesn't exist. And then, when x is approaching infinity, the y value is approaching 0. The y value is approaching 0 when x is approaching negative infinity, so 0. So, yeah, so this is number 6. So, note your graphs. I'm pretty sure if you are taking your Cal 1 class or maybe pre calc, if you are watching this for your pre calculus class, uh, your teacher will, will like you to know the graphs of this basic functions, like the rational functions, the square root functions, and then the other ones that I am about to mention. <clears throat> All right, so number seven. Our function is natural log of x. So part A, let's see, we want the limit as x approaching zero plus of the function L and, L and x pretty much. So let's see, what will we get when we have zero plus inside here? Well, let me tell you, it looks like this, right? If you just want to plug in and then kind of recently out or do computation. 
Here's the deal. If you have ln of 0 plus, in fact, you will have to know the graph in order to actually see what the answer is. I will tell you though, the answer for this right here is negative infinity. It approaches negative infinity. And notice that how I have been drawing arrows when I do this kind of computations because arrow means approach. But when we have the limit, and then we put equal because the limit has that approach already. We are trying to answer the limits equal to whatever. But anyway though, the answer is negative infinity right here. And as I said, I think it would be much better if I just give you guys a graph right now to make sense of this. LNX, one of the functions that you definitely will have to know, look at this. Yeah, sound effect for the wing, huh? Anyway, one and all that. So when x is approaching zero from the right hand side, you see the function is going straight down. And uh, LNX, it only makes sense when x is greater than zero. This is the domain of the function, right? Domain of the LN, the inside has to be greater than zero. That's why x approaching just zero wouldn't make sense. x approaching zero minus wouldn't make sense either. So that, and then let me see, what else do I want to mention? Yeah, that's about moving to next one, B, Okay, next one, limit as x approaching e of the function. When x is approaching e, we can put e into ln x, and guess what? ln e is just equal to 1, so the answer is just 1. In fact, e is about like 2.718 ish, right? So let's say e is about right here. When we put e into the ln function, you see how the function is nice and continuous? And the y value here is 1. Yeah, that's it. So some of the values that you definitely have to know. ln1, this is not limit, it's just a regular computation. ln1 is 0, and then ln e is 1. Okay? And then this right here is like the limit. So just remember that if we have ln and then 0 plus, this goes to negative infinity. And you know the next one is the limit as x approaching infinity. You see how the curve is like this? In fact, it's going to get bigger and bigger than the y value. So this right here gives us infinity. So another expression that you should remember is ln, if you have infinity inside, it approaches positive infinity. So this is what we have. Okay, so Take a look, take a look. Okay. <clears throat> wow, number seven already. That's that's cool. And I think I'm just gonna check to see if the if if the phone is recording every ten questions so that way I can have a peace of mind. And to be very honest with you guys, I do not have a peace of mind because I dropped the microphone earlier. Hopefully, the sound is okay. If it doesn't, <laughs> I will record it again. Don't worry. Anyway, number eight. Aha, our function earlier was lnx. You expect it. Here we have e to the x. Okay, so part A. Let's look at the limit as x approaching negative infinity of the function. So again, if you don't want to use graph, maybe you just want to like plug in and kind of reason it out, this is how you can do it. Put negative infinity to here, so we are looking at e to the negative infinity. And you see we have negative exponents, so maybe if you want to, you can just say this right here is uh, Technically, I will put equal because it's like computation and the negative, right? So it's 1 over e to the infinity. And here's the deal. e is 2.718, yeah, ish. Raised to the infinity's power, it goes to infinity. And 1 over infinity is approaching 0, right? So this right here is 0. Okay? So this right here, mm, perhaps I'll tell you guys this thing real quick. The deal is that if we have a base, right, if we have a base that's uh, bigger than one, 
bigger than one. If we have this raised to the infinity's power, this right here will go to infinity. Let's say 1.001. Raised to infinity's power, we get infinity, right? E is 2.7 each, so that's why. If you look at the bottom, it goes to infinity. Um, another way to look at this is that if we have a base that's in between, that's between, I, I will say this, between zero and one. So I will just say, um, oh, I'll say this, uh, between, yeah, yeah, let's use the word between, between zero and one, but not equal to one, not equal to one. And then raised to the infinity's power, let's say one half or zero or 0 0.001. Raised to infinity's power, we can say that this is approaching zero. And you might be wondering, what if we have a base that's less than zero? Well, if you're talking about functions, when we have a function written in this form, b to the x power, we will have to make sure that the base b is greater than zero. Yeah. Technically, you can say b greater than or equal to zero, but like zero to the x power it's almost always zero, right? But yeah, anyway, zero to the x power, this right here, x cannot be negative numbers, otherwise we divide it by zero, but yeah, when we have an exponential function, b wants to be greater than zero, that's why, okay? So, again, when the base is bigger than one to the infinity's power, it is infinity, we can draw a conclusion. If it's between zero and one, not equal to one, then we get zero okay and then i also want to mention if the base is exactly equal to one right just like earlier i said not exactly not equal to one yeah if it's exactly equal to one and then raised to infinity's power this right here is approaching one okay however if you get let's say one plus to the zero's power or one minus, sorry, one plus to the infinity's power or one minus to the infinity's power, one or the other. This right here, right, this right here, they are the so called in the terminal form, meaning that we do not know what the answers are. Why? Well, it's on my shirt already. No. Jokes aside, here, this right here are the limit form. And the crazy part, or well, like the dangerous part of this is that a lot of times we don't even put a plus or minus. That's why you see my shirt right here, we have a one to the infinity's power. A lot of times it's misunderstood that, hey, it shouldn't not just be equal to one. No, no. This right here, this one is a limit form. Meaning that it's technically saying one plus or one minus. So this right here, it's a, uh, one of the most confusing part, and I would like to just give you guys an example before we go, especially we're talking about e to the x power, right? So the famous example for this one is, this is called the fact. Well, actually, no, I'm not going to tell you guys the secret weapon yet. I'm just going to put down a note. If we have the limit as x approaching infinity, 1 plus 1 over x to the x power. Check this out. If we put infinity to here and then just worked out like that, you know, do this kind of thing, we are going to get 1 plus 1 over infinity, right? Put this in here, we get infinity, and then to the infinity's power. Huh? Now I'm going to kind of like, argue like what recent things out along the way. 1 over infinity is 0, so this right here is approaching 1 plus 0 and then to the infinity's power, right? And then what's 1 plus 0? 1 plus 0 is 1. So this right here is approaching 1 to the infinity's power, right? And now it's like contradicting. I'm saying that this right here is exactly 1 to the infinity. No, what am I talking about? 
Let me tell you, this particular limit, the answer that we get is actually E, which is about 2.718-ish. Okay? So I'm just going to write this down right here. E is about 2.718. And again, if you look at this, why this is an indeterminate form? It's because we just write it down as 1 to the infinity, but really, it means the limit form either 1 plus or 1 minus. Why? Because this zero here, it's not exactly zero. One divided by infinity, it's, the value is not exactly zero, the limit is zero. So technically, you should say this is like zero plus, just a little bit bigger than zero, that kind of thing. And then right here, we have one to the infinity's power. This is technically one plus and then raised to the infinity's power. Yeah, but unfortunately, when we're talking about the limit form, nobody writes it like this. So you just have to be aware of this kind of situation, okay? And what I mean by exactly equal to one is that if today I have a very redundant example, let's say if we have a limit as x approaching infinity, if we just have a solid one, nothing else, and then raised to the x power, you see, I'm not adding anything, just one, uh -huh, just, just one, and then to the infinity's power. The answer for this right here is equal to one. Why? Because the base is exactly equal to one. And if you put infinity to here, you really get one to the infinity. But in this case, you have to really understand what the base is. That's what I'm trying to say. All right? So keep all these things in mind. Well, I'm not looking at my show. I'm looking at the question. Okay. That's part A. Now let's look at part B. Limit x approaching zero f of x. This is nice. We can put zero into the x value here, e to the zero's power is just one, so the answer is just one. Done. And then lastly, let me see if I can fit in part c. Okay, I'll fit in part c right here. If we have the limit x approaching infinity. Per our discussion, if we put infinity into here, e to the infinity, e is bigger than one, right, to the infinity's power, this right here will give us infinity. So let me just kind of make a quick divider, A, B, C, and then these are the notes that I was going over earlier. Best of all, when we have a function, if we know the graph, we can answer a lot of the limits question without worry. So let me give you guys the picture, e to the x looks like this. So x approaching infinity, negative infinity all the way to the left, y value approaching zero. X approaching zero, this y value is one. It's nice and continuous, it's just one. X approaching past infinity all the way to the right, y value goes up to my ceiling. To the third or the fourth, I don't know, tenth floor. It's infinity. So ladies and gentlemen, that's number 10. And more importantly, please, please, please know this really, really well. All right? This is like the most asked question in any calculus class especially when we're talking about limits. <coughs> All right. Number nine, number 10. Uh, I'm going to do like a function and then it's inverse again. So let's look at number nine. Let's look at the function, just tangent x. And um, let's see. I'm going to write down a, b, c, and then I'm going to, let, let's put it down here. Let's say a, we have the limit x approaching pi over two, f of x, b, limit x approaching infinity f of x c limit x approaching negative infinity f of x ready cool inverse tangent sorry regular tangent ladies and gentlemen it looks like this we have infinitely many vertical asymptotes the first one is right here if you look at the 
positive x value first, pi over 2. And then the next one is you just add pi and you get 3 pi over 2. And so on, so on, so on. The one on the left, the first one here is negative pi over 2. And then so on, so on, so on. And then we are going to get a bunch of this. I'm just going to do this to make it more clear. All right, so bunch of this. Right, one of the graphs that you should definitely have seen back in your pre calc or trick class. And with that being said, let's look at the first limit as x approaching pi over 2. We do not have the plus, we do not have the minus, so we do both. When x is approaching pi over 2 from the right, we get negative infinity. So let me just write this down here. If we have the limit as x approaching negative, so pi over 2 minus of our function tangent x, this right here is negative infinity. Sorry, this should be a plus, sorry. Pi over 2 plus from the right, the function goes straight down. And if we have the limit x approaching pi over 2 minus tangent x, this right here goes straight up, so positive infinity. They do not equal D and E. I preferred with dots. You don't have to put on the dots. Anyway, limit as x approaching infinity. Whoa, this is crazy. You just keep on going, right? The y value does not approach to a certain number. So this right here, D and E. I prefer dots. Similarly, x approaching negative infinity, d and e. When you have the picture in mind, or you know, just write, draw it down or right in front of you, the limit questions are so much easier, isn't it? Cool. Now we are going to turn this, just the middle portion, and reflect it about the line y is equal to x, and we get the inverse. Right, so. Did I graph my, inverse, my, my original tangent wrong? No, I didn't. Tangent. Wait, hold on. So it was like this. And then I'm going to do a reflection. All right, I'm going to do a reflection. So anyway, let me do number 10 right here. f of x equals inverse tangent of x. So this was the original tension and we just uh, we just look at the middle like the the first one because if you do the reflection on everything then the result is not going to be a function anymore so just rotate this not uh, flip this reflect this so inverse tangent yeah um we are going to get a picture like this ah let, let, let me do it again All right, this was positive pi over 2, right? But if we reflect it, this is going to give us Okay, so we have pi over 4, 1 And then we will have 1 pi over 4 So yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. what am I talking about? Anyway, so if we reflect it this vertical asymptote will become horizontal asymptote, and then this vertical asymptote, which is at negative pi over 2, will be another horizontal asymptote. So this right here is negative pi over 2, and this is pi over 2. And the curve looks like this. Okay? So it has that two boundary, but yeah, the horizontal asymptotes. Anyway, this is number 10, and uh, here we go. A limit x approaching negative infinity of our function. If it goes to negative infinity, we get negative pi over 2. B limit x approaching 1 
f of x, we can just simply put 1 in here, inverse tangent of 1. How do we do this? We will have to ask ourselves, tangent, right, the original tangent of what angle will give us 1? Look at the first answer, and the answer for that is pi over 4. So this right here is pi over 4. And again, the reason is because regular tangent of pi over 4 gives us 1. And it's nice and continuous, so that's why when x is approaching 1, this y value is pi over 4. So this is one of the values that you should remember. It's going to happen a lot. Inverse tangent is one of the very common functions that you have to deal with in your calculus class. Not just for limits, but also later on for the derivative and also the integral. Anyway, last one, the limit as x approaching positive infinity, we get positive pi over 2. Ah, so much better when we have a graph in front of us, right? Certainly. 10 questions, let me just check. Good. Wait, how long did I take? Wow, 56 minutes for 10 questions, are you serious? <laughs> wow. I, I thought it was just like 30 minutes. Oh my goodness. Okay. So that's the first category. We determine the limits from a graph. And the second category is still kind of similar. Depends on how you want to do it. We will see how to find the limit from piecewise functions. Okay, so number 11. At this, this time, that we are just doing one question per, per question. Earlier was like three questions per question. Anyway, I'm going to give you guys the function here, right here. So we have our function f of x is a piecewise function. You just have to pay attention to the conditions. So here we do 3x plus 1. This is when x is not equal to negative 2. But when x is equal to negative 2, we get 2. So, so just like this. And our goal is to find the limit as x approaching negative 2. Of course, that will be the interesting number of the function. So here's the deal. When we're talking about the limit as x approaching negative 2, we do not care about x is at exactly negative 2. So we don't care about this. We just have to worry about this. And uh, you don't have to worry about the left and right because left and right is just this anyway. So we can just put negative 2 into here. So let's just do a computation real quick. We will just get 3 times negative 2 plus 1. Work that out, we get negative 5. And that's it. Right? Seriously, that's it. I will give you guys a picture real quick to illustrate why this is the case. Firstly, let's focus on graphing this, which is just the equation of a line. The y-intercept is at 1, and then the slope is 3, meaning that we go up 3 times, 1, 2, 3, and then go to the right one time. Well, you don't have to be like super precise, you just have to make sure that your picture makes sense. So, this is the equation of the line 3x plus 1. However, x cannot be equal to negative 2. It means that we will have to go to when x is equal to negative 2, go to the line, and then erase it. And then we'll put an open circle here. But now the question is, what's the y value for this open circle? To do so, we put negative 2 into here, just pretend that the point was still there, and then we saw that it was negative 5. So this right here is negative 5. However, we still have to grab the second piece. When x is negative 2, the y value is actually at 2. So when x is negative 2, we actually go up to 2. Right here, this is 2. Let's say this is 2, and then we have a closed circle. So this right here will be the picture for this piecewise function. And now, it should be clear that, again, just like what we did in the first category, when x is approaching negative 2, from the left and from the right, both of, uh, both of them give us negative 5. The answer is negative 5. Done deal. Right? So that's number 11. 
<laughs> I just do one question and erase. That's why it takes me a long time. <laughs> okay. Number 12. Let me give you guys the function first. f of x equals, again, two pieces. First one, 1 over x minus 4 square, and this is when x is not equal to 4. And the other one is 3. This is when x is equal to 4. And the uh, question is asking us what's the limit as x approaching 4 of the function. Same deal. Do not worry about this because we're talking about limits. So, just put 4 into here, and then let's see. It looks like we are going to get 1 over 4 minus 4, and then square. Ah, we get a 1 over 0. Unlike earlier, earlier we were able to just find the answer nicely, so that's why we didn't have to do the plus or minus. But for this one, we should make a better observation. If we have a 4 plus here, okay, that means the x is approaching 4 from the right hand side. 4 plus minus 4, we get 0 plus, and then square, either way it's still positive. So yeah, 1 over 0, and that's a positive, so this right here gives us positive infinity. And if we have 1 over 4 minus, and then minus 4, inside gives us 0 minus, and then we square that. This right here, when we square a negative, like 0 minus this, like negative 0 0.0001, it will give us 0, but it becomes positive. All right? So this right here also gives us positive infinity. They are the same. That's why the answer is positive infinity. So this is how you can do it without utilizing the graph. You just kind of write down expressions and then just make arguments or like reason out the answers along the way. So that's pretty good. I'll give you guys a picture real quick though. Oh, by the way, see limit is infinity. Uh, if this is part A, I'll give you guys like a part B or like a note on the side. F of four. What's the answer for that? F of 4 is 3. Right? So just remember all the things that we have done so far. And here's the picture for this though. X is 4. That's the main value here that we care. Right? Vertical asymptote because the bottom cannot be 0. huh? 1 over X minus 4 square. It looks like a volcano. So the picture looks like this. I will use red make this one stand out. So like this, like that. That's why past infinity. However, not done yet. When x is 4, the y value is 3. So when x is 4, we should actually go here and then say, let's say this right here is 3. So we actually have a dot right there. Yeah. Okay, that's number 12. Alright, number... Just kidding. Okay, number 13. Our function f of x is equal to... A, hey, two, two pieces again. Don't worry. Negative x plus 2. This is when x is less than 0. And then the other one is negative x squared plus 2, and this is if x is greater than or equal to 0. And you can see that 0 is the interesting number, so yes, we'll look at the limit as x approaching 0 of the function. So for this one, we actually have to do left and right, because we have the inequality, right? x is less than 0, and also x is greater than or equal to 0, so we have a left and right. So here's the deal. 
let's go ahead and consider if x is approaching 0 minus. Let's do that one first. If this is the case, then the function is this piece that we are looking at. So look at negative x plus 2. And this is not bad at all, because if you put 0 in here, this is just going to give us 0, right? Negative 0 is still 0. And then plus 2, just 2. You don't have to worry about the 0 minus, because plus 2 is just 2. That's the, value. That, that's the limit that we get. And then if we have the limit as x approaching 0 plus, that means x is greater than or equal to 0. We look at this piece, which is negative x squared plus 2. Guess what? When we put this right here, that's still 0, plus 2 is still 2. Hey, they are the same. That means when x is approaching 0 of the function, we just get 2. Done deal. All right? Yeah. OK. And then this case, I will also like to tell you, it happens to be that when we have f of 0, how do we do this? Pay attention to the equality. x is equal to 0 right here. Right? x is greater than or equal to 0. So utilize this one. So for we have this, we technically will have to do negative 0 square plus 2 and then work that out. f of 0 is 2 if that was the question. Okay, a picture real quick for this curve. Te te technically, it's a line and a curve. Zero is the like an endpoint, so pay attention to that. When x is less than zero, we do this, which is just the equation of a line. Negative x plus two. Two is the one intercept, so we have it up here. And let's say this right here is two. And then negative x is just like this. Right, the slope negative 1. Well, if you would like, you can just plug in negative 1. In here, negative negative 1 is 1, 1 plus 2 is 3. So negative 1 comma 3, and you have another point. However, this is x less than 0, so technically, I should have put an open circle here. I'm just doing this in order, so open circle because of this inequality. And then for the second part, we have this parabola. Negative x squared is like this, right? upside down parabola. However, it's been shipped up two units. It happens to be here. And just the right hand side, because that's only when we have x is greater than or equal to zero. So we started right here because thanks to equality here, and then we have a parabola. So this right here is the line. This right here is the parabola. And you can see that the function is continuous when x is equal to zero. That's why the limit and the value of the function, they are both equal to 2 because the function is continuous. All right. So hopefully this right here makes the piecewise function not so intimidating because in fact, you just really have to follow the direction, like the condition and then you do the piece here and there, that's all. All right, number 14 of function is this. 2x plus 1. And this is if x is less than negative 5. And then the other one is x squared minus 12. This is if x is greater than or equal to negative 5. All right, and you can guess it. The question is the limit as x approaching negative 5 of this function. OK, because of the inequality that we have, so we do the left and right, yeah? So firstly, let's look at the limit as x approaching negative 5 from the negative side. So. If x is approaching negative 5 from the left-hand side or from the negative side, it's less than negative 5. So that means we look at this piece. So we have 2x plus 1. How do we do this? Well, just plug in negative 5 in here, and we get 2 times 
negative 5 plus 1, and that's negative 10 plus 1, which is negative 9. Okay, on the other hand, when we have the limit as x approaching negative 5 positive, that means we do this, right? Which is x squared minus 12. And to do so, just plug in negative 5 in here and just work that out. Because this is not like weird like indeterminate form, so just plug in and work it out, that would be the answer. So negative 5 squared minus 12. That's 25 minus 12. 13. Ah, very different. So the answer is does not exist. You see, if the question doesn't ask you to make graphs, then this right here will be it. Just show this and that, and then draw the conclusion for the limit as x approaching negative 5. But of course, I'll give you guys the graph real quick just to make things super, super clear. Because this is for practice, right? If you're on the test, if they just want us to figure out the answer, I will stop right there. Okay, we care about negative 5, let's say it's right here. This is a line with past this low. And uh, let's see, when x is at negative 5, we get negative 9. So we should have negative 5, and also let's say this is negative 9. And then we have an open circle, like so. Okay, and then uh, 2, so you should have a positive slope, so the picture should look like this. Right? Slope 2. Or if you were like, you can just plug in, let's say, negative 6, and then plug into the work that out. Yeah, that, that's okay. Oh, what's this? This is a parabola. Yeah, this is a parabola. X squared, but you drag it down 12 units. <laughs> so let's say this right here is negative 12, and then you just have a parabola that looks like this. But when x is at negative 5, the value is 13. So the picture is going to look like this. It's crazy. It's symmetric, so I'll try my best. Yeah. So this is the part that we were talking about. Here, we get negative 9. And then here, we get uh, positive 13. That's it. And that's how you do it. Okay, how are you guys doing? How are you guys doing? Hopefully you guys are doing good. It's, you know, just a couple more questions to go, right? Hang there. If I can do it, you guys can do it too. You don't have to watch this video one time through, right? Take a break if you would like. But just make sure that you do the practice. Alright? Number 15, function f of x equals, first we have 1 over x if x is less than 0, if x is greater than 0, we get cosine x, also including 0, yeah. So let's see, I think for this one, let's just do the graph and then find the answer. So if we want the limit as x approaching 0 of the function, again, we will have to do the left and right. Let's, let's still do the left and right. So firstly, we do the limit as x approaching 0 minus. If it's 0 minus, then the function that we need to use is 1 over x. So what's the answer for this though? Well, we put 0 minus in here, we get 1 over 0 minus positive divided by negative, and then we have a zero right limit form on the bottom. So this right here approaches negative infinity. And if we have the limit as x approaching zero plus, we look at cosine x. And for this right here, just plugging zero into cosine, and then we can actually work that out. And we get one. So the answer is just one. Cool. But the thing is that they are not equal, therefore the answer right here does not exist. It does not exist. Okay, and then, oh, let me give you guys a graph real quick. When it's less than zero, we do one over x. And one over x is like this, right? This is one over x, 
Usually it's like this and that. But here we just care about when x is less than zero, so just this part. Cosine x, cosine start with zero comma one, right? So we start right here, and then it goes down, up, and then like this. That's it. And of course, you can also like worry about if the limit is x approaching infinity of the function. What's the answer for this? Ah, doesn't exist either, right? Because it keeps going up and down, up and down in between of negative one and one. The y value just bouncing, right? Between negative one and one. So, no. Alright, number 15. Okay, hopefully I don't need to like erase a question at every single time. Um, because, oh no, for number 16 I still have to make use of the whole board, but uh, we will see. Number 16, our function is 1 over x minus 2. This is when x is less than 2. And then ln of x minus 2. This is when x is greater than 2. And notice, I cannot put equal sign for the first one or for the second one. If I put equal signs right here, well, we cannot divide it by 0. And if I put an equal sign here, that's also no good because ln0 is undefined. So here, f of x, right, the domain for it, x cannot be equal to 2. But let's see, we want the limit as x approaching 2 of the function. And you know it, let's do exactly what we did. So here, take a look at the limit as x approaching 2 from the left-hand side first. If it's the left-hand side, then we are looking at this right here. So that's 1 over x minus 2. Okay, so put negative, uh, put 2 minus in here. So we look at 1 over 2 minus and then minus 2. 2 minus 2 is 0, yes. But this is a little bit less than 2. So this right here is technically 0 minus. Alright, so 1 over 0 minus. This is positive, this is negative. And the limit 4 on the bottom is 0, right? So altogether we get negative infinity. Okay, secondly, limit as x approaching 2 plus, then we are looking at ln of x minus 2. Well, put 2 plus in here, we get ln of 2 plus minus 2. 2 minus 2 is 0, but this is a little bit bigger than 2, so the inside is technically 0 plus. What's ln of 0 plus? Remember the things that we talked about, maybe like... 14 minutes ago. This right here approaches negative infinity. So, surprise, they are the same. So the answer is actually negative infinity. Okay. Alright, so just real quick, how does the graph of this look when x is 2? 1 over x minus 2, it has a vertical asymptote and then the picture looks like this. Okay ln of x minus 2, ln of x minus 2, also vertical asymptote. And it actually like this, because remember ln of x, it actually <laughs> grows to infinity, right? So it actually goes up. But this piece, it has a horizontal asymptote. This one does down. So it's a pretty cool curve. This is the ln x minus 2 part, and this is the rational function 1 of x minus 2. All right, number 17. Here's the deal. We are just going to evaluate the limit as x approaching 0, and I give you absolute value of x over x. Did I make a mistake? This category, I'm saying that it's the limits from piecewise functions. Uh, I don't see no piecewise functions. 
technically there is because when we have absolute value of x it's technically an absolute value it's technically a piecewise function so i would like to write this down right here for you guys note when we have absolute value of x this actually means either we get negative x or positive x we get negative x when the inside namely x is negative because negative times negative, that's how we can produce a positive output. And if the inside is already positive, then we just, you know, have the x back. And the truth is, you can put an equal sign here or here, doesn't matter because zero is still, negative zero is still zero, but usually people put an equal sign there. All right, so let's see. This right here is our piecewise definition, but we want absolute value of x over x. So how exactly do we do this? Well, check this out. When we have absolute value of x over x, this right here, we can just go ahead and do negative x divided by this x, and this is going to reduce to negative one. Similarly, we do x divided by this x, and this right here will give us positive one. But be careful though. This right here, yes, is still if x is less than zero. However, for this right here, this is if x is greater than zero. No more equal sign. We cannot use equal sign anymore because the expression right here has the x on the bottom. We cannot have zero on the bottom. So we lose that equality All right so this is how you write that piecewise function for absolute value of x over x and this right here actually has a special name sign but like the way you spell it is s i n g because it tells you if it's like a positive or negative sign of the number x so yeah but anyway though you don't have to know well i don't know it depends on your teacher but yeah but you need to know this and the piecewise function for that. Anyway, what's the answer for that? From the negative side, we get negative one. From the right-hand side, we get positive one. So they do not equal. You can make a graph of this real quick. Negative one, and then one. Right, this is the graph for absolute value of x over x. But either way though, this right here does not exist. Yay, I think I can run another question right here without uh, erase number 17. Okay, number 18. All right, let's take a look at the limit as x approaching zero. And then we have x over absolute value of x plus x squared. All right, so how can we do this? You can use this again. You can just rewrite everything again. Or right here, let's just go ahead and break down into like a positive and negative and check. If we have the limit as x approaching zero minus, the only thing that's going to, uh, we, we only have to worry about the following is this, this part. So x stays x on the top, but up to five x, if x is approaching zero minus, meaning the input is negative, this right here, you replace that with negative x. And then right here, you have the plus x squared. So that's how you can do it, okay? You could have done the same thing like, like this earlier, but I think that's more clear. Anyway, once you write this, we can simplify it. You see on the bottom, we can factor out an x. So let me do that. And then we have negative one plus x. And then we can see that this x and that x cancel out. Then that's okay because when we have x is approaching zero minus, x is not exactly equal to zero. So cancel it out, that's totally fine. And then we will have what? We have one over negative one plus x, right? So let's see. Let's just plug in zero into here. Then we are going to get one over negative one plus zero. And we can draw a conclusion right here. The answer is just negative one. So this limit gives us negative one. 
Similarly, let's do the limit as x approaching 0 plus, and in that case, again, this is the only part that has to change. On the top is still x, this guy is just x, and then we have plus x squared. Factor out an x on the bottom, and then cancel out this x and that x, and then put a 0 in here, then you see we get 1 over 1 plus 0, and that will give us 1. So this limit gives us positive 1. However, 0 minus and 0 plus, they give us different limits. So the answer for this right here does not exist. Okay? Cool. Now, another special function for you guys for number 19, namely the flow function. But let me erase the bool first. I'll give you guys a quick intro and then show you guys how to do this. I'm not sure if you guys can see. <laughs> I'm actually sweating because right now it's like 5 p.m. Yeah, and it's hot. And I cannot turn on my AC because one, my AC doesn't really work. And I should have told you that as the number, like reason number one. I cannot really turn on my AC because one, if I turn on my AC, then it will be super loud. That's going to ruin the video. And the second reason is that my AC doesn't really work anyway. But it will be loud. That's the main question. That, that's the main issue though. A anyway, number 19. Okay, here is the limit as x approaching 3, and then, ladies and gentlemen, this is the flow function. So, let me explain to you guys what this is. This right here, right, this right here, it's called the flow function, or some people will write it as, will write it as flow of x, one way or the other. So, what this means is that you just always run down to the integer, right? Run down. So let me give you an example. When we have the flow of, let's say, 0 0.5, well, you run down, so this right here will be 0, okay? If you have flow of 2.1, you run down, so this is going to be 2, right? Run down to the integer. And then if you have the flow of, let's say, 8.9, Man, this is almost 9, right? But no, you still run down. So this right here is equal to 8. And it might be a little bit trickier if we have negative numbers, such as negative 3.2. What's the answer for this? It's not negative 3, but rather it's negative 4. Perhaps the easier way to see is that on the number line. So you have the 0 and then negative 1, negative 2, negative 3 and negative 4, right? I know this is like a horrible picture. Much better. Negative 0 point, sorry, negative 3.2 is right here. And you always run down. So you always move the point to the left. Whole number. Well, the, 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 you just move the, you just run down and then it's the first integer. So you run down, so that's why it's negative 4. You see that prepared ripple there? I don't know if I need to drink it, but if I need to, I will. It's been an hour, it's hot. Most likely it's room temperature already. Maybe I'll get one from the fridge. We'll see. But anyway, hopefully this right here is clear. Now, what's the limit as x approaching 3 of the flow function of x? This question will be so much easier if we look at the picture, right? So we will look at the picture. Ladies and gentlemen, let's have a look. Here is 0, 1, 2, 3, and minus well, 4. And minus well, let's put negative 1. So use the idea earlier. Check this out. When x is, let's say, 0 0.5, the y value will be 0. When x is 0 0.9, the y value is still 0. So in fact, anything from here to here is just 0. So that's the first piece. However, when we have the, abs the flow of 1, if this is a whole number already, then you just get the whole number back. 
So when x is 1, you jump to 1. So you have a closed circle here, and you have an open circle here. And then you continue. When we have 1.1, flow of that is 1. Likewise, anything up to almost 2. Because when x is exactly 2, we make another jump to 2. Same thing. Open, and then up 3, and then here, and then like this. And then so on, so on, so on. And if you would like, when x is 0, you get 0. And then anything from negative 1 to here, we get negative 1. So you have a piece like this. So it's like a stair. I believe some people also call this the stair function, but like the flow function is the most common one, or maybe the greatest integer function. But anyway though, check this out. When x is approaching 3, from the left we get 2, from the right we get 3. So the answer for this right here is doesn't exist. And let me just indicate that real quick. If we have the limit as x approaching 2, sorry, if we have the limit as x approaching 3 from the left hand side, so 3 minus of the flow function, this right here gives us 2. But if we have the limit as x approaching 3 positive, then this right here gives us 3. Unfortunately, they are not equal, so we do not have the limit for it. Okay. And depending on your calculus class, some people cover the special function. That was one of the special functions, the flow function. Um, most of the people we, we do. And we also to cover the fractional part of the function. But like, yeah. Anyway, number 20, yay. Here, limit as x approaching 1. And the function here is absolute value of x plus the flow of x. Wow. Okay, let me just show you guys how we can do this. Mm, yeah, now let's just do it without the graphs. If x is approaching 1 from the negative direction, guess what? Because it's 1 minus, so this right here is still just x, right? So we just have x. Just take out the absolute value, it doesn't matter. And then, hmm, it's not so easy to write it, so perhaps I'll just. I, I think I'm just going to write it like this, plus the flow of x. Yeah, and here's the deal. 1 minus is just like 1, right, 1, and then plus. If we have 1 minus, what's the flow of 1 minus? Well, if you look at the picture earlier, it's like this, right? 0 to 1, and then there's a jump, and then like this, and then so on. So. When we have x is approaching 1 from the left hand side, it's 0. So it's 1 plus 0. So the answer for this one is 1. But if we have the limit as x approaching 1 plus, just take out the absolute value. It doesn't matter. OK, that is going to be still 1 plus 1 plus. When we put it here, you just run down, right? So it's just 1. So it's 1 plus 1. 2, yes, but they are not equal. Therefore, the answer for this right here, D and E. All right, so, yay. 20 equations done, and now let's have a look. 1 hour and 34 minutes. Okay, so on page 4, we are going to just compute the limit. So no more <laughs> graphs, so that's good, because the graph took a while to do, right?
All right, and also we are just going to be doing algebra. So this is going to be the limit as x approaching some number a. And for now, a is finite uh, in this category. And I'll show you guys the techniques, the things that we will have to do to figure out the limits. And I'll also show you guys how to organize our work and all that good stuff. First question on page number four, number 21. The limit as x approaching eight. x squared minus seven x minus eight over x minus eight. First thing first. When we are just computing the limit, it's always a good habit to plug in this number into all the x's and see what happens. If we get a nice number, then that will be our nice answer. If we end up with one of these numbers, well, I should have said one of these limit in determinant forms, then congratulations, we will have to do more work. So let's see. I will show you guys all the work for now. Put the 8 into all the x's, then we are going to get 8 squared minus 7 times 8, and then minus 8 all over 8 minus 8. On the bottom, we get 0. On the top, this is 64, minus 56, which is 8, and then minus 8, which is 0. 0 over 0, we cannot draw any conclusion. Why? Because it's one of the indeterminate forms. The cat is scared. We are scared of indeterminate forms. We cannot draw any conclusion yet. But don't worry, I'll show you how to take care of this. Here's the deal. If we get 0 over 0 and uh, we have that, then we can expect to cancel a common factor. And in this case, it will be the x minus 8. To make that happen, notice the top is just a quadratic trinomial. We can actually just factor it the usual way. And then we will just get the limit as x approaching 8. And please, 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 when you are doing this kind of limit, write down the LIM x approaching 8. Your teacher, your professor will really appreciate that. I will also, yeah. Later on, you'll see why that this is needed, especially once we get to the definition of derivative, when there are a lot of variables being involved. So it's not, we are just being picky, it's actually necessary. All right, anyway, I'll write this down, and then on the top, let's factor it. We will get x plus 1 times x minus 8 because this times that would be negative 8. Together, we do produce the negative 7x over x minus 8. Have a look. x minus 8, x minus 8 cancel out so nicely. And once you cancel out this common factor, then you wouldn't get a 0 over 0 anymore. Because <laughs> you can see, when we put the 8 in here, 8 plus 1, nice number, that's the nice answer. So now just go ahead, I'll show you guys the work, 8 plus 1. So the answer is 9. And then we are done. Okay, so that's the answer for that. All right, number 22. Let's see the limit as x approaching 3. And then we have 2x squared minus 5x minus 3. And on the bottom, we have x squared minus 2x minus 3. Alright, so again, you should have a good habit that plugging the string to all the x's. Uh, you can work this out on your own. For, let's see, 3 in here is 9 times that is 18. That's 15. So 18 minus 15 is 3. 3 minus 3 would get 0. 9 minus 6 is 3. Minus 3 is 0. So yeah, 0 over 0. Do more work for this. Trinomial, trinomial. We can factor it. I will show you guys how to factor this guy on the side. 2x squared minus 5x minus 3. It's usually a little bit harder to factor when we have a number that's not 1 in front of the x squared. So I prefer to show my students the tic-tac-toe method. You just ask yourself, what times will I give you 2x squared? And the combination is 2x times x. And then you come here and then you ask yourself, what times will I give you negative 3? And it wouldn't matter. I'm going to put negative 3 here and then 1 here. This works because now we can do the check and now we can convince you. 2x times negative 3 gives us negative 6x. 1 times x gives us x. 
in the middle, this is where you check. Negative 6x plus x does give us negative 5x. So this is the correct factoring. We have found our correct combination. But this is how you are going to write down the answer for the factoring wise. Anyway, here we have the limit, x approaching 3. On the top here, read this across. So we first have 2x plus 1. And then bottom is x minus 3. Right? So that's the factoring. You cross multiply to check and then you read it across like 2x plus 1, x minus 3. That's for the answer. For this right here, you can factor it the usual way, right? Just like x times x gives us x squared, and then we need plus 1 and then minus 3 to make this happen. And you see it, x minus 3, x minus 3 cancel, and then we can just put a 2, sorry, we can just put a 3 into this and that and then work that out. And we will get 2 times 3 plus 1 over 3 plus 1, that's 7. That's 4, so altogether 7 over 4. Done. Yay. All right, now I'm going to erase the board. Number 23. Here we have the limit as x approaching 127, no, just kidding, x approaching 4. And then we have a square root x plus 5, and then minus 3. And the minus 3 is also a square root, and on the bottom we have x minus 4. All right, have a good habit, plugging 4 into here. 4 plus 5 is 9. Take the square root of that is 3. 3 minus 3, we get 0. 4 minus 4 is 0. 0 over 0 situation. We have to do more work. Here's the deal. When we have a square root, uh, it seems that we cannot factor the usual way, huh? However, when we have a square root expression like so, we can use the conjugate to help us simplify it. And by that, we mean to multiply the top by, and again, let me just put a 0 over 0 all the way here. All right. I'm going to keep this and that, so we have square root of x plus 5 and then 3, but instead of the minus, we are going to put plus in the middle, and then of course we do the same thing on the bottom, so square root of x plus 5 and then plus 3. Okay, and now we can work this out relatively easily. When I say that, it's because when we multiply the conjugate, we have an easy way to do it. Here's the deal. When we are multiplying a minus b times a plus b, and this is the purpose of the conjugate, you just change the sign in the middle. This right here, when we multiply, we actually just get a difference of two squares, namely a squared minus b squared. So coming back here, what we can do is just square the first thing and the square square will cancel. Perfect, huh? So we get x plus 5. And then in the middle, we have the minus. And then we look at the second thing, which is just a 3, and we square that. 3 squared is a 9. Good. And on the bottom, don't multiply the out because the purpose of the conjugate is to fix the top. Just keep the bottom as how it is, and you'll see good things will happen x minus 4 times all that, so square root of x plus 5 and then plus 3. Now, on the top, we have x plus 5 minus 9. You don't have to write it down again and then I rewrite the whole thing. You can just write the result above and you see this is just x minus 4. Just be neat and then this is clear. And you see, on the top we just have x minus 4. But guess what? On the bottom we also have x minus 4 as a factor. So this and that can be cancelled. And then when we have that, well, we can now just plug in the 4 into the x and then work that out. So on the top we have 1, that's cancelled, so we just have square root of 4 plus 5 and then plus 3. So only all we have what? That's 
3 plus 3, so we'll have 1 over 6. Right, so that's the answer for that. Okay, number 24. Here we have the limit as x approaching 2, 2, 2. All right, x squared minus 2x over, on the bottom we have a square root. So square root of x plus 2, and then <laughs> minus 2. Oh, how many 2's we have here? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Anyway, though. Have the good habit. Check this out. Put 2 in here and here. 2 squared is 4. 2 times 2 is 4. 4 minus 4 is 0. 2 plus 2 is 4. Square root of 4 is 2. 2 minus 2 is 0. So this is, yes, a 0 over 0 case. Don't worry. Conjugate again. Fix the square root part first. So I'm going to multiply the bottom by square root of x plus 2 and then plus, right, plus 2. And then do the same thing on the top, right here, square root of x plus 2, and then plus 2. So let's fix the bottom first. This is going to be the limit as x approaching 2. Just like what we said earlier, we square the first part, which is just going to be the x plus 2 now. And then minus square of the second, which is 2 squared, which is 4. So that's the fast way to multiply all the count you get. On the top though, I'm not going to multiply the L. Actually, I'm going to factor this. Because as I said earlier, when we get a 0 for 0 situation, you're expecting to cancel out x minus 2 because x is approaching 2. That's how we can end up with, that's how we can get rid of the 0 over 0. Anyway, from here, I'm going to factor out an x. So I'll keep that in black. So here we get x minus 2. So this part is from there. This part, I'll keep it. I'll just write it in red so that you can see that this is the part that we had earlier. What's this? Yeah, this is just x minus 2, right? What can we do next? Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, x minus 2 and x minus 2 cancel very much. All right, so now we can just go ahead plugging 2 into here. So we have a 2 here times square root of 2 plus 2 plus 2. Who came out with this question? So many 2s. Yes, I did. Anyway, this is 2 plus 2 is 4 times 2, 8. All right, done. So, oh, look. I remember why I came out with this. 8 and 24. Rest in peace, Kobe Bryant. You think I didn't set this up? Of course I did. It's hot. Anyway. Number 25. Hey, you know what? We're going to do another limit. Obviously, limit as x approaching 0. On the top, we have 1 plus x squared minus 1. And on the bottom, we have 1 plus x to the third power and then minus 1. Yes, if you Plug in 0, you get 1 minus 1 on top, and likewise 1 minus 1 on the bottom. So this is a very clear 0 for 0 situation. Do more work. What do we do though? Well, on the top, technically, it's a difference of 2 squares. So if you are a fan of factoring, be my guest. On the bottom, it's a difference of 2 cubes. Again, if you are a fan of factoring, be my guest. Um, you can also multiply it out. So if you are a fan of multiplying things out, the binomial part, be my guest. Likewise, the bottom, be my guest. So I'm going to do it the more natural way that I think most of the students will do, which is actually just multiply the L. Usually multiplying L is more, not necessarily natural, not necessarily easier, but 
uh, more direct, I would say. So yeah, 1 plus x squared, just write 1 plus x times 1 plus x, multiply it out, we get 1 plus 2x plus x squared, and then we have that minus 1. This right here, just to impress you guys, I'll show you guys what the answer is. What we do is we do 1 to the third power, which is 1, plus 3 times 1 to the second power, which is 3, and then times x to the first power. Next, and then use 3 again as a coefficient, 3 times 1 to the first power, which is still 3, times x to the second power, and lastly, x to the third power. So that's the Pascal's triangle or the binomial coefficient. So 1, 1, 1, and then 1, 2, 1, 1, 3, 3, 1. That's why I used 3 and 3 earlier for these two coefficients. And when I did this, technically I was doing 1 times 1 to the third power, and, I, uh -huh. and then plus 3 times 1 to the second power, the power goes down, and then the x power goes up. And then plus the next coefficient, so it's 1 first power x squared, and lastly plus 1, and then x to the third power. So that's how I did it pretty much. And then minus 1. And so you can take a look. All right, this is not so bad. You see the 1, minus 1, 1, minus 1. Pretty good. And then the beauty is that we can actually just factor out an x. And I think for this one, let me just, yeah, let me just write it down right here. So let's see. When we factor on x, on the top we get 2 plus x. Yes? On the bottom, when we factor on x, we get 3 plus 3x plus x squared. And then, the x and x cancel. So finally, we can put 0 into the x there, so 2 plus 0 over 0 into here. It's just 2 over 3, right? Because this right here will be 0, so yeah. So the final answer is just 2 over 3. Yeah, all the x's are 0, so just 2 over 3. And then we are done. Yeah, so this is for that, and then, yeah. As I said, this right here, I think it's more natural. If you do the um, factoring, it might be slightly more bizarre. All right, anyway, number 26. Limit x approaching, we have 1. x squared plus 3x minus 4 over 2x plus 10. Okay. Go ahead and factor and then try to cancel. No, no, no. Why? Again, have the good habit. Put the 1 into here, let's see what we get. So we get 1 squared plus 3 times 1, and then minus 4, over 2 times 1, and then plus 10. Do we get 0 on the bottom? No, we don't, huh? It's the 12 on the bottom. On the top, what do we get? 1 plus 3 is 4, 4 minus 4 is 0. So we have 0 over 12. Can we draw a conclusion? Yes, when we have a number, when we have a zero over a non-zero number, we can draw a conclusion, and the answer for that is zero. Dandio. So in fact, the way that you can show work for this question is just plug in, because it does not give you any determinant form. However, the next answer is, that's it, zero, done. This question might be slightly more difficult if we are talking about x is approaching negative 5 because that will make the bottom 0. In that case, you have to investigate the left and also the right limit. But that wouldn't be a 0 over 0 either. So, yeah. So for number 26, it's just like a reminder that, hey, don't forget to have the good habit that always plugging the value. Because sometimes when you do a lot of algebraic simplifications, it's like, huh, what do I have to do with that? Sometimes simply plugging and then work it out. Maybe you are done already.
27, here we have the limit as x approaching negative 3. And then we have x to the third power plus 27 over x plus 3. So let's see. If we plug in negative 3, raise that to the third power, we get negative 27, we get 0. Right? Plus 27, so 0. On the bottom, we also get 0, so 0 for 0. How do we do it? This is a sum of two cubes. So I will remind you guys how to factor that. When we have a to the third power plus b to the third power, the way to factor this is a plus b times a squared minus ab and then plus b squared. Okay? And in this particular case, you can also do polynomial long diffusion or synthetic diffusion. I think both of them will work out okay. But let me show you guys how to factor this because I have the synthetic diffusion question for number 28. So for this one, let's factor it. So notice, 27 is the same as 3 to the third power. So I'm just perhaps going to write it right here. So we have x to the third power plus 3 to the third power. And then we can just draw in. But let me put down the result right here. So this is the limit as x approaching negative 3. So this right here, just look. We will have x plus 3. That's the first factor. So x plus 3. To continue, we will have x squared. So let me just write it down. x squared minus ab. In this case, minus x times 3, so that's minus 3x. Lastly, plus b squared, and that's plus 3 squared, so that will give us 9. So that's the factoring for x to the third power plus 27. On the bottom, we still have the x plus 3. Guess what? 0 over 0, no more. Then, put the negative 3 into all the x's, we are going to get negative 3 squared minus 3 times negative 3, and then plus 9. This is 9, another 9, another 9, 27. Yeah, co <laughs> very, it's a pure coincidence that you get 27. All right, for number 28, I'm going to show you guys the synthetic division and also the long division together. So I'm just going to erase this. So that we have the whole board to do, show you guys both. All right, for number 28, we have the limit as x approaching negative 2. And we have x to the third power minus 5x minus 2 over x plus 2. As you can see, on the top we have a trinomial. However, it's a cubic, it's not quadratic, so it's not that easy to factor it the usual way. But again, let's have a good habit. Plug in negative 2 into here, negative 2 to the third power we get negative 8. Plug into here, negative 5 times negative 2 is 10. Negative 8 plus 10 is neg negative 8 plus 10 is 2. Minus 2, we get 0. Likewise, put the negative 2 here, we also get 0. So 0 over 0. We have to do more work. So the first thing is that we can just do polynomial long division. And to do so, I'm just going to put the inside here, x to the third power. And then we see we do not have the quadratic term, right? So I'm just going to say we have plus 0x squared and then minus 5x and then minus 2. And then here we have the x plus 2 on the outside. All right, so now we have to ask ourselves, what times x will give us x to a third power? The answer is x squared. So I'll put the result lined up right here. x squared times that gives us x to a third power. Take this times that, we get plus 2x squared. And when we do long division, we subtract. So this right here, we have this. This minus that, 0. 
0 minus that, we get negative 2x squared. Bring down the negative 5x. What do we do next? Here we have x. We need to get negative 2x squared. So we need negative 2x. Take that, multiply by this, we get negative 2x squared. Take that, multiply by that, we get negative 4x. All right, subtract. Negative 5 minus minus become plus. So negative 5 plus 4 is negative, and then we have the x. And then we have that minus 2. This is x plus 2. We need that, so we need negative 1. So put a negative 1, multiply, we get negative x minus 2. Subtract, we get 0. Cool. So with this being done, this right here tells us we just have to compute the limit as x approaching negative 2. The whole thing reduces to that, and that's x squared minus 2x minus 1. So what we can do at the end is just go ahead and plug in negative 2. So negative 2 in here, we get 4. And then plus another 4 is 8. And then minus 1 is 7. So the answer for this is 7. Right, so the last point, just you plug in and then you evaluate. So this is another way to cancel the 0 for 0. Because right? the x minus 2 is gone. Yeah. OK, so how do we do the so-called synthetic division then? Here's the deal. Look at the coefficients. So starting with 1. And we do not have the x squared term, so it's just 0. And then minus 5 and then minus 2. Right? The same right here. 1, 0, negative 5, negative 2. Now, here we have here we have x plus 2. Ask yourself, how can you make this equal to 0? x has to be negative 2. Right? So we are going to do the opposite of this number. So just put negative 2 right here. And then for the synthetic division, we are going to add. Check this out. This is how we do it. First, bring down the 1. Next, we do this times that, and then, uh, let me put it like this. We do this times that. Negative 2 times 1, we get negative 2. And then we are going to add, so we get 0 plus negative 2. So that will be negative 2. And then we continue. Negative 2 times negative 2 is positive 4, and we put it here. Negative 5 plus 4 is negative 1. Next, this times that is positive 2. And we'll put it here. Negative 2 plus 2 is 0. This number is the remainder. Very nice. Why? Remainder 0. Just like this earlier. So like no more fraction part. So how do we read the answer from here though? Originally, this is x plus third power. right? So keep that in mind, x plus third power and x squared. You don't have to write it down for that. You know, just keep that in mind. When we do the synthetic division, these are the coefficients for our answers, and the power goes down by 1. So we have the x squared, x, and also no x. So as you can see, this part becomes x squared right, minus 2x minus 1. So it's that. And of course, once you put this back here, we do the same thing. And then you can compute it. And we get 7. All right, so again, just a way to kind of get rid of the rational expression case. You know the hard questions are at the end. Epsilon delta definitions of the limit and also the Riemann sum. Integrals, pretty much. Definition of integral, technically, right? Almost like that, yeah. Whee. Okay. Oh, we will also be doing the derivative, the definition of derivative, though. It's coming. Uh, yeah. By the way, a couple more to go. Number 29, here we have the limit, and then we have x approaching 5. 1 over x plus 2 minus 1 over 7 and x minus 5. 
Here we have a complex fraction, so how do we simplify this? The key is that we don't like complex fractions. So I would recommend you guys to multiply the top and bottom by this and that, just like their common denominator. So I'll put here 7 times x plus 2, likewise the bottom. Check this out. This is going to give us the limit. Oh, by the way, it will be 0 over 0. I forgot to say that. 1 over 7 minus 1 over 7, right? and then 5 minus 5 is 0 over 0. Anyway, limit as x approaching 5. Take this, multiply by that, we will just have the 7 left. Then take this, multiply by that, the 7 will cancel, so we have this minus. And then we have the x plus 2. But be sure we put a parenthesis around it because we will have to distribute the negative in a second. On the bottom, I'm just going to write it. Here we have the 7 goes first. Do not multiply out anything. So 7 and then x minus 5 and then x plus 2. Okay, here's a very common mistake. A lot of students, once they get to here, they see the x plus 2, x plus 2, then in parentheses, they will just cancel it. This is wrong. The reason is because we must fix the top first, the order of operations. So let's see. For the top, we will just get 7 and then distribute it, we get negative x and then minus 2, right? So all in all, we just get negative x and then this is uh, plus 5. Yeah. Mm. Hey, this is x minus 5, this is negative x plus 5. They are almost the same. Don't worry. Let's factor out an x. So let's factor out a negative. So let's put a negative like so, and then we can change this to be x and then minus 5. Check. Negative x, negative negative, we get the positive. So the top right here is negative and then x minus 5. Now, cancel, cancel. This is the right way to do it. On the top, we have negative 1. On the bottom, we're plugging the 5 here. So we see here we have the 7 times 5 plus 2, which is just 7. 7 times 7 is 49. Altogether, negative 1 over 49. Okay. All right, number 30. Here we have the limit as x approaching zero and then we have one minus cosine x over sine x what how do we even do this wow how do we factor it no we are not supposed to factor it check this out one minus cosine square don't know too much about it. However, we do know that. Let me just put it down right here. If we have 1 minus cosine square x, this right here is nicely equal to what? Sine square x. Yeah? So, how can we go from here to here? Well, this is precisely 1 minus cosine x times 1 plus cosine x. Yeah? So, let's again just do the conjugate business. Take the top, multiply by 1 plus cosine x. And then, of course, we will do the same on the bottom, 1 plus cosine x. All right? And then, per our discussion here, when we do this times that, we will just get sine square x. That's very nice. So, this right here is the limit as x approaching 0. O in O, the top is sine square x. I'm just going to put that down in red. And then we have what? Here we have the sine x. And then here we have the 1 plus cosine x. Oh, by the way, I forgot to mention. The reason that we have to do this is because when we put 0 into cosine x is 1. 1 minus 1 is 0. When we put 0 in here, sine of 0 is 0. So yeah. It was a zero plus zero situation. That's why I bothered to do this. Have a good habit, you guys. Anyway, once we get to here, what we can do? 
is just cancel the sign and then cancel that. So we have sine of x on the top over that on the bottom. Then we can go ahead and put zero in here. So we are looking at sine of zero over one plus cosine of zero. But you know what? Sine of zero is zero. Cosine of zero is one. On the bottom is just one plus one, which is two. Zero over two is just zero. So the answer for this is zero. And hopefully by now you can see that when we have zero over zero, the answer is imaginable. Like you don't know what the answer is yet. You can get a negative number, not imaginary numbers all by the way, I shouldn't use that word. And then when we have zero over zero, it's possible to end up with zero. So many possibilities. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to take the ripple from in my fridge because <laughs> that ripple is not cold anymore so I'm, I don't know why I took it out yeah anyway yeah it's the summer that's why especially when you have no AC anyway I'm gonna put this down here and I'll also check All right. Okay, number 31. You can see that the marker is drying out relatively faster than usual because it's hot. Anyway, here we have the limit as x approaching 1. And then we have inverse sign of the inside is 1 minus square root of x over 1 plus square root of x. Yeah, you'll see why I left a big gap like that. Okay, here's the deal. If we put 1 inside of the x here and here, uh, oh sorry, 1 minus x, 1, 1 minus square root of x. I didn't mean to change the, no, I'm, I wrote it down wrong. Anyway, if we put 1 into here and here, we get 0 over 0, and that's just the inside. So what we will have to do is the following, right? Technically, we actually do this, right? This is the question first. Now, let me just redo this, All right? Okay, here we go. This is number 31. We have the limit as x approaching 1, inverse sine of 1 minus square root of x. No, 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 no. What am I talking about? Okay. Maybe I shouldn't drink the Red Bull. Anyway, number 31, the limit as x approaching 1, and we have the inverse sine of 1 minus square root of x over 1 minus x. There we go. All right, if we put 1 to all the x's, then we get 0 over 0, but that's the inside. The deal is that we can actually look at the limit first, do the inside out. What I mean by that is the following. This is the same as saying inverse sine of the limit as x approaching 1 and then look at that first 1 minus square root of x over 1 minus x and the reason that we can do this is because inverse sine is a continuous function when x is approaching 1 in this particular case so this is actually legitimate but anyway though what i'm saying is that you can just do a limit inside out that's pretty much it and for the inside, we have done this many times already, like the conjugate business. Let's just go ahead. No, I'm not going to do the conjugate. You can multiply 1 plus square root of x and also 1 minus square root of x. You can do that. But I want to show you something different, just so that way you have more 
tools that you can possibly use later on. Here's the deal. When we have 1 minus x, this right here, it's the same as saying 1 square minus square root of x. Square. How's that? Now, this is a difference of two squares. So we can say 1 minus square root of x times 1 plus square root of x. Yep. So in fact, this guy is just that, which is 1 minus square root of x, and then 1 plus square root of x. If you do the conjugate, you will end up with the same thing, like this after the cancellation. Anyway, this and that cancel out very nicely. So what we are going to get is the inverse sign. And then we just have to put a 1 in here, and that's on the bottom. So don't forget, we still have the 1, and then the 1 on the top, and then 1 plus square root of 1. And this is just inverse sign of 1 half. Now, I know this is the hardest part. How do we do this? The way to do it is you have to ask yourself, the original sign of what angle will give us 1 half? And that's still hard, huh? I know, sometimes it's hard for me too, so I will use the special triangle. Sign is the opposite over hypotenuse. So here's the deal. Here is the triangle. 1 over 2. We see we have a special red triangle, and the angles are what? 30, 60, 90. This is 30 degrees. This is the angle. 30 degrees is the same as pi over 6. So, ladies and gentlemen, inverse sine of 1 over 2 is pi over 6. Next one, number 32. Alright, here we have the limit as x approaching 1 and then here I am going to give you guys inverse tangent of 2 over x minus 1 okay can we do the same that we did earlier not really, well, not really in the following sense because you see if we put 1 inside here we get 2 over 0 you see positive infinity or is it negative infinity we will have to do what? Yeah, we will have to consider cases, right? So let's break it down. This is not 0 over 0. This was 0 over 0. Let me just put it down somewhere. But this is not 0 over 0. This is 2 over 0. So we have to do what we did like two hours ago. Anyway, x approaching 1 minus first. So what exactly do we get though? If we do 1 minus, we put it here. So we are looking at inverse tangent of 2 over 1 minus and then minus 1. So this is approaching what? 1 minus 1 is 0, but this is 1 minus, so it's 0 minus, right? So this is inverse tangent of 2 over 0 minus. 2 is positive, 0 minus is negative. So the inside will approach in, uh, negative infinity. So inverse tension of negative infinity is what? This will, will approach negative pi over 2. So this right here gives us negative pi over 2. Alright? Okay. And let's see if we have the limit as x approaching 1 plus inverse tangent of 2 over x minus 1. Well, you can see I'm just going to change this right here. This is going to be 1 plus. 1 plus minus 1 is 0 plus. 2 over 0 plus is positive infinity. And then inverse tangent of positive infinity is positive pi over 2. So this right here gives us positive pi over 2. Unfortunately, they are not the same. Therefore, this limit does not exist. And in fact, in this particular case, I don't remember, I, I forgot to mention this earlier. In this particular case, we actually have a so called a jump. This continuity at x equal to 1. Why? 
because as you can see, when x is approaching 1 from the left hand side, it does have a limit. But that limit is not the same as when we approach the 1 from the right hand side. These two limits have to be finite and they have to be different to in order for us to have a jump discontinuity. The picture of this should look like the following. I'll just give you guys a picture real quick. One is right here. When x is approaching one negative, it's negative power two, right? So you will get. And then when x is in negative infinity, we get zero. So yeah, you will get like this, and then negative power two, and then like this. Yeah, so there, there's a jump. It's very similar to. Oh man, yes. It's actually number question number two. This is a jump right here too. This is a jump. When when x is at two, right there. So yeah, I forgot to mention it. <laughs> anyway, that's number thirty-two. So sometimes when x is approaching to some number, uh, you don't have to do. You may not get zero over zero, but uh, if you get like two over zero like 5 over 0 then break down into cases like the things that we did earlier so those will be helpful Number 33, here, limit as x approaching 5, and then we have 1 over x squared minus 25. So 1 over x squared minus 1 over 25, I forgot what I said, and then on the bottom, we have x minus, sorry, we have x squared minus 25. Cool. Do not cancel this and that, they are very different. Fix the complex fraction first. And yes, this is a zero over zero situation. Okay, check it real quick. By the way, though, let's multiply the top and bottom by this and that, which is 25x squared. So we are going to get the limit as x approaching 5. This times that, the x squared will cancel, so we get 25 minus. This times that the 25 will cancel, so we have x uh, we have 25 minus x squared. On the bottom, you guess that we are not going to cancel things, we are not going to multiply things out. Let's just keep it as how it is. 25 x squared times x squared minus 25. Yeah, cool. Now, can we cancel this and that? No, not yet. This is kind of out of order. We like to have the x squared goes first, right? And we can do so by just changing right, factorial negative, and then we can say this is x squared minus 25. So this and now the same. Now we can cancel the x squared minus 25. Yeah. So what do we have? On the top, we still have the negative. And it's a negative 1. On the bottom, we have this 25 times 5 square which is just 25 so what's 25 times 25 i want to show you guys a fast way to do it whenever you are multiplying two numbers if they end with a five yeah you can do the following five times five is what 25 okay you do two times not two but times the next number which is three two times three is six so six twenty five so it's negative 1 over 625. Okay. I have a video on that. Pretty cool stuff. You guys can go and check that out on my Just Algebra channel. All right, ladies and gentlemen. 
Number 34. Limit as x approaching 8, and then we have the cube root of x minus 2 over x minus 8. Wow! How do we do this? We can multiply by the count you, the count you get to kind of complete the, the, the to get rid of the cube root. That's, that's possible. But let's look at the following, all right? Firstly, we can factor this as a difference of two cubes. I will show you guys that on the side. When we have a to the third power minus b to the third power, this right here is equal to a minus b times a squared plus ab and then plus b squared. What's x? x is the same as the cube root of x to the third power. What's 8? It's the same as 2 squared. I mean 2 to the third power. So I'm just going to put on the factor in right here. Just, I don't want to write this down, just put it here. So x minus 8, apply the formula, we will first get cube root of x minus 2. And you see they cancel already, huh? And we just have to figure out the rest, which is Okay, we had to square this, so I'm going to just put it down like this. The cube root of x, yeah? And then we have to square it. And then plus a, b, so we have to multiply these two together. So that's two and that, so it's two. And the cube root of x. And lastly, we have to put a b squared, which is two squared, which is just a plus four. So right here we have the plus four. Very nice, huh? Cancel, cancel. Wah ha 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 ha. All right. Now, let's put the 8 into here, here. And uh, we have 1 on the top over here. Cube root of 8. And then we square that. And then plus 2 times the cube root of 8. And then we add the 4. This is 2 inside, square that we get 4. This is 2 times 2 is 4. <laughs> 12. 1 over 12. Done. Ladies and gentlemen, that is number 34. Alright, I'm going to do one more question with, num with uh, this marker. And I'm going to change to a better marker so that way you guys can see uh like you guys can see this better i have a brand new marker over here and then later on when i do that smaller questions and sometimes if you just let the marker sit you know it's going to come back alive if you let me if you just put a marker like this for a while then yeah it will come back alive and you can solve like two or three integrals before it tries out again but anyway, number 35. This is called nested square root because we have a square root inside of a square root. Limit x approaching 9. And we have square root 1 plus square root of x and then minus 2 over x minus 9. Here's the deal. Plugging 9 into all the x's, yes, you get 0 over 0. I don't remember if I checked that earlier. Yeah, you, it was obvious. It was 0 for, 0 for number 34. Alright, for number 35 here, let's go ahead and multiply by a conjugate first to get rid of the square root. So I'm going to multiply the top and bottom by square root of 1 plus the square root of x and change this minus to a plus and then the 2 stays. And then let's do the same on the bottom. Cool. Now, this right here is the limit as x approaching 9. How do we multiply out the conjugate? Just square the first thing so that the big square root will cancel. So we have 1 plus square root of x. What's next? Minus 2 
square that, which is 4. Good. On the bottom, don't do anything, just write it down. So we have x minus 9, and then square root of 1 plus square root of x, and then plus 2. Good. On the top, we can actually just do 1 minus 4, which is square root of... <laughs> square root of x, or 1 minus... It's just this. Square root of x minus 3. Yeah. What do we do next? Do you want to multiply the conjugate again? Sure, be my guest. But, you know it, this guy, x minus 9, is the same as square root of x square minus 3 square, isn't it? So we can factor this as square root of x minus 3 times square root of x plus 3. Cancel the top. With that, no more 0 over 0, yay. Finally, 1 over, don't forget this, we have a square root of x is 9, just plug in, and then plus 3. So this is the first factor. And then, square root 1 plus square root of 9, and then plus 2. Just work this out. This is 3 plus 3 is 6 times this is 3 plus 1 is 4 square root of 4 is 2 2 plus 2 is 4 so we have 1 times 4 we have 6 times 4 and 1 over 24 yes I did it right I believe so Yeah, yeah. By the way, that is number 35. When we have double square roots, you can do the conjugate twice or just take advantage of like how we can factor it, like the ways I show you guys. Use radicals and then the difference of two squares or maybe the difference of two cubes. Page four, done. Oh, this sheet of paper is done. Moving on to page 5. Alright, for now, we'll be talking about the limit as x approaching infinity. Oh, to, yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you. Alright, number 36. Here we have the limit, and then we have x approaching infinity. And then we have cosine of inverse tangent of x. Okay, so for this kind of questions, um, it really depends on your teacher, your professor, your TA to see how they want you to show work. Uh, this is how I will allow my students or how I will show work to help students navigate the computation. You can just plug infinity into the x and then just kind of reason it out along the way. So we are going to get cosine of inverse tangent of infinity. And just have to remember that we're taking a limit, so then that will be okay. And then just draw arrows because you are taking a limit. So inside out, inverse tangent of infinity, meaning the limit as x approaching infinity of inverse tangent, the inside here gives us pi over 2, so we have cosine of pi over 2. And this is nice because cosine of pi over 2, nice and sweet and nice, right? Short and sweet, what's cosine of pi over 2? Zero, 0, yeah. So the answer for this right here is just 0, and then we are done. Just inside out, inside out. And of course, for this kind of questions, you will have to remember the limit as x approaching infinity, like the things I told you guys on the first page. Use the graph or the special function and all that. Number 37, uh, switch to this a little bit. Limit x approaching infinity inverse tangent of cosine of x. Well, 
Can we plug infinity into cosine x? What's this? If we uh, cosine of infinity, what does this mean? This right here does not exist. Why? Because remember, cosine looks like what? Right? So w w the limit as x approaching infinity of cosine x, this right here is just d and e. Alright? Done. If the inside is d and e already, you don't need to worry about what's after. This is not possible to do. So this right here is d and e. It's not because the inverse tangent of d and e is d and e. It's kind of like that, but don't do that. Th this is enough. Much better that way. Number 38. Everybody will love this kind of question. Limit as x approaching infinity. We have 2x to the third power minus 5x minus 3 over oh, x squared minus 2x minus 3. Sorry, this right here meant to be it's a square. Does this look familiar? It should, huh? Is that... Yeah. It's number 22, isn't it? Except for the fact that for number 22, it was x approaching 3. But right now, it's x approaching infinity. When we have x approaching infinity, much easier. We just have to care about the dominating part on the top and also the dominating part on the bottom. In this case, we just have to worry about the biggest power of x on the top, which is 2x squared. On the bottom, we just have to worry about the x squared. Reduce, we get 2, and then we are done. This is the limit that you do not want to miss. All right, why does this work? I'm going to show you guys. Uh, I just want to make a remark first though. If you are taking my class, if you do this, I'm to totally cool with that. But if you are taking a class uh, with a different professor, if your professor uh, wants you to do the following, then just do it this way. Here's the deal. When we are taking the limit as x approaching infinity, and keep in mind this is x approaching infinity, that's why we didn't even need to bother to factor whatsoever. We just had to pick out the dominating part. When we have x approaching infinity, let me write this down again. We have 2x squared minus 5x minus 3 over x squared minus 2x minus 3. When we have this, look at the biggest power of x. And that is x squared. And what you want to do is divide everybody by x squared. Divide everybody by x squared. And once we do that, we are looking at the limit as x approaching infinity. This is out, it's just a 2. But then we will have minus 5 over x. And then minus 3 over x squared. And then that will be just 1. And then minus that is 2 over x. And then lastly, minus 3 over x squared. As x goes to infinity, this has no x, so it has to be 2. But 5 over x, this will approach 0 because we discussed this before. 5 over infinity will approach 0, even though it's a minus, minus still 0. Similarly, this will also approach 0. Likewise, 0, likewise, 0. In another word, these parts, they don't really matter. It's just the 2 and also the 1. Reduce that, we get 2. However, if the power on the top, let's say we have x to a third power, let me just probably give you guys like a small bonus on the side. Before we continue, that's number 38. So number 38 with a star next to it, just like a small variation. If we have the limit as x approaching infinity, if we have 2x to the third power and then minus 5x minus 3 over x squared minus 2x minus 3. The dominating part on top is 2x to the third power and the dominating part on the bottom is x squared, the highest power of x pretty much. 
You see that degree right here, the power right here is bigger than the bottom. If you reduce, you just have x. As x goes to infinity, this right here will go to infinity. If the degree on the top is bigger, the whole thing goes to infinity. However, number 38, star star. If we have the limit as x approaching infinity, 2x, let's say third power, minus 5x, minus 3, but if the bottom is x to the sixth power, and then minus 2x, minus 3, you see now, the degree on the top is 3, the degree on the bottom here is 6. This is bigger than that. If the bottom is bigger, you get 0. Because you can reduce it, right? You get 1 over x to the third power after you reduce. We have well, 2 over x to the third power. As x goes to infinity, you get 0. So here are the three situations. You just compare the degree, aka the highest power of x on the top and also on the bottom. If they are the same, reduce the coefficient. If the top is bigger, then the answer will be infinity. If the bottom power right here is bigger, then you get 0. That's it. These are the limit questions that you do not want to miss on your calculus test. Alright, so that was 38. Now let's look at 39. Here we have the limit as x approaching infinity. We have inverse cosine, and then we have square root of 3. x plus 3 over 2 over x minus 9. So let's do this a slightly fast way. x is approaching infinity. We can do this inside out. So just look at the inside first. So because x is approaching infinity, that's exactly what we talked about earlier. So just look at this because that's x to the first power, likewise that. So in fact, they cancel just square root of 3 over 2. So this right here is just inverse cosine of square root of 3 over 2. Now the hard question is, what's the inverse cosine of square root of 3 over 2? Picture time. We have a right triangle. Square root of 3 is the adjacent, and then the 2 is the hypotenuse because we are talking about cosine, yeah? So this is the angle. It's again 1, 2, square root of 3. So this right here is pi over 6, 30 degrees. This is pi over 6. Alright, next we have the limit as x approaching infinity and then we have let, let's do this one ln of 2x to the third power plus 9 over x to the fifth power minus 12 Again, we can do this inside out and this is x approaching infinity. So here, let's just focus on 2x to the third power and then x to the fifth power. The degree on the bottom is bigger, so we get 0. So this right here is, uh, I, I should write it on this, just put a marker here. Inside here we get 0, right? And then we have ln. But ln 0 is not really a thing, but technically this inside is positive because when we have x approaching past infinity. So this zero is technically past the infinity. So what is ln of zero plus? What did I say earlier? This is zero plus. And then what's ln of zero plus? Yeah, there we go. This divided by that zero plus. Sorry. And then what's ln of zero plus? Negative infinity. Good. So yeah, you can just reason out this kind of questions in no time. That's why I said, if you want to show work for this, it might be harder than it has to be. If you do these kind of things, I think uh, we'll be happier. 
Usually, I like to ask these kind of questions in the motor portraits format, so that way uh, you guys don't have to struggle and you guys don't have to worry about uh, how to show work. You just have to determine the answer. Yeah, I know it's just a little thing, right? But my head, my arm <laughs> is still very tiring. <laughs> 41. Have a look at the limit as x approaching infinity sine of x over x. What's the answer for this? We did this for question number 5. Sine of x is in between of negative 1 and 1, it's finite. As x goes to infinity, the bottom is infinity. So if you have a finite number divided by infinity, yeah, you get 0, for sure. But if you want to do this a slightly more legitimate way, you do, you do it like this. This is called a squeeze theorem. The idea is that you first have to mention that, okay, sine x is in between of negative 1 and 1. So we can write this down. Right, this is our inequality. Cool. And now we can divide everybody by x. So that's what we are looking at, right? So divide everybody by x, like so. Good. And then we will take the limit as x goes to infinity for everybody. And then if you do that, you can see that this is the saying we have 0 here, and then 1 over, zero, one over x, x goes to infinity is also 0. And then in the middle is exactly what we're looking at. The limit as x approaching infinity sin x over x. And as you can see, this limit is in between of 0 and 0. Therefore, it has to be 0. Done. It's a squeeze. It has to be 0. Done. All right, number 43. I'm going to do 43, 44, 45. Hopefully, not, not possible. I don't think it's possible for me to do three questions on the same board. Number 43, we have the limit as x approaching infinity. And uh, we have square root of x plus 3 minus square root of x plus, uh, sorry, x minus 1. I'm not going to close the parentheses. For this one, let's see. When we put infinity into here and here, square root of infinity plus 3 just infinity square root of infinity is infinity. And the reason is because if we have infinity for the base raised to a positive exponent, this right here will give us infinity. And the square root is the same as saying 1 half power. So that's why square root of infinity gives us infinity. And then minus, same idea, infinity. So we are talking about a new kind of indeterminate form for this video, infinity of infinity. The answer is not necessarily zero. Why is infinity minus infinity in determinate form? It's right here. Anything that you see right here is indeterminate, meaning that we cannot draw any conclusion yet. Well, how do we do it? Just like what we did before, when we see square roots, use the count you get and give it a try. Let's multiply the top and bottom. That's why I didn't close the parentheses. Let's multiply the top and bottom by square root of x plus 3. Change this to a plus and then square root of x minus 1. And then let's do the same thing on the bottom. Square root of x plus 3 plus square root of x plus 1. Cool. Now, this is the limit as x approaching infinity. The bottom stays the same, huh? So square root of x plus 3 plus square root of x plus 1. On the top, you just square the first term, which is just x plus 3, and then minus square the second term, which is x minus 1, but you should put parentheses. The first parentheses doesn't matter, but second parentheses does matter. All right, and then we can simplify this. This is the limit as x approaching infinity. x minus x is gone. 3 minus minus, which is 4. So it's 4 
over square root of x plus 3 plus square root of x plus 1. What's the answer for this? 0. Why? Because the top, as you can see, is just a 4. It's finite. But if you have the infinity on the bottom, you will get infinity plus infinity, which is infinity. 4 over infinity, we get 0. Okay, so the x and minus x is gone. So yeah, cool, huh? So in this case, yeah, my goodness, infinity minus infinity, we did get 0. Do you see anything wrong? Don't worry. Have a look. Let's look at number 44. Oh, I'm going to change a little bit, huh? I'm just going to change a little bit. Let's look at the limit as x approaching infinity. Square root of 2x plus 3 and then minus square root of x minus 1. All right, so I'm just going to change this a little bit. Well, I have a 2 right here instead. Okay. And it's the same idea. We will still have infinity minus infinity, so I'm not going to say too much about it. We'll just go ahead and get to work. So multiply the top and bottom by conjugate, which is square root of 2x plus 3 plus square root of x minus 1. And then same thing on the bottom, square root of 2x plus 3 and then plus square root of x minus 1. Cool. Same thing on the t like earlier. Here we have the limit as x approaching infinity. All right, so here we have square root of 2x plus 3 and then plus square root of x minus 1. What's on the top? Square this minus square of that. So we have 2x plus 3 and then minus x minus 1. Okay, let's see what exactly we are going to get this time. This is the limit as x approaching infinity. x, sorry, 2x minus x is x. So we have x on the top now, huh? 3 minus negative 1 is 4, and that's a positive 4. So it's x plus 4 over those things. Square root of 2x plus 3 plus square root of x minus 1. What's the answer this time? I'll tell you. The answer for this one right here is infinity. Yeah, show you. All right. Again, x is approaching infinity, so pick up the dominating part on the top, which is just x to the first power. On the bottom, pick up the dominating part. The plus 3 doesn't matter, so we have square root of 2x. And then from this, we also have the square root of x. Yeah. So technically, we can look at this as square root of 2 times square root of x plus square root of x. And we can combine them as square root of 2 plus 1 times square root of x. This is just a coefficient. But the main thing is, we have x over that. This is x to what power? This is x to the first power. This is x to the 1 half power. Which one's bigger? Top is bigger. Whole thing is infinity. Told you. And as you can see, infinity minus infinity, hey, we end up with infinity. All right, quick summary. The uh, number 33, we get 0. The answer for number 33 is 0. This tells us this expression and that expression are about the same size as x goes to infinity. Okay? However, the answer for number 44 is equal to infinity. It means this expression is so, so, so much bigger than that as x goes to infinity. So that's why when you subtract, this infinity is way bigger than that. So not all infinities are the same size. Yeah. <laughs> all right. I'm also going to show you guys number 45. It's another infinity minus infinity situation. And we will actually get a very interesting value. It's a finite value. It's not like a super cool number like e to the square root of 17 for something. No, it's just, you'll see.
Number 45. Here we have the limit as x approaching infinity <laughs> and then square root of x squared plus 6x plus 1 and then minus square root of x squared plus 1. And notice this time the inside here they are both quadratic. Earlier they are just both linear. Anyway, if you put infinity into this and that, we get infinity minus infinity. All right, so I just want to mention that real quick. But you know the deal is that we will just multiply by the conjugate. So let's go ahead and just get to work. So square root x squared plus 6x plus 1, and then plus square root of x squared plus 1 over the same thing. So square root of x squared plus 6x plus 1 and then plus square root of x squared plus 1. Okay, this right here gives us the limit as x approaching infinity. On the bottom we have square root of x squared plus 6x plus 1 plus another square root of x squared plus 1. You know why calculus is hard? It's because a lot of times we just have to write the same thing over and over and over. Yeah. But anyway though, bring this down. Now, multiply this out. We just have to square this, which is just x squared plus 6x plus 1. You don't need a parenthesis for that. But then minus, you do need a parenthesis for this, x squared plus 1. All right? So now check this out. x squared, x squared, the cancel. We have 6x on the top. Let me just put on the result here. And then 1 minus 1. I, 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 I think I'm just going to rewrite everything again to make it super clear. So if we cancel the top, this is the limit as x approaching infinity. We will just get 6x on the top. 1 minus 1 is also gone. Huh? And then all this. OK picked up the highest power of x on top. It's just this, 6x to the first power. But guess what? On the bottom, this is the highest power right here. And square root of x squared. What's square root of x squared? Yes, we can cancel them. But if you just cancel them, you actually have to put an absolute value because the output of a square root is always positive. Quick example. When we have square root of negative 4 squared, you do this inside out. This is 16, right? And then take the square root, you get 4. So you see, if you have square root of negative 4 squared, if you just cancel them, and then you just say the answer is negative 4, this is wrong. You have to include the absolute value. And then you see this is indeed equal to 4 now, OK? However, you don't need the absolute value if you know the inside, if you know the x is positive already. x is approaching positive infinity, so this part is just equal to x, and that's legitimate. Just x, no square root needed. Likewise here, this is also equal to x. So guess what? On the bottom, we actually just have x plus x. Wow. So technically, together on the bottom, we just have 2x. So 6x over 2x, the x cancel. 6 over 2, the answer is 3. Ladies and gentlemen, I told you. Infinity minus infinity, hey, we also get a nice number 3. Can you get pi? Yeah, if you manufacture a good example, yeah, you can get pi. Can you get e to the 17 power minus 2? Yeah, if you would like, you can try it. Manufacture a question. It's possible. But Again, infinity minus infinity, it's not always equal to zero. We cannot draw any conclusion unless we do more work because that is an indeterminate form. All right, number 45, let me just take a look at, uh, wow, three hours already.
definition of derivatives. So I wanted to tell you guys that for number 45, sorry, for number 46 to number 50, we will use the definition of derivative to calculate the derivative of a function as some number. So I will write this down for you guys. If we have f prime of a, this right here, I call this definition one. I would, I'm just going to write it like this, yeah. So I call this definition one. Just put like one right here. This right here is the limit as x approaching a. And then we have f of x minus f of a over x minus a. Okay. So it's pretty much the difference of quotient, and then you let x approaching a. So that's how you can find the slope of the tangent line. Secondly, this is why I call the definition of two. They are equivalent. This is the one with h, the limit as h approaching zero. And for this one, we get f of, I forgot. Now I remember. Okay, I know. My merge. Yeah, I designed this. I have a t shirt and also a canvas print. Yeah. So I'll put it on the side. Okay. Alright, anyway. F of A plus H minus F of A. Yeah or over h. Okay, so definition one, definition two. Let me just talk about them briefly. This right here, it's easier uh, if you like factoring. This right here, it's easier if you like uh, expanding. So that's the advantage and also, yeah, I have uh, another video that I kind of compare both definitions so you guys can take a look at that video. <laughs> I'm gonna, Another channel, just calculus. Anyway, what are we doing? Okay, number 46. Let's say our function f of x is equal to 4x to the third power, 4x to the second power plus 3x. We want f of negative, we want f prime of negative 2. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, number 46, f prime of negative 2. Let's use the first definition. This is just the limit as x approaching negative 2. And you see f of x is just that, so we can just put that here. 4x squared plus 3x, and then minus, we need f of negative 2. So let's put it on the side. Let's actually do here. f of negative 2 means we're plugging negative 2 into this x and that x. So we get 4 times negative 2 squared plus 3 times negative 2. This is 4 times that is 16. Yes, 16 minus 6 is 10. Yes, so this right here is minus 10. So f of negative 2 is 10. And then on the bottom, we have the x minus a is negative 2. So minus minus becomes plus 2. All right, cool. And now, if you take a look right here, doesn't this remind you of the algebraic limits that we did? Yes. Is there a fast way to do this? Yes, but let's do the things that we did earlier. Okay, I will tell you, if you put negative 2 into all the x's, for sure you get 0 over 0. Why? because we set it out to be 0 over 0. When we put a into this x and that x, it was f of a minus f of a, 0. a minus a, 0. Likewise here, 0 over 0. If you don't get 0 over 0, then that means you set it out wrong. Anyway though, how do we simplify this? We can actually just factor it. So let me see. Let me put it down on the side. 4x squared plus 3x minus 10. Uh, no common factor, so we'll just do a tic-tac-toe right away. So, you know the deal. We need to have x and 
two right here. Four x. Uh, two times four will be negative ten. It's negative five. Why does this work? We need to get rid of that, right? So that's it. But check this out. Check this out. X times negative five is negative five x, and then two times four x is eight x. Together we do get a three x that we want. Okay, so this is the limit as x approaching negative two. On the top is just that, namely x minus so x plus two times four x minus five. On the bottom is still x plus two. Over auto, we see that this and that can cancel. Finally, put a negative two into here, and uh, we will get four times negative two and then minus five. Negative eight minus five is negative thirteen. Done. Cool. But wow, that's a lot of work. I wonder if there's a way for me to know if we did this right or not. Yes, of course, we can do this question in like five seconds. Check this out. All right. This is the definition of derivative. This is the so-called power rule. I will have to mention this along the way because coming up next, we will be using the Laplace rule, which we need the derivative. But if you are just learning derivative for the very first time, then please use the definition. Anyway, this is how it goes. Start with f of x equals 4x squared plus 3x. And 3x is like the 3x to the first power. I will show you how it goes. To get f prime of x, whenever we have x to some power right here, not on the bottom, not just right here, huh? If you are multiplying by some number, that's good, that's cool. You can put the num put the power to the front and multiply with this. Multiply the two with that, and then minus the power. So my minus one to the power. So this right here will give us four times two is eight. X to the first power. Can we do the same thing for this one? Yes. Put the one to the front. Three times one is three. And then don't forget to minus one to the power. One minus one is zero. X to zero's power is one. So this is our f prime of x. It's so cool. Because now we can just plug in negative two that we wanted. So f prime of negative two is eight times negative two plus three. You bet it is negative 13. Done. Power rule. But don't be too happy about it because knowing the power rule is not knowing all the calculus. This is a nice result after the um, definition of the derivative, I'll say. All right, I want to make sure that I didn't, I'm, I'll have to make sure that I am not erasing the definitions because I would like to have them on the board until the end of the category, until this category. If you guys need help with derivatives, yes, you know it. We have the 100, we have had 100 derivative. Took me a long time to do that as well. Anyway, number 47. Okay, function x over x plus 2. We want f prime of 3. Hey, can we do the power rule? If we put a 1, 1 bring it to a 1, 1 minus 1 is 0, x plus 0 is 1. So we just get 1 and then 1 plus 2. The answer is just 1 third. No. No, 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 no. No. Don't do that. That's why. Definition of derivative is the key, alright? Especially to take care of us when we're trying to do something new. The limit as x approaching 3, right? We're following the first definition. We get x minus 3. And then on the top, f of x is that, so it's just x over x plus 2. And then minus, we will have to put f of 3, yeah? So I'll just indicate that right here. 
f of 3 is just 3 over 3 plus 2 so it's just 3 over 5 so it's minus 3 over 5 okay as we can see we have a complex fraction situation therefore we are going to do the things that we did right that's why we talk about the algebraic ways to 2d limits i'm going to multiply the top and bottom by this and that so it's 5 times x plus 2 and likewise here 5 times x plus 2 all right here we are going to get a limit as x approaching 3 let me just keep them as how they are so 5 and then x minus 3 x plus 2 now let's multiply out the top this times that x plus 2 cancel so we have 5x minus 5 and 5 cancel but we have this 3 and also the x plus 2 am i right let me just double check okay cool now i had i didn't leave space on the top so i'm just going to kind of do it on the side so you see this is just 5x minus 3x and then minus 6 yeah so it's just 2x hold on oh no no 2x minus 6 so this right here is 2x minus 6 and then we can factor out the 2 so it's 2 times x minus 3 okay so the top on so the top part is that so let me just rewrite this so we get 2 times x minus 3 and you see we can cancel things out on the bottom so 5 times x minus 3 x plus 2 very nice huh x minus 3 cancel now put a 3 into here so we are going to get 2 over 5 times 3 plus 2 that's 5 times 5 is 25 so altogether we get 2 over 25 done it was not like power rule yeah you have to use the so-called quotient rule but we're not going to get into that in this video we have the 100 we have the 100 derivative for that already so go ahead and check that out all right number 48 let's talk a, let's take a look at this square root function f of x equals square root of 2x plus 5 and then we want f prime of 2 and let's just use the first definition um, i think it's more straightforward more direct this way yeah but this one also works don't worry we will have a chance to practice this data on you'll see anyway this is the limit as x approaching 2 and then here we have our function square root of 2x plus 5 minus okay we need the f of 2 so let me write it down here f of 2 equals square root of 2 times that 2 and then plus 5 that's 9 take the square root is 3 so it's 3 right here and then over x minus 2 aha once we set this up it becomes <laughs> What's that called? It becomes that algebraic limit question, right? So let's go ahead and just do the count you get. Multiply the top and bottom by square root of 2x plus 5 plus 3. And then let's also do the same on the bottom. Square root of 2x plus 5 plus 3. Okay. Now, this is the limit as x approaching 2. Okay. Square this, so we just have 2x plus 5 and then minus 3 times you know, 3 squared which is 9 and then the bottom stays so x minus 2 times all that all right the top right here let's just do it on the side real quick that's 2x 
minus 4 and then we can factor out a 2 right so it's, it's this so I'm just going to squeeze out the result here 2 times x minus 2 okay and then I'm just going to cancel the x minus 2 x minus 2 perfect all right we have this 2 right here though be really careful so 2 over put this 2 in here so we have square root of 2 times 2 plus 5 and then plus 3 that's 9 square root of 9 is 3 3 plus 3 is 6 2 over 6 is 1 third is it? yeah okay alright so now and then that's yeah, no, that's okay. Let's just do this with actual numbers. Uh, for the derivative, for the uh, derivative technique, uh, it's coming anyway, so don't worry. Let's practice. Oh, we have two more questions. Okay, anyway, though. 50. What am I talking about? Number 49. If you are still watching, leave your timestamp right now. Appreciate it. You're working hard. I am working hard too. Okay, let's see. Number 49. f of x equals x to the third power plus 4. And then we want f prime of 1. So I'll use the power rule for this later on. But anyway though, if we want f prime of 1, as I mentioned here a couple minutes ago or so, if you use this definition, it's easier to, you will have to factor it, if you like factoring. And if you use this, then you will have to uh, expand it. Now let's just do this one. So this right here is the limit as x approaching 1 function is x to the third power plus 4. And then we need to know the f of 1, right? So f of 1 is just equal to 1 to the third power plus 4, which is 5. So this means we have x to the third power plus 4 and then minus 5. Yeah, and then on the bottom we have x minus 1. Yeah, it's not bad to factor this at all, so this is good. Limit x approaching 1. On the top is just x to the third power minus 1. And on the bottom is x minus 1. Okay, this is the same as 1 to the third power. So factor it. Difference of two cubes. We get x minus 1 times x squared plus 1 times x, so it's just x. And then plus 1 squared, which is just 1. And then on the bottom is x minus 1. And then x minus 1 cancel. Ladies and gentlemen, put a 1 here, here. 1 plus 1 plus 1. We get 3. Yay. Cool. Now, let's see if we can finish these questions in 3 seconds. No, like, that's 5 seconds. I'm copying another question, also, it's, it's, it doesn't count. Ready? Okay, f prime of x. Bring the power to the front, minus 1, we get 3x squared. Well, this is just a 4. But if you use the power rule, you can look at this as x to the 0's power. Put a 0 to the front. 0 times 4 is 0, so it's no more. So we just have this. f prime of 1. 3 times 1 squared. And we get 3. Wow. Wow. Powerful. Power rule. So powerful, isn't it? Okay. Alright, number 50. 
here we have our function is just 1 over square root of x and we want f prime of 9 so here we go f prime of 9 this is my 9 this is my a here we go limit x approaching 9 our function is 1 over square root of x and we have to minus f of 9 which is just 1 over square root of 9 and that's just 1 third okay not bad at all so minus 1 third uh, let me just write it down better for you guys what's on the bottom x minus 9 yay okay here we have two things to worry. One, we have a complex fraction, a small fraction instead of a big fraction. Second thing is we have square root. Yeah. By the way, let's take care of the complex fraction first. Multiply the top and bottom by this and that, so it's 3 square root of x. Okay, so we see this is the limit as x approaching 9. This times that, square root of x will cancel, so we have 3, and then minus cancel so we have square root of x I'm just going to keep them as how they are so we have 3 square root of x times x minus 9 oh, oh hold on hold on hold on this is square root of x my bad all right so for the top I'm going to change the order of subtraction this is negative square root of x minus 3 I switch the order and put a negative on the outside for this Let's not do the conjugate anymore. So just look at this and then factor. We get square root of x minus 3 times square root of x plus 3. All right. So now you see this and that cancel out completely. Very nice. So ladies and gentlemen, on the top we have negative 1 over here we have 3 and then here we have square root of x, x is 9, that's gone, and then here we have square root of 9 plus 3, yeah, and now we just have to work this out, this is 3 times 3 times 3 plus 3 is 6, 9 times 6 is 54, so altogether we get negative 1 over 54, done, give you guys a small bonus right here, in fact, we can also use the power rule for this question. Check this out. When we have our function, this is 1 over square root of x. In calculus, a lot of times we look at the square root as the 1 half power. So this right here is the same as saying x to the 1 half power. But we can bring that up. So this right here is actually just x to the negative 1 half power. Okay. And the reason that we want to do this is because we can use the power rule. Check this out. Put the power to the front and then minus 1. So we get f prime of x. And we get negative 1 over 2 at the front. And then x. This minus that is negative 3 over 2. Yeah. What's next? Well, we want f prime of 9, yeah? So f prime of 9. This right here gives us negative... Yeah, let, let me just write it down. Negative 1 half, and then we have 9, and then to the negative 3 half power. The main question is, how do we simplify this? If we can do it, then we are done, yeah? So, usual thing, put the power, right? If it's a negative power, then put it to the bottom. So this right here is negative 1 on the top over 2. And then... Once we bring this down to the bottom, we have the over 2 right here, right? Let's change that to a square root, and then we have the 9. And then, raise that to the third power. So that's pretty much how you do it. Again, this negative, bring this down to the bottom. The over 2 power change to the square root, and then the third power stays. And you see, square root of 9 is 3. 3 to the third power is 27, times 2 is 54, and that's on the bottom. All in all, negative 1 over 54. How cool is that, huh?
Yes, no, I'm not done yet. I know, but I just... <laughs> Pause. It's not funny. Yeah, still have like 50 more to go. 51 more to go. Actually, I don't know if it's 50 or 51. I'm not really. Go see, go see. All right, next, we want to do this. 51, we are given the function f of x, and this is just a regular polynomial, it's quadratic. We have 3x squared minus 5x plus 7. Instead of saying f prime of like 2, f prime of negative 7, we want f prime of just x. So now here's the trouble. Can we still use definition one? Kind of. If you put this x, if you make this x red, then you are talking about the limit as this x approaching this x, right? This x is, let's say it's red. Then we can just replace the a with the red x. But you know the deal, this does not, not, it doesn't look good at all, right? It does not look good at all, so no. That's why we have definition two. If we want to do f prime of x, then we look at this right here and just replace the a with x and it's still legit. Yeah, see, it's the official definition of the derivative. Okay, so I am just going to um, Now I'm just going to write this right here. Here we go. We're looking at definition of 2 and just change the a to x. That's all you have to remember. So here we have the limit as h approaching 0. And this right here, it's not easy. This is the, perhaps the one of the first things that people dislike about the calculus part. It's pretty demanding, I would say. Anyway, we want to have f of x plus h. So what that means is, we want to look at all the x's here and then plug in x plus h. I'll show you. We will first get 3 times x plus h and then square that and then you continue minus f of x so minus 5 of minus 5 times x plus h and then plus 7 so that's the f of x plus h part. And then we want to minus f of x, which is just the original. So just minus, and then we just put this down. 3x squared minus 5x plus 7. And you can see that this expression is pretty long already. And um, perhaps it's the longest, especially if you just come from pre calc and yeah, pretty intimidating. So that's the idea. But for now, I'm just going to erase both of this. So that way we can actually just put down the definition of derivative for f prime of x and then we'll focus on that. So let me do that for you guys right here. So ladies and gentlemen, f prime of x, this right here equals the limit as h approaching zero. We have f of x plus h minus f of x and then all over h. And this is definitely a definition that you have to remember for your calculus class. So how do we take of this? Well, we will have to expand it. That's why I told you guys earlier, I just used definition one because now we will just be doing this right here. Just do it. All right, here we go. This right here, we have the limit as h approaching zero. Open this, we get three in the front and then we have Mm, let's just put this down in black. x squared plus 2xh and then plus h squared. And then distribute it, we get minus 5x minus 5h. And then this is the plus 7. Distribute it, we get negative 3x squared minus minus becomes plus 5x and then minus 7. And then all of h. But don't forget, we still have this to, di to be distributed. Let me just put it on the top. Here we have. 3x squared plus 
6xh and then plus 3h square. Now, here's the best part. We can cancel things, hopefully. Let's see. 3x square. Negative 3x square. Cancel. Good. Negative 5x. Positive 5x. Cancel. Good. 7 minus 7. No more. Good. This, this, and that remains on the top. And notice everybody has an h. We can factor that out. So we will. Here we have the limit as h approaching 0. Factor out the h. We get first thing 6x, second thing plus 3h, and the last thing right here we have the minus 5. Don't forget to have this remained. And then all divided by h. Now, Cancel out the h, and this is the reason why I told you guys you should keep writing down the limit as uh, h approaching zero or like whatever is approaching whatever. Because now you see how we have both x and h in the expression, but it's only h is approaching zero, so you're plugging zero into h. So this is like a reminder of what you have to do. You put h to be zero in here, so you just have six x. No more, and then minus 5. And here you have it. That's the answer. Can we do this in 5 seconds? Yes. f of x equals 3x squared minus 5x plus 7. Derivative in action. Power rule, bring the power to the front, minus 1. 6x to the first power. Second part, minus 5x to the first power. Yeah. Bring the power to the front, minus 1, so just minus 5. x plus 0, just 1. This right here, no x, so it's just a constant. The derivative of this is just 0, so done. I know, I know, I know. Why are we doing this? You will see. Let's uh, practice one more, and then you will see. For 53, 54, 55, then you will really see why we need the definition of derivative. Very good. Fifty-two. It's a very simple function. It's just x to the third power. I didn't want to go too crazy. We want the f prime of x. So here we go. F prime of x. Okay, let me just put it down like this. So here we go. We want the limit as x as h approaching zero, and then. This part means we're just plugging x plus h into here. So we have x plus h, third power, and then minus f of x, which is just that original, and then all over h. Open this, we get limit as h approaching 0. And let's use the Pascal triangle, 1, 3, 3, 1. So first we will have 1 times x to a third power, so just x to a third power, plus 3 times x squared and h to the first power and then plus 3 times x to the first power h squared plus h to the third power so that's the expansion for that and then minus x to the third power o of h <laughs> we can only cancel one thing but the good thing is that you have h you can factor that out and we get 3x squared plus 3x h and then plus h square okay and then you see that this h and that h cancel finally put a zero into this h and that h so they are gone and we get 3x square done yeah so pretty much if you do this if the question is asking you the definition of derivative for x to the third power, if you do this, then you'll get full credit. And you'll be happy, you know, you can, yeah. But you can, of course, check the answer in your head or so. But just don't let your professor, your teacher, your TA see it. Two seconds. One, two, three x squared, done.
Okay, so now let's see. We have the power rule already. Why do we need the definition of derivative, right? Well, of course, the reason is because the power rule only works for x to some power, right? x to some power. If we don't have x to some power, then oops, uh oh, yeah, I don't know what other sound effect I can give you. But anyway, let's look at number 53 f of x equals sin x how do we do the power rule huh technically you can still do the power rule but you will have to take calculus 2 because you have to write this as a power series and use the power rule but let's not go there yet anyway f prime of x limit as h approaching 0 right if we cannot use the power rule use the definition of derivative first we put the x plus h into the here so we have sine of x plus h and then minus the original just sine x and then over h well as i told you whenever we use this definition we will think about how to expand it especially the bigger part which is this and we do have a way to expand this this is just the angle sum formula for sine and I'll tell you guys what the formula is. This right here, still limit as h approaching 0. We will first get sine of the first thing, which is x, times cosine of the second, which is h. And then we add sine of the second, so sine of h, times cosine of the first. So it's like this. And then minus sine of x and all over h. Cool. Impressive, but what do we do next? Well, keep this in mind. This is the limit as h approaching 0. So, this is like in the h world. Meaning that if you don't have h, like for example the sine x, you can actually put it on the outside of the limit and don't worry about it. So, have a look. This term has sine x. This term also has the sine x. We can put them together and we can factor out the sine x and then kick it outside of the limit. So, let's do two things right now. I'm going to pair this and that right here, okay? And then I'll factor out the sine x and then put it on the outside of the limit. So we have the sine x right here. And then let's look at the limit as h approaching zero. Here we'll just have cosine of h and then minus one and then over h we still have that denominator all right and of course we have other stuff too but for the other stuff is this over h and then we can take the limit of that so let's break it apart let's also put the cosine x outside so i'm looking at this right now for the second part i'm going to add cosine x on the outside same reason because it doesn't have the h and then we just focus on the limit of sine h over h as h approaching zero all right so the reason that we can do this is limit of a sum it's the sum of the limits so you can break them apart and also if you don't have the h then you can put a expression on outside of the limit so that's why we are doing that's why we can do this okay this right here we get zero for zero likewise that but you know what this right here we have seen it question number five so let me just remind you guys that note if we have a limit earlier I used x right now we have h I know I'm going to be using theta right now I think it's like a more universal variable for this limit in particular by the way though sine of an angle sine of theta over theta this right here will give you one and then you can see question number five for the graph for now this video i will just tell you guys look at the graph that we have uh well you can also just plug into calculator i didn't do anything with the calculator in this video because uh, it's just plugging the calculator right so you should be able to just plug into the calculator but this right here you please do not use L'Hopital's rule what's L'Hopital's rule 
just wait for it. Anyway, what I'm trying to say is that this right here, per our discussion earlier, is 1. So we have this times cosine x. And then, what's this then? In fact, you can try it, multiply the top and bottom by the conjugate, and use this to help you out. You can try it, but I will tell you the answer right here, you get 0. Or you can use the graph, just use the graph and calculate what? Use a calculator, plug in the numbers. That's not a discussion for here, but like that, that's equal to 0. So on, on, we get what? 0 cosine x. Hey, the answer is just nicely equal to cosine x. Sine and cosine, yeah, they're always together in uh, pre-calc, trick, and also calculus, of course. Yeah, they don't run away from each other. Yeah, and let me just make sure that I did this right. Aha, the derivative of sine x is equal to cosine x, told you. Okay, anyway. I want you guys to pay attention to that. Hey, we run into this limit right here when we are trying to get the derivative of sine x. This is going to show up later on, in like an hour or two, I don't know. By the way, All right, so now let's take a look at 54. Here we have the, sorry, uh, we're still doing the definition of the derivative. Number 54, we have the function f of x. This is one over one plus x squared, and then we want f prime of x. Can we use the power rule right here and say the answer is f prime of x equals to the power rule, and then we get one over one plus two x. Can we bring the 2 to the front minus 1? No. Huh? No. I will show you we can actually use the power rule along with something called the chain rule, and then we can actually still formulate the easy way, the aka the so called easy way to do this kind of question. But let's do the definition of the derivative first. The limit as h approaching 0 f of x plus h, so we put that here, 1 over 1 plus parentheses x plus h. And then we square that, and then minus 1 over x squared, and all over h. Wow! It's a complex fraction with a lot of things. Anyway, multiply the top and bottom by this and that, so... Oh, sorry, it's not just x squared, it's 1 plus x squared. Wow! Crazy. I uh, hope you guys can see this. Okay, let me just fix this a little bit. 1 over 1 plus x squared. Ready? Multiply the top and bottom by this, which is 1 plus x squared. Also that, and perhaps I'll just multiply this out right here at the same time. So we have 1 plus, open that, we get x squared plus 2xh plus h squared. And then, of course, let's also put that down on the bottom here. 1 plus x squared plus 2xh plus h squared. Alright, so here we will have the limit as h approaching 0. Take this times that. This and that cancel. So we have the first part. 1 plus x squared. And then minus. This times that. This and that cancel. So we just have this. So I'm just going to keep it. In the parentheses, we get 1 plus x squared plus 2xh plus h squared. Alright? Cool. And then the bottom, maintain it. h times 1 plus x squared times 1 plus x squared plus 2xh plus h squared. Wow. I wish I could just copy and paste. Maybe it's easier that way, huh? Anyway, so we're just going to see what we can do. Check this out. 1 minus 1, this and that and cancel, yeah? 1 minus 1. 
because you have to distribute the one. And the x square, x square cancel. So you see that we just have this and that left, and they both have h. We can factor that out. And it has a negative in the front. Let's keep the negative in the front as well. So we have the limit as h approaching 0, negative, h on the outside, and then we have 2x plus another h, like so. All right, and then all that stuff. h times 1 plus x squared times 1 plus x squared plus 2xh plus h squared. Yay. Okay, let's do this in our head. Put 0 into h, right? Put 0 into h. So we have negative 2x on the top. Over. Here we have what? 1 plus x squared. Right? And then put 0 into h. So this and that cancel. We have 1 plus x squared. Whoa, look at that. It's a pretty clean result. This and that are the same though. So we can just put it as power 2, right? So negative 2x over 1 plus x squared and then squared. And then we are done. Cool. Okay, now as promised earlier, um, I told you guys we can use the power rule. And you see, this is totally wrong. But how can we really avoid doing the definition of derivative? Check this out. It's all about rewriting and then also pay attention to the so-called chain rule. f of x is that 1 over 1 plus x squared. Let's first purposely rewrite this as parentheses with 1 plus x squared inside, but then because we bring up, we, we, we brought this up, right? So it will be the negative 1 power. And the reason now we want to do this is now we can use the power rule. Bring the power to the front and then minus 1. What do we get? f prime of x. We have the negative right here. And then the base, you keep it, which is 1 plus x squared. And then 1 minus, well, negative 1 minus 1 is negative 2. Okay. Wow, look, I can bring this down to the bottom and this is negative 1 over, this is 1 plus x squared and then squared. Wait. I thought we can use, I thought we could use the power rule, but I get negative 1 on the top right here. Earlier we have negative 2x. What's the deal? Is that wrong? That's wrong, huh? It must be wrong. The easy way is always right, huh? No. Definition is much better. Stalled it. So, here's the deal. How can we come up with the 2x? Well, when calculus. So we have to think derivative. Here's the deal. When we put the negative 1 to the front and then minus 1, we just do the power on the outside. And the idea is, you also have to look at inside to see what the function is and multiply the derivative of that. So you see the derivative of this? The derivative of 1 is 0, but the derivative of a 2, the derivative of x squared is 2x. So we have to multiply this by 2x. So this is the so-called chain rule part, which is needed. So you see, if we multiply by 2x, altogether, we have the answer that we have earlier. So hopefully you guys can see why we need the definition of derivative. It tells you what has to be right. If you want to use the shortcut, well, earlier without seeing that, then we'll miss the 2x, right? So that's the reason for the definition of derivative. And then let's do it again for number 55. And maybe you guys can count how many times have I said, have I said here's the deal. I, I, I don't know. I don't know why I kept saying, here's the deal, here's the deal. Especially for this video. I have no idea. Number 55. f of x equals square root, and we have 3x plus 1, 
Wow. Yes, we can use the definition of derivative and we can also use the power rule and also the chain rule. You will see. First, let's do the legitimate way. F prime of x equals the limit as h approaching zero. F of x plus h, you change the x to f. You change the x to x plus h. So you have the square root, three parentheses, x plus h, and then plus one, and then minus the original function, which is just that. Let's just, just copy that down. Square root of three x plus h, and then all over h. Okay, square root business, use the conjugate, right? So let's multiply the top and bottom by square root, and let's multiply this also. It's 3x plus 3h and then plus 1, and then plus square root of that, which is 3x plus 1. And let's do the same on the top, uh, on the bottom. <laughs> 3x plus 3h plus 1 plus square root of 3x plus 1. Cool. All right, here, limit as h approaching 0, open the top, right? multiply on the top, we just get this square, which is just inside here, 3x plus 3h plus 1, minus this thing square, which is just 3x plus 1. And then the bottom stays the same, huh? So we have h times square root, 3x plus 3h plus 1, and then plus square root of 3x plus 1. Ladies and gentlemen, 3x minus 3x, this and that cancel. 1 minus 1 cancel. Perfect. On the top, we have 3 times h now. On the bottom here, we have h times all that. So this h and that h cancel. Cool. Therefore, we have a 3 on the top over put 0 into here, so we have square root of 3x plus 1, that's the first square root, and now we actually have another one, huh? Wow, and they happen to be the same, and we're adding, therefore it becomes two of them, so on all, we have 3 over 2 square root of 3x plus 1. Done. Now, the moment that you have been waiting for, f of x equals, okay, we have the square root of 3x plus 1. But as I said earlier, let's write the square root as 1 half power. That way we can use the power rule. So 3x plus 1 raised to the 1 half power. Once we do this, we can go ahead and use the power rule, meaning that put the power to the front, minus 1, so we have the 1 half at the front, and then the inside is 3x plus 1, 1 half minus 1 is negative 1 half. Negative 1 half is the same as bring this down to the bottom and then give it a square root to it. So we have 1 over 2 square root of 3x plus 1. Oh, man. This is what we have now. That's what we got earlier. 3 on the top. We only have 1. Where are the other 2? 1 plus 3. 1 plus 2 is 3. Not funny, I know. But you know the deal. What you will have to do when you are doing this process is that once you do the power rule on the outside, you will have to look at the inside and then ask yourself, what's the derivative of the inside function? The derivative of 3x plus 1 is just a 3, right? So you will have to use the power rule inside again. So you have to multiply by 3. Again, this part is the so-called the chain rule part. And for more practice with derivative, you know where to go. 100 derivatives. So multiply by 3, multiply by 3, and we get that. All right, so that's that. Yay. Done with the page 5. Now, you think we're done with derivative? No. We can never run away from derivative. We have the Lapidus rule. And let's see. I'm going to give you guys a quick, quick, quick explanation on what the Lapidus rule is, and then 
if you haven't uh, studied derivative yet, then a lot of this wouldn't make sense. Like, what's the derivative of natural log of x? What's the derivative of tangent x? Or things like that. So be sure you watch my other video to, for the um, derivatives. All right. Maybe uh, if you're just taking Cal 1, maybe like the first three weeks or so, this is like a good place for you to uh, maybe just stop and then later on uh, you come back starting at 56. So usually the question 1 to question 55 is like the first months or so in your Cal 1 class, like first three, four weeks. <sighs> okay, I talk too much. No, 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 I did 55 already. No. Ladies and gentlemen, let's have a look. This time, we want the limit, and we just want the limit as x approaching 2. And we have x squared over, so x minus, x squared minus 4 over ln x minus ln 2. How do we do this? Factor it? Sure, we can factor the top easily, but how can we factor the bottom? Ln x minus ln 2. Is this just the same as ln and then x minus 2? No, no, don't do that. It's not ln times, don't, no. This is not even funny, no, don't do that. So here is the time that I'll show you guys the so-called L'Hopital's rule. Keep in mind, the L'Hopital's rule says, so just abbreviate it, L'Hopital's rule. This right here, it's only good when we have 0 over 0 or infinity over infinity. And all you have to do is the following. Check first, we do have 0 over 0, so you get to use L'Hopital's rule. And then you just go ahead and do the derivative on the top. And then you do the derivative on the bottom. And that's the process. If it works, you have the answer, everybody happy. If it doesn't work, too bad. We just have to think about the different way to do it. Anyway, let's see. This is the limit as x approaching 2. Let me just get the answer for you guys first, and I'll explain why this is the case. Differentiating x squared minus 4, we get 2x. And then take the derivative of ln x, we get 1 over x. Okay, so again, it's just the derivative of the top. And then you do the derivative of the bottom. And the derivative of ln x is 1 over x. This is the number, that's why it's 0, so just that. Okay. So seriously, you will have to know your derivative really well in order to use L'Hopital's rule. Okay, now we can put the 2 into the axis if you would like, or you can multiply the x and x, just simplify first. So this is the same as limit x approaching 2 and just 2x squared. Yeah, and then just work that out, right? So it's 2 times 2 squared, 4 times 2, which is 8. Yeah, why did I circle it? I usually box it. Sorry. All right, cool. Done. Now, here is the reason why this works. First, I want to tell you guys that a lot of mathematicians, they do not like the L'Hopital's rule. Sometimes I hate it too, because it caused the circular reasoning. I'll explain that in the next category. But let's, let's see. To explain why this works, it's just that you will have to do this the long way, and then I'll just tell you. If we look at the limit, let me just rewrite this again. So let me just rewrite this right here. If we have the limit as x approaching 2, and then on the top, we have x squared minus 4, yeah? And on the bottom, we have ln x minus ln 2, right? Looks good. Not really, because it's 0 over 0. But let's do the following. I'm going to divide the top by x minus 2. Likewise, we'll do the same on the bottom as well. And then, I'm going to write this as 
do the limit on the top and then divide the limit on the bottom. And we can do so because the limit of a quotient is a quotient of the limit assuming they both exist. So this is the same as saying the limit as x approaching 2 x squared minus 4 over x minus 2 and then over limit x approaching 2 and then that. So again, the limit of a quotient is a quotient of a limit provided they both exist, they do so. That's why we can do this. Now, if you look here at the top right here, what does this represent? I know we can solve this by using the algebraic limits. But if you remember the definition of derivative and you know it, I'm going to bring this up right here, this thing. Doesn't this remind you of a derivative? It does, huh? Yes. And I would like to tell you, you see how we have x is approaching 2. So I will tell you this right here represents, I'll just spell it out for you guys, represents f prime of 2 because x is approaching 2. So it's the derivative of some function when x is 2. But what's the function though? Where the function, I'll just write it as f of x, it's just that. It's just x squared. Right? Yes. Similarly, we can also talk about the bottom right here. This right here represents, again, f prime of 2 as well. But I used f right here already, so just to reduce confusion, I'm going to use another letter, let's say g, just another function, right? Because we're working on the same question. So let's use g. It's the derivative of some function g at 2. And then what the function is, is just L and x. So where g of x equals L and x. So in fact, the type is a derivative question. Likewise, the bottom is also a derivative question. And you see, this right here is really just f prime of 2 over g prime of 2. So it's just a derivative of the top. Divided by the derivative of the bottom, assuming that we get a nice answer for this. Right, it does, so yeah. So what's f prime of 2 though? Well, if you look at this carefully, you see that we know f of x is x squared. So this means f prime of x is just 2x. So this means f prime of 2 is just 2 times 2, which is 4. So on the top here, we'd actually just get a 4. On the top here, we just get a 4. And on the bottom, as we saw earlier, this thing right here represents g prime of 2. And yes, I'm changing the color to make it prettier for you guys. And now you see, this is g of x is l and x. So we have to know what the derivative. g prime of x is just 1 over x. Uh -huh, that's exactly what we did. Right? And then we plug in 2. So it's just 1 over 2. So the bottom here is 1 half. Simplify the fraction, multiply 2 and 2. So ladies and gentlemen, we end up with 8. Yeah. So this is the idea behind the, the so-called Lapidus rule. And again, it use, it's used for when we have 0 over 0 and also infinity. We can only use Lapidus rule when we have 0 over 0 or infinity over infinity. However, there might be some cases that Lapidus rule does not help us uh, get the answer. In that case, you just have to try other things. But if you don't have this in the form, then you cannot use Lapidus rule. And the reason why that a lot of mathematicians don't like the Lapidus rule because it causes circular reasoning is because, you see, how when we are doing limits, we are using derivative. But when we are trying to get the derivative, we will have to use limit. See, earlier when I show you guys this, I can actually tell you, hey, let's just do the derivative. No, we have to do it algebraically first. Yeah, so, yeah, be, be, be really careful. I will tell you though, the best time for us to use Lapidus rule is infinity over infinity, but then still, a lot of people will still not 
liked it too much, but it's convenient, I would say. Yeah, that's the you know, explanation because I want to move on. And usually I would just say, I want to go home, but I'm home already. So it's not like when I was doing that 100 integral or 100 derivative questions. <laughs> Number 56. No, number 57. Limit. Give you guys a tough one. Huh? X approaching 0. And then we have 1 over X. Minus 1 over inverse tangent of X. Okay. Just trust me for this one. Technically, we do the 0 plus or 0 minus. But if we have... 0 plus, we get infinity minus infinity. If we have a minus here, we still get infinity minus infinity, so indeterminate point either way. In order for us to use Laplace's rule, you see that we have to have 0 over 0 or infinity over infinity, namely a fraction. Here we have two fractions. Not a good idea. Therefore, let's just combine them, and to do so, I'm just going to write this as the limit as x approaching 0. Right, we need this and that together, right? So it's x times inverse tangent of x. And then pretty much multiply inverse tangent of x here. So we need the inverse tangent of x here and then minus just x there. Much better. And you can check if we have 0 into all the x's, we get 0 over 0. And because of that, let me just indicate that we have 0 over 0. We are using the L'Hopital's rule. I'm just going to put ddx and ddx just to show you guys that we are using a so-called L'Hopital's rule. I forgot to put this earlier, so just go ahead and do it on your own. Just go back to your notes and do it. As I told you, you have to know your derivatives really well. What's the derivative inverse tangent of x? Do I need to go to the board? Sure, but I don't need to. Because I know the derivative that is 1 over 1 plus x squared. Okay? Derivative of 1 that's the answer. The derivative of this is 1, so it's minus 1. This right here, we need a so-called product rule. We are going to keep the first function, which is x, and then times the derivative of the second, so that is 1 over 1 plus x squared, and then we add the second function, which is inverse tangent of x, times the derivative of the first, so it's 1. So these are the things that you would need to be able to do for your derivatives. Before we proceed, let's fix the complex fraction situation, and that is to multiply the top and bottom by 1 plus x squared, and likewise here. So let's see. We will have limit as x approaching 0. This times that is just 1. This times that, let's distribute the negative. So we will have negative 1, and then minus x squared. That's cool. We have the 1 minus 1. So far, so good. I don't know. Anyway, take this times that. The 1 plus x cancel, so we just have x. This times that. Okay. Plus. Let's, let's distribute. So this times that is inverse tangent of x. And then this times that. So it's plus x squared inverse tangent of x. I told you this is a hard one. But anyway, 1 minus 1 is 0. Plugging 0 into all the x's, I tell you, is 0 over 0. So yes, do Lapitos rule again. Try it. It is making us progress. Oh, yeah. So here we go. Lapitos rule on the top. Yeah. Differentiating on the top and then take the derivative on the top, on the bottom. Limit as x approaching 0. The derivative of this guy is negative 2x. The derivative of x is 1. The derivative of this is 1 over 1 plus x squared. The derivative of this, product rule again. The first function is x squared times the derivative of the second, which is 1 over 1 plus x squared. And then we add the second function, which is inverse tangent of x, times the derivative of the first, which is 2x. <laughs> 
I know. Sometimes you want to do the derivatives. Lapidus rule it might make you cry, make make you want to cry, right? So yeah. If Ripple can sponsor me one day, well, I'll be really happy. <coughs> well, any kind of any like a uh, beverage. It doesn't have to be energy drink. Anyway, what do we do next, man? Okay, let's see. <sighs> this right here shouldn't be too hard because I did it before. Let's multiply the top and bottom by one plus x squared again. Okay, so how am I going to? This doesn't make sense. Does it make sense? <laughs> okay, let's see. Here we have the limit is no x no h x approaching zero. Perhaps. Let's multiply the bottom here and then see what happens. Right? So before we go there, let's see. This times that, we get one plus x squared. This times that, we just get plus one. This times that, they cancel, so we just get plus x squared here, right? And this times that, oh my god. Oh, I don't think we end up with, I don't think we end up with zero of zero anymore. Check this out. Here, this times this is just, I'm just going to keep it. 1 plus x squared, and then let's put a 2x here at the front first. 2x, and then 1 plus x squared, at the inverse tangent of x. All right, so just multiply out. The reason that I say it's not 0 for 0 is because when x is approaching 0, this is 0, this is 0, this is 0, but we have 1 plus 1, which is 2 on the bottom but this is upsetting because when we put zero on the top <laughs> we get zero so on all we just get zero right zero over two what does that mean the answer is just equal to zero <laughs> yes Need to double check. <sighs> yeah, nothing wrong. For sure, it has to be right. Zero, why not, huh? Yeah, you guys can pause the video and just verify this with me. Verify this for me and then just do it on your own. Why not? It should be zero, right? Alright, so 57, check. Good. 4 hours and 12 minutes. So far, so good. But the 57 is number is 0. Whew. My hand. I guess that's pretty dirty. Anyway. <coughs> All right, moving on to a slightly more gentle question. Limit as x approaching zero plus, and then we have x times l and x. Right? Oh, okay. I can talk about another indeterminate form. Check this out. When we put zero in, into here, we get zero, and then when we put zero plus into l and x, we get negative infinity. Right? So, yeah, it's like this. So we have a zero times infinity right here. The negative doesn't matter. We care about this times that that indeterminate form. And that's no goal. You cannot draw any conclusion yet. We want to use the Pitos rule. How? Check this out. Pick one of the functions. It will be easier if you pick x. Just trust me on this. And then you want to bring this down, down. I'll show you. This right here is the same as the limit as x approaching 0 plus, keep the l and x on the top, but then change the x to 1 over x on the, new, on the denominator. Because now you can see if you multiply the top and bottom by x, then you get the original back. Cool, huh? 
Now, if you put zero or zero plus in here and here, you get infinity over infinity. So we are able, we can actually allow, we are allowed to use Lapitos rule now. So I will put this down ddx, uh, ddx. All right, so here we have the limit as x approaching zero plus. The derivative of this is one over x. The derivative of this, write it as x to the negative one power, bring the negative one to the front, minus one. So it's negative x to the negative two power, which is just negative one over x squared. Before we plug in zero, let's just simplify it. Multiply the top and bottom by x squared. And then we will see, this is the limit as x approaching zero plus, we have a negative, they cancel, and then they reduce to just x. Put zero in here, we get zero. Yes, oh my goodness, another zero. Not so satisfying, but that's just how it is. Okay. Please do not say zero times infinity or zero times negative infinity is equal to zero all the time. Sometimes it is, but not all the time. Okay, let's try another one. Number 59, <sighs> limit as x approaching, another zero plus, one over x plus ln x. Now, here's the deal. If you put zero plus in here and here, you get infinity and then minus infinity. So this is the infinity minus infinity situation. Again, let's just combine the fractions and let's see how this goes. Huh? So this right here equals the limit as x approaching zero plus. Multiply x and x, right? So we just have x here and then we have one plus and we get x times L and x. But check this out. If we put zero plus into all the x's, what do we get? Should we just do L'Hopital's rule right now? Can we just do L'Hopital's rule and say, no, do not do L'Hopital's rule right now. Why? Because if you put zero plus in here, on the bottom, we get zero. On the top, hey, what's x times ln x? We did it earlier, and then it's the same thing. But we have a 1. So in fact, we end up with 1 over 0. This is 1 over 0. So what do we do next? Well, you don't have to worry about doing L'Hopital's rule in this case. We, we kind of did though for this part right here. But the truth is, the truth is we can actually kind of argue what the answer should be already. So I will just have to say this part, the limit as x approaching zero plus x ln x, this right here is equal to zero. We did that for 58, so I can say that, we can use it. And then you can see, this is just going to be one plus, this is zero, right? Because what we did earlier, and then we have x is approaching zero plus. So the bottom here is zero plus. And you might be wondering, like, is this 0 plus or 0 minus? Doesn't matter because we're adding 1. So the top is for sure positive. For sure it's a positive a non zero number and divided by 0 plus. So the answer for this is what? Positive infinity. That's it. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. If you don't think this is like 100% legit, then you can also do it this way. You can factor out the one over x. This right here is the limit as x approaching zero plus, and then factor out the one over x, and then you will get one plus. If you factor out one over x, it's like x times L and x, right? And um, it's pretty much like this, but like another look. And you will see if you put zero plus in here, this part is positive infinity, but this is zero. It's just like one plus zero. So infinity times one is infinity. 
Yeah, so another way to look at it. But thanks to this part, imagine if this right here turns out to be negative 1, then this question will be harder, but it's not. And you see, infinity minus infinity gives us infinity. Yeah. You never know what you are going to get. Yeah. Three limits is just like a box of chocolate. Yeah. <sighs> Number sixty. I want to say 67, but I no, not yet. Limit as x approaching 0 plus. Yeah, of course. <sighs> Who came up with all this question? All right. If we put 0 plus into here and here, check this out. We will end up with uh, 0 times 1 over 0 plus is infinity, e to the infinity is infinity, so this is 0 times infinity situation. So we are going to do what we did earlier. Here's the x, bring that down, down. This right here is the limit as x approaching 0 plus, e to the 1 over x states on the top, but then we write this as 1 over x on the denominator, and we will use the Laplace rule because now we have infinity over infinity so it's Laplace rule ready and then we can just say ddx ddx cool now we have the limit as x approaching 0 plus what's the derivative e to the something the answer is you first repeat that e to the 1 over x and then you multiply by the derivative of the inside because of the chain rule. And the derivative of that is negative 1 over x squared. The bottom, when we differentiate that, we also get negative 1 over x squared. Let's cancel each other out completely. Oh my god. Check this out. When we put 0 plus into here now, we get what? We get this. This is now e to the 1 over 0 plus, which is e to the infinity which is infinity. Told you, 0 times infinity is not always equal to 0. Sometimes infinity can win too. Okay, infinity. Alright, number 61. Limit as x approaching infinity x times 2 to the 1 over x minus 1 all right, similar flavor. This time now, if we put infinity to here, we get infinity times one over infinity is zero. Two to the zero is one. One minus one is zero. So infinity times zero. So do the same thing. Put this x down, down. So we're looking at this as limit as x approaching infinity. Here we get two to the one over x minus one over one over x. And you know it, we can use Laplace rule because this time we get 0 over 0. We can use Laplace rule. So, ladies and gentlemen, ddx here, ddx just means that we are going to take the derivative. So, here we have the limit as x approaching infinity. The bottom here we get negative 1 over x squared. How about the top? What's the derivative of 2 to the some power? Let me tell you, it first repeats the 2 to the 1 over x. But because the base right here is a 2, it's not e, so we will multiply by ln of the base, which is 2. And then we multiply by the derivative of that because of the chain rule, which is negative 1 over x squared. The derivative of minus 1 is 0, so no more. And then we see that this and that cancel. and when we put infinity to here, 1 over infinity is 0, 2 to 0 is 1, so only, oh, wow, 0 times infinity gives us ln2. Told you, 0 times infinity, you can get a lot of different things, indeterminate forms.
Crazy, huh? Number 62. Limit as x approaching infinity. And then we have log base 2 of x plus 2 over log base 3 of x plus 1. Wow. Okay, we get infinity over infinity. So let's just get that out of the way. And let's just go ahead and use L'Hopital's rule because this is an infinity over infinity situation. So everybody's favorite, d dx, d dx. Here is the limit as x approaching infinity. So how do we differentiate this though? We will tell you. When we have ln, so when we have log of 2, right, log base 2, you just put this on the bottom first. So you have 1 over x plus 2. But you also multiply by ln of that base. So you multiply by ln 2. Okay? And then you check the derivative of the inside. But the derivative of x plus 2 is just 1. So if you forget the chain rule, you know, you're lucky. Just because multiply by 1 doesn't matter. Alright, let's practice this again. Derivative of a log base 3 of x plus 1, we put this on the bottom first, so it's 1 over x plus 1, times ln3. Okay, and then multiply by the derivative of this, which is also 1. Cool. Now, we want the x to be going to infinity, but let's just put this on the top. So on all, we are looking at the limit as x approaching infinity and then we have x plus 1 times let's distribute it you will see why and let's see how do we write it let's do this x times ln3 plus ln3 okay, distribute and ln3 is the constant it's the coefficient is the coefficient of x and then this right here same thing x ln2 plus 2 ln2 but guess what? This is everybody's favorite derivative. This is everybody's favorite limit equation, calculus equation. Because x is approaching infinity. Just care about the x to the first power, the dominating x, right? Yeah. Yeah. They have the same degree, same power, so they cancel, and then it's just ln3 over ln2, isn't it? Good. And now, icing on the cake. We can use the change of base formula and write this as log base 2 of 3. Aha! Oh my goodness. Log base 2 of 3. Not kidding. This right here is the answer for that. So, you see, infinity over infinity, we get like a irrational number. Yeah. Okay. Number 63. One of the classic calculus question limit as x approaching 0 plus x to the x power. Check this out. If we put 0 into here and here, we are getting 0 to the 0's power. Let me tell you, if you are just talking about computation, 0 to the 0... Okay, I, I'm just going to do this like more legitimately. I'll say for limits. And again, for limit means that the limit for meaning I just put this number into here and here and just get the form of it. Technically, it's a 0 plus to the 0 plus, right? But usually, we just write 0 to the 0. But again, it's really 0 plus to the 0 plus, right? Like that, okay? But anyway, when we have this limit form, this right here is in the... in the... Terminate. Okay? Why? Inside one here. It's right here. Okay? But anyway, if today we're just doing computation, 
And by computations, I mean that you know when you have two to the third power, what do we do? You just do two times two times two, three times. That, that, that's computation. But anyway, when we are just talking about computation, like no calculus with no limits involved, zero to the zero, this right here is the most debatable number or anything. I don't know. A lot of people will say this right here is undefined. I used to say that. And uh, a lot of people will also say this right here should be equal to 1. I would like to tell you for computation, this right here, I think the best answer that I can tell you is that this right here has no agreement. I think this is the best answer that I can say. And I, know. I think people will agree that there's no agreement on this. If you really want to say this is 1, then you can make a Facebook post for like a YouTube video or like a, a Twitter and then you can see how many people will like debate and all that. If you say this is undefined, you know, same thing will happen. But if you say this right here has no agreement, hopefully you guys leave me alone. <laughs> but anyway, this right here is zero over this, this, this right here is zero to the zero, but we're doing limits. So it's indeterminate, meaning we have to do more work. This is how. We don't like base x. We like to have base e. This is the fast way to do it. Change the base to e. And we can achieve that by doing this. Write x as e to the ln x power, because e and ln cancel, we still get the x back. And then, you see, we will have to raise this to the x power, right? So perhaps, because this is the first time we're doing it, so I will show you guys a step by step like this. I'm not going to skip anything, right? So this is x raised to the x power, okay? And then you might be wondering, you know, the parentheses wise, and just, just don't worry too much about it. Yeah, I think this might be bad, okay? Anyway, now I'm just going to write this as the limit as x approaching zero plus. We can multiply the powers, and then we get e to the x times ln x power. Does this look familiar? Yes, it does. Number 58. Yes. But the way that you should take care of this is the following. This is e, and then you do the limit of that, which is the limit as x approaching 0 plus, and then just focus on x, ln x. But uh, I should say, uh, use equation 58 all right so in fact we get e and earlier we saw that this is equal to zero so on all we get one done and of course if you are doing this on the test do not just say look at 50 look at question 58 nobody will know what you're talking about just redo everything from question 58 on your test so that people will be happy okay if my student, if you go from here to here and say, use question 58, I will give you full credit. No, I will not give you full credit. <laughs> Maybe I should, because I know that way you are watching my video. I don't know. But the deal is that I will not ask you guys that question. It's too easy. Ask something more difficult. All right, number 64, wow, that's eight square. So limit is x approaching zero plus, and here we have x to the one over one plus ln x power. And check this out. When we have zero plus here, put it here, base is zero, and let's do this in our head. Zero plus into ln. ln zero plus is negative infinity. And then you have the one, right? One plus, zero, one plus negative infinity is just negative infinity, yeah? And then it's one over, one over infinity is zero. So this is actually a zero over, this is actually a zero to the zero indeterminate form. 
Let's see if the answer is 1 or not. Do the same thing that we did earlier. We write the x as e to the ln x. So this right here is the limit as x approaching 0 plus e to the ln x power and then raised to the 1 over 1 plus ln x power. Now multiply the powers. So we are getting limit as x approaching 0 plus and then we have uh, just do it like this e and then ln x over 1 plus ln x power. Now just focus on doing the limits right here. So this right here is equal to e and then let's just focus on the limit as x approaching 0 plus ln x over 1 plus ln x. But if you put 0 plus into here and here, we can negative infinity over infinity. We can negative infinity over negative infinity. So we can use L'Hopital's rule. Well, in fact, you can just get rid of the 1 because the 1 doesn't matter when we have infinity. But perhaps this is slightly more legitimate. Anyway, though, this right here, we get e for the base. And then, again, the blue part is negative infinity over infinity. So L'Hopital's rule. All right, let's do this in black. So this right here is the limit as x approaching 0 plus. The top is 1 over x. The bottom is also 1 over x. The 1 doesn't matter. They cancel, just 1. So on all, the answer is e to the 1, which is just e. 0 to the 0's power, we end up with e. This is the limit. Right? So limit in determinant form, we can get some other numbers besides 1. It's not like this, no agreement. This question, everybody will agree that the answer is E, 2.718-ish. Right? So there would be no argument for this one right here. Everybody will be happy. If you go to people's birthday party, do not show them 0 to the 0's power. Show them this limit and you will be invited. That's the idea. Number 65. The limit has x approaching 0. Finally, it's just 0. Anyway, x e to the x over e to the x, and then minus 1. So we plug in 0? Well, no. That will give us 0 over 0. No good. What do we do, though? Hey, hey. Lapitos rule right now. You could, but let's make it slightly easier. Let's divide the top and bottom by e to the x because they all have e to the x. Huh? So I'm just going to divide this by e to the x. Likewise, divide this by e to the x. And you'll see. We get limit as x approaching 0. They cancel. Reduce is 1. 1 over e to the x. That's ready as e to the negative x. Do we really need to use L'Hopital's rule? No. Because now we can see this is just 0 over... No, 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 we still have to use L'Hopital's rule. <laughs> we still end up with 0 over 0 right here. So yeah, we still need to use L'Hopital's rule. So here we go. DDX, DDX. The L'Hopital's rule is much easier this way though. 0 over 0, L'Hopital's rule. So limit as x approaching 0. The derivative of x is 1. The derivative of 1 is 0. The derivative of negative e to the negative x is negative e to the negative x, but we will use the chain rule multiplied by this derivative, which is negative 1. So it's actually positive e to the negative x. But then if you put 0 into here, we will get 1 over e to the negative 0, just 0. It's final answer. It's 1. Yeah, 0 over 0, yes, it can also be 1. Right? It can also be 1. So hopefully, you guys are getting like all the things that you have to worry about, and then you can see that all the things that you have to be careful, and all the techniques. And these are not the hardest part yet. Okay.
number 66. Limit sx approaching zero. Sine of 2x and then e to the x minus cosine of x. All right. So just do a quick check, zero over zero. So go ahead, do Laputa's rule. So d, dx, d, dx. All right, here we have the limit as x approaching zero. The derivative of sine is cosine. We did that today, cool. And then multiply by the derivative of 2x, which is just a 2. So let's put that at the front. The derivative of e to the x is e to the x. The derivative of negative cosine is negative sine. So negative times negative becomes positive, and then we have the sine x. Cool. Now, put 0 into all the x's, then we get, to try it, cosine of 0 is 1, so on the top we have 2. Put the 0 in here, e to the 0 is 1, sine of 0 is 1, and sine of 0 is 0. So just 2 over 1, which is 2. Done. So you can verify that on your own. 67, we have the limit as x approaching pi over 2. And then we have secant x minus tangent x. Wow. I will tell you, it's a infinity minus infinity case depending if you are talking about the plus or minus, but no, let's combine the fraction. Wait, where are the fractions? This right here, it's the same as one over cosine x. This right here, it's the same as sine x over cosine x, isn't it? So all in all, this is just the limit as x approaching pi over two, and then we have cosine x on the bottom, and then 1 minus sine x on the top. Yeah. And in fact, yes, we get 0 over 0, but do we really need to use L'Hopital's rule for this? We don't, because earlier today we did something similar to this. Question number 30. Right. Similar to question 30. You guys can uh, look back. That's like, I don't know how many hours ago. But we can multiply the top and bottom by 1 plus sine x. You can do it that way. But since this is a L'Hopital's rule category, so let's just use L'Hopital's rule. Just want to mention that we do not have to use L'Hopital's rule if you don't want to. But anyway, this is a 0 over 0 case. We're using L'Hopital's rule. So this is the limit as x approaching pi over 2. The root of the 1 is 0, the root of the negative sine is negative cosine. The root of the of cosine x is negative sine. So cancel. Pi over 2, plug into cosine is 0. Sine of pi over 2 is 1. 0 over 1 is 0. Very cool. All right. Oh, this is what I like. I can do like, multiple questions on the same board, so I don't have to erase, erase, erase. <sighs> okay, number 68. Another big one. Oh, finally, x is approaching 1. Some, well, that was an interesting number too, but anyway. x over x minus 1, and then minus 1 over ln x. You know it, combine the fractions before we continue. So number 68, here we go. Take the limit as x approaching 1. This and that on the bottom, I will put it as x minus 1 parentheses times ln x. On the top though, I will do this times that, right? So it's x times ln x and then minus this and that, which is just, so I'm going to distribute it. So it's minus, right? Minus x. Minus minus become plus and then one. All right, and then verify it, you get zero over zero. So again, let's just do L'Hopital's rule. 
Wow, D, E, X. Okay, here is the limit as X approaching one. Okay, product rule here. We need to keep the first function, which is X, times the derivative of the second, and the derivative of ln X is one over X. And then we add the second function, which is ln X, times the derivative of the first, which is one. Continue. The derivative of minus x is just minus 1. The derivative of 1 is 0. Done. Continue right here. Um, should we distribute it? Nah, let's, let's just do it like this. Keep, the, keep this as the first function, and this as the second function. So I'm going to keep it as x minus 1 times the derivative of that plus the ln x times the derivative of that. Okay, oh my god, check this out. x over x is 1. 1 minus 1 is 0, so in fact this and that cancel out completely perfect. Here though, we can distribute it, we get 1 minus 1 over x. That's still going to give us 0 over 0, oh my goodness. right? So perhaps I'm not going to distribute it because it doesn't do us any good if I distribute it. I'm just going to multiply the top and bottom by x so that we can get rid of that little x for the complex fraction case. So here we have the limit as x approaching 1. This times that is just x times L and x. Then this times that they cancel which is just x minus 1 and then this times that which is plus x L and x. Yes, it's 0 over 0, but we can use Lapidus rule again. Do this, do that. So, 0 over 0, LH. This is the limit as x approaching 1. Okay, Prada rule in action. Keep the first function, which is x, times the derivative of the second, plus the second function, which is L and x times the derivative of the first. Now, the derivative of x is 1. The derivative of 1 is 0, minus 1 is 0. Same thing here, Prada rule. Plus, first function times the derivative of the second, plus the second function times the derivative of the first. Oh my god, check this out. This is 1. This is 1. When x is approaching 1, this is 0, that's 0. On the top, we have 1. Wow. This is 1. 1 plus 1 is 2. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, for all the work, we just get 1 half. Yeah, all this work, we get 1 half. Wow. Number 68. Oh my god. My hands are so dirty. So look at this. Yeah? Cool. You see, I'm doing so many questions for you guys, right? Yeah, if you are taking Kelvin for the very first time, how many questions are you practicing? That's the key, right? If you want to really learn calculus, or depending on if you really want to learn the material, or if you just want to get over the calculus, practice. I'm doing this for you guys, with you guys, right? So maybe you are not like using, maybe you are not, even though you are not, <laughs> maybe you are just like, studying for your calculus or math test in general, you are not really needing like this material. Hopefully this can somehow motivate you in any way. Anyway, this question. Huh? Number 69, and we have the limit as x approaching 1 plus and then we have natural log I would like to tell you this is a very common test type of question okay ln on the top and then inside here I picked uh, x to the third power minus 1 on the bottom I have ln of x to the eighth power minus 1 very common very popular calc 1 or calc 2 test question. Okay, you will get 
negative infinity over infinity but like yeah it just tells you we can do L'Hopital's rule because we get ln of uh, 0 plus ln of 0 plus that's why anyway d dx d dx okay here we go limit x approaching 1 plus when we differentiate ln we just put that on the bottom so it's 1 over x to the third power minus 1 you don't have to multiply by ln of the base technically you do ln is log base e when you have ln e is just 1 so it doesn't really matter anyway multiply by the inside derivative so that's the chain rule so multiply by 3x squared do the same thing on the bottom we get 1 over x to the 8th power minus 1 and then multiply the derivative on the bottom which is 8x to the 7th power wow okay so what I will do next is I'm just going to kind of um, well let's reduce this a little bit yeah this and that will cancel will become the fifth power only cool and then we are going to get the limit as x approaching 1 plus and uh, to make things more clear I think I'm just going to do this let's see So this this is out, right? This is out. Yes, this is also x to the five. Okay. So I have a three on the top, yeah. I have a three on the top, and then I'm going to bring this up. So it's three times x to the eight minus one, because this right here goes to the top. So it's x to the eight minus one over. This is on the bottom, right? x to the third power minus 1. And this is also on the bottom. So I will multiply this with 8x to the fifth power. OK. So kind of verify this on your own, just to multiply. This, bring that to the top. And then 3 with that. And then 8x to the fifth is still on the bottom, along with that for the denominator. Cool x is approaching 1 so what we can do next is just multiply out and then you can do L'Hopital's rule again let's just L'Hopital's rule again because why not but let's multiply this out first this is the limit as x approaching 1 plus we get 3x to the 8 minus 3 and then 8x to the you add the exponent which is 8 minus 5 minus 8x to the 5th okay and then this time we get 0 over 0 yeah so L'Hopital's rule here right well ddx here right ddx here we're using L'Hopital's rule for all of this so limit as x approaching 1 plus the derivative of the 24 x to the 7 yeah 0 bring the 8 to the front is 64 x to the 7 minus bring the 5 to the front is 40 and x to the 4 cool now we are just going to be plugging 1 to all the x and then you don't have to reduce for one not because it doesn't really matter that much but if you look at the bottom when x is equal to 1 on the bottom here it's just equal to 24 right yeah so it's like this you get 24 over 64 minus 40 so on all we get 24 for 24 <sighs> why am I doing this to myself that the answer is just equal to 1 yeah the answer to this right here is equal to 1 okay I have a question for you guys just to make sure that you guys are actually uh, paying attention so go ahead and leave a question right here right uh, leave the timestamp and then leave the answer I want you guys to try this I want to keep the function the same but instead of x approaching 1 plus go ahead and figure out what if we have the limit as x approaching infinity and then we have ln of x to the third power minus 1 ln of x to the eighth power minus 1 
Okay? You just do it. The work is almost identical, but you have to be really careful of one little place and then you should be able to figure this out. I am going to squeeze in number 70 here because I want to, I really want to. Limit x approaching infinity. We have ln x. This is ln x and then square. So do not bring the 2 to the front as like the log power rule. Don't do that, all right? This is x. But anyway, though, we will use the power rule for derivative, but not the power rule for the logarithm. So pay attention to the following. Holy. Anyway, infinity into here, you get infinity over infinity. So Laputo's rule. Last question of Laputo's rule, man. Yay. Because it just has a lot of things to write. Anyway, bring this to the front and minus one. Here we are looking at limit as x approaching infinity. Two to the front, L and x, and then multiply the derivative inside, which is 1 over x. The derivative x is just 1. But the truth is, this right here requires Laputo's rule. Again, so this right here is the limit as x approaching infinity, 2x, or 2L and x, and over x, right? Put infinity, we get infinity over infinity. So Laputo's rule again. And please pay attention to this question because you will see that we have infinity over infinity, right? This is L and x compared with x. The two doesn't really matter. But let's just do Laputo's rule here. D dx, D dx. Here, we get the limit as x approaching infinity. On the bottom, we get one. On the top, we get two times the derivative of that, which is 1 over x. When we put infinity to here, we get 2 over infinity, just 0. So what does this mean? If you look at this, the limit of the ratio of 2 L and x over x is 0. This means L and x is actually so, so, so small, even though it goes to infinity as well, but this infinity is nothing compared to when x is going to infinity, that kind of thing. In fact, you can have your own x to whatever power that you want. That will not be bigger than x to some power, yeah, like a power function. So keep that in mind, because with that being said, we are going to get into the secret weapon. If you know the secret weapon, we will be able to finish a lot of the questions in no time. And congratulations to myself, I finished page six. Five hours. Oh my god. Well, I feel like drinking some soda. So just give me 20 seconds or so. this haha
Oh, it says real, but not Instagram real. Anyway, I should have bought some Gatorade. I forgot. It's hot. <laughs> yeah, that's why I have to drink something. But anyway, though, 30 more questions. Secret weapon number one. I call this the list. What's the list? Well, this is to compare the kind of infinity. I'm using n right here because this way I can also bring the factorial with us and then um, it doesn't really matter of course you can use t you can use x doesn't matter here we go among all the functions that go to infinity <coughs> ln well any kind of log any kind of log functions it's the smallest so small that I'm going to put two less than symbols like this and then you will see why Next, we have n to the power, like a power function or power sequence. But anyway, though, continue. Next, we have b to the n. And next, here is the factorial. And then next, the biggest one, n to the n. Power tower. However, in order for this to go to infinity, well, you see n goes to infinity, right? And we talked about this earlier, like two, three hours ago. The power right here has to be positive. So let me just indicate that p has to be greater than 0 here and then in order for exponential to go to infinity the base has to be greater than 1 so b has to be greater than 1 so this right here is the list if you know it you can solve a lot of limit questions in no time i tell my students that you can just tell me what the answers are if the limits fit into this situation how do we use it let me show you Number 71. I'm going to give you guys two questions. If today we have the limit as x approaching infinity, and then we have ln x over the cube root of x, okay? Well, ln x, it's a small kind of infinity. Yeah, and the reason I put on two less than symbol is that this is so small such that when you do the ratio if you have small over something that's bigger because right, this is the same as x to the one third power which belongs to here when you divide them and take the limit as x goes to infinity let me tell you the answer is just equal to zero yeah yes that's it that's it for my students you can say the list if you don't quote uh, and if you don't quote the uh, reason that's fine too but if you're not my student if you are taking your calculus to class then do not say this is equal to zero by the list your professor is not going to understand what you're talking about so yeah by the way this is just that you can keep in mind so it's a like magic when you see this kind of limit you can put on zero right away the proof for this is to use L'Hopital's rule which is very similar to number 70 that's why I told you guys to pay attention to the question earlier all right okay this is that, but what if? Now this is just first, first this is like versus. So I'm going to put it as 71 star to make it slightly more clear. But what if we have the question being the limit as x approaching infinity, we have the cube root of x on the top and then L and x on the bottom? Well you can read it backwards. This right here is so big compared to that, big enough so that when you divide them and then take the limit as x goes to infinity, you get infinity. Yeah, so when you're comparing this kind of functions for sequence, either you get zero or infinity when you're using the list. So cool. So we will have a lot of questions that we can actually just finish in no time. By the way, number 72. Number 72 tells you the the purpose of number 72 is to show you the uh, how to pick out the dominating part. But anyway, though, let's see. Number 72, we have the limit as x approaching infinity. And then we have x to the 6th power over x squared plus 4 to the x. All 
Okay, on the top we have x to the sixth power. Okay, on the bottom we have four to the x. So look at this. Don't look at that. Why? Because if you compare the bottom x squared versus four to the x, four to the x is bigger. It's dominating. It's the exponential part, right? A number to the exponent power, right? X will n, yeah. And now, if you compare this and that, 4 to the x is bigger, but it's on the bottom. So that means when we do the limit of this, we get 0. Done. 72, star. If I change this a little bit, if I change this to the limit as x approaching infinity, 6 to the x power, and then 2 to the x, and then x to the fourth power. What do you think what the answer is? Compare the bottom. 2 to the x versus x to the 4. This time, 2 to the x is bigger than that. It dominates. Right? Exponential part. It dominates the x to the p, right? So x to the fourth. And then if you compare this and that, well, the top is bigger than that. Even they are in the same category. So of course, you look at which bigger, which base is bigger. And you can actually just see this as 6 over 2 to the x power, and then it's just 3 to the x power. When x goes to infinity, it's infinity. But yeah, that's it. That's how you do it. Okay, number 73. Oh man, this is the last question. No, I have a couple more for the list. I have five questions for the list. I thought I like that. Limit as n goes to infinity, n factorial over n to the 20, 22. And this is the reason why I put n to be the list, right, for the list, because uh, that's how we can say n factorial for positive whole number factorial, or maybe zero factorial. You can do like fractional factorial, but that's a different story that will be later on, not now. Anyway, when n goes to infinity, uh, n factorial is so much bigger than n to the p's power, right? n to the power, so this is bigger than that. Therefore, the answer is what? Infinity. Done. You can give me 1,000 of these questions. I can finish it. I don't know. I don't want to do it, actually. You can give me 100 of this question. I can do it in like two hours or one hour, one hour maybe. But anyway, 10 seconds. I don't know. Okay, next, 74. If we have the limit as n goes to infinity, no, I use x. Now, most of the time we are talking about x. x is much better because we can do L'Hopital's rule with like ddx and all that stuff, but anyway. ln x minus square root of x. Wow. So this is slightly different than these because we have a subtraction here, but just think about the idea. If you have infinity, put it here and here, we get infinity minus infinity. But one infinity is actually much bigger than the other. Which one's bigger? This is bigger. Because square root of x is the same as x to the 1 half power, which is here. It's bigger than natural log. So if this is bigger, small minus big, we get negative infinity. Yeah, just like that. So quick, so fast, so good. All right, let's try another one. Oh man, this is the one I'm going to miss. Because after this, no more the list. e to the x minus x to the e. What's the answer? Exponential is much bigger than power. This is x to the power e, right? So this is infinity minus infinity. We get positive infinity. All right, so you can see with the list, we can finish a lot of these questions in no time. Next, I would like to tell you guys the fact again I gave 
this formula has these names. Why? Because it's much easier for us to refer them. Yeah, and then once you have a name with something that you tend to like it more, understand it more, and you want to keep it with you more. Anyway, the fact I'm just going to write it as the limit, and uh, I don't remember if I use x or t or whatnot, doesn't really matter. I'll just use x, x approaching infinity, equal 1 plus some number a over x raised to the b x power. This right here gives us e to the a b power. This is it. And this right here is actually nothing, nothing special. You actually have seen it before, you just never recognize it uh, from your pre-calculus class with like, the calculus questions that you have been doing. So here's the deal. We define e to be the limit as n, x, one not doesn't really matter, seriously. And you may use n. And this is just one of the definitions. So you can take this for the definition of the number e, which is about 2.7 each, all right? And if you guys recall your compound interest formula, so this is the compound interest formula, you have the amount, it's equal to the principal times 1 plus r, which is the interest rate, divided by however many times you compound a year, and then raised to the nt's power. t is the number of years. So this is the compound interest formula. I will have to say that compound n times in a year. Right? So that should be clear, and you guys should have seen this back in pre-calc. Well, if you just continue, if you, uh, let me give you an example. If you put money, let's say $1,000 into the bank, they will give you interest, right? Then the way that they do it, I believe most of them do it is, they will compound every day. So they will compute the interest that you earn every day, okay? But they will pay you every month. So the idea is that if you have $1,000 in there, if you have, I'm saying regular banking, if you want to withdraw it tomorrow, guess what? You will still have $1,000. If you withdraw in two days, you still have $1,000. Okay? That regular checking account or saving account. You have to wait until a month later and they will just kind of just keep track of all the interest that you have earned throughout the month and then you get paid per month. That's pretty much how it works. Anyway, imagine if you can get continuous compound. Well, in real life, that's not possible, but in math, the idea is just you take the limit as n goes to infinity. So you have the continuous compound formula, right? And continuous compound formula is like a continuous growth, and that's how you can get the exponential growth or decay, depends on how you look at it. But you will see this is the famous PERT formula, amount is equal to P-E-R-T, PERT formula. Where's the E? Well, E is precisely because we are talking about continuous, that means n goes to infinity. You pretty much compound infinitely many times in a year. And you see precisely is this, as n goes to infinity, this part gives you the E. So we have the E. And then you see it right here, as x goes to infinity, this and that is the exponent of e, just like the so the so-called continuous compound formula. R t is the power of e right here, and this is just like a coefficient. So you actually have seen this before, yeah. Anyway, remember this formula, then you can use it, and I'll show you guys how. Number seventy-six. Take a look at the limit as x approaching infinity and we have 1 plus 1 over 2x raised to the x power. Cool. All right. I tell my students, you do this. Identify the a and b and then pretty much use it. What's the a though? Pay attention right here is that a is actually 1 over 2. Right? It's 1 over 2. And then b is 1. 
So I would write it right here. A is 1 over 2 and B is equal to 1. So this right here is just e to the 1 over 2 times 1, which is just e to the 1 over 2 power, which is just the square root of e. All right? OK, so that's the answer for that. Nice and quick. Now, try another one. 77. Limit as x approaching infinity. And then we have 1, plus, 1 minus this to the x power. So what's the a value? Did I hear negative 1? Good. Yeah, it's negative 1. And then b is again 1. So here, a is negative 1 and b is 1. So it's e to the negative 1 times 1, which is negative 1. So this is just 1 over e, if you want to write it as a fraction. And if you want to write it as a rational form, 1 over e. OK, cool. All right, I'm going to give you guys a question to see because I'm really paying attention or not. Question for you guys, all right? So leave a timestamp and also tell me what the answer is. You see how here is just x to the first power. What if we have the limit as x approaching infinity, 1 minus 1 over x, and then raised to the x squared power? Go ahead, think about this, and then let me know what the answer is in the comment down below. All right? OK. All right, number 78. Limit as x approaching infinity. And then we have, oh, this is different. x over x plus 2 raised to the x power. OK, so how do we do this? Well, again, we are going to utilize the fact, and this is how. First, we see that. We have two terms on the bottom, we don't like that because we cannot split the fraction easily this way, right? So why don't we kind of just flip it? Can we do that? Yes, we just have to negate the power. So let's go ahead and write this as the limit as x approaching infinity. And then for the inside, I'm going to put it as x plus 2 over x and then raised to the negative x power. Aha. And now we can split the fractions. So we are looking at the limit as x approaching infinity. And then this is 1 plus this is 2 of x. And then minus x. So a is equal to 2. b is equal to negative 1. Altogether, it's e to the this times that, which is negative 2. And if you would like, you can write it as 1 over e squared. And then we are done. Cool, huh? All right. So this is the fact for that. And now I will show you guys the limit, which is the one that caused a lot of argument too for limits. Lapidus rule or not Lapidus rule or not. All right, so this right here, I call this the limit. So you see, a lot of time, we have 101, well, 100 something limits already. And uh, <clears throat> why is this one the one I call the limit, right? Yeah. Anyway, I'm going to use theta for it. This is the limit as theta approaching 0. And we are going to get sine of theta over theta. And this is equal to 1. This is the limit. Why? Because earlier we talked about the Laplace rule, and you see that if theta is equal to zero, then we get zero for zero, right? So it looks like, hey, to do this is super easy because when we have the limit as theta approaching zero, 
we can just go ahead and do L'Hopital's rule. Like go ahead and differentiate this with respect to theta and then do the same thing as well. Wow, and you see, the derivative of this, well, what's that? What's the derivative of sine theta? Yes, you can tell me cosine, but how did we do it? Well, if you recall the way that we did the derivative of uh, sine theta, sine of x, uh, you will recognize that when we are doing the derivative of sine x, all right? You use a, we, we use the definition of derivative the limit as x approach, h approaching zero, all the stuff, all the stuff, right? And then somewhere we have what? The limit as h approaching zero sine of h over h. And here we are using the h for the variable. You cannot just change a variable and then all of a sudden you know how to take the derivative. No. You see, in order for us to use, in order for us to get the derivative of sine x, we will have to find the, uh, we will have to find the, we will have to find this limit first. <laughs> but how can we use the how can we use the derivative right now? If I'm trying to use, if I were trying to find this limit, how can we find it? How can we use the derivative? We cannot. So this is called circular reasoning. Yeah. So a couple ways to fix this. One, you can use numerical method, meaning I just use a. The table of values plug in you can see the answer you know is equal to one or you can do a geometric proof which i didn't do yeah but i give you guys a graphical proof i graph sine x over x and we saw that the limit of this is equal to one but here i have something better whenever you encounter this kind of limits just say by the limit and then um, the answer is one and we are done here, number 79. Let me show you how we can work this out. <clears throat> Limit as x approaching 0. And then we have sine of 3x over x. OK. Here, the input is 3x. What we can do is just do a nice substitution. Call theta to be 3x. And you see, when x is approaching 0, you can put it here, theta is approaching 0 as well. Good. And perhaps we can also solve for x. We can divide the 3 on both sides. This means x is equal to theta over 3. So you can see this is going to be the limit. x approaching 0 implies theta will go to 0. And then here we have sine. And then this right here is theta inside now. And then the x is theta over 3. But you know, the over 3 in the denominator, we can put it up right here. So all in all, we can say this right here is 3 times the limit as theta going to 0. And then here we just have sine theta over theta. And ladies and gentlemen, this is just equal to 1. Why? Think for the we have this secret weapon to use. So it's just one. So we have three times one, and the answer to that is just three, and then we are done. Yeah. Much better. Please do not use L'Hopital's rule for this one. Seriously. Just use the limit. Alright? Much better this way. Much better this way. All right, uh, let me put it down right here. Okay, another one. Limit as x approaching infinity. And here we have x times sine of 2 over x. Wow, this is infinity situation. Same thing, we can do it, don't worry. Let's call theta to be the input, which is 2 over x. Perhaps that's solve for x, yeah? So multiply x on both sides, divide theta on both sides. This means x is equal to 2 over theta. Check this out. Here we have the limit. When x is approaching infinity, put it here, 2 over infinity is 0. So theta is approaching 0. Good. What's x? That's 2 over theta. And then we have sine. And the input is 2 over x, which is theta. Great. 
two can be brought it to the front. Yes. And then we have the limit and then theta approaching zero. And then what's this? What's this? Sine theta over theta, which is one. O in O, two times one, two. Done. All right. <coughs> Am I happy that the secret weapon isn't over? No. Am I happy that what's coming next? Not really, but I don't know why I put the hardest part at the end when my energy level is the lowest. <laughs> <coughs> but let's see, we can handle it, no worry. So by now I will say, uh, this will cover enough of your Cal 1, Cal 2 limits. And then uh, for epsilon delta definitions, depends if you are teacher, your professor goes over it or not. If you are at the university, if you're at a four-year university, then most likely you will have to know how to do the epsilon delta definition. But don't worry, I'll show you guys four words on how you can keep track and then organize everything. Five hours and 26 minutes. All right, so here is number 81. We have the limit as x approaching one. You are going to be like, wow, Seriously, this is the question. Yes, this is the question. X approaching one, and we have six X minus two. That's number 81. So easy, right? Yes, we can just put a one here. I'll show you guys the work if you would like. Six times one minus two. That's six minus two is four. Hey, we are done, yay. But how do we know that this is actually true. Yes, we will have to prove it. How though? Just like what I mentioned earlier, the epsilon delta definition. I will remind you guys on the side. And it really depends if you have done it or not. All right? So I'm going to actually give myself more space. I'm going to put down this right here as four. Okay, here's the deal. If we have the limit as x approaching some number a of some function f of x. If we do end up with some limit, that's called it to be L. This right here means, you ready? It's mean, I know. But it means for all epsilon greater than zero, there exists a delta greater than zero such that if the distance between x and a is small enough, and for distance, it means we have the absolute value and then just subtract them. So we put absolute value of x minus a. If it's small enough, how small is small? Less than delta, okay? And then we do not need x, we do not want x to be a. So we want to say this is greater than zero. If this is true, then we must have the absolute value of the, well, it's pretty much the distance between f of x and the limit l, it's small enough as well. But in this case, we write it as f of x minus l to be less than epsilon. Yeah. So intuitively, it means that you can get as close to l as you would like. And that's, this is just like the formal way to say it. Because again, f of x minus l is a distance between the function and the limit you can make it as small as possible. That's why it's for all epsilon greater than zero. And you can make it as small as possible it's because you can always find a delta greater than zero. So when this happens, this happens. That's the idea. I have a very detailed video going over this. So you should definitely try that. But for now, we will see how to just write the proof, write the proof, write the proof for 10 of them. Okay, here we go. How do we write proof? Write on P at first. Everybody will be happy. Four words. Four words. That's going to make everything much, 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 much clear, systematic, easy to follow. First word, given. Why? When you see for all, right? Just start with the proof by saying given. And you can just say given epsilon greater than zero. And some people might say, you should say let epsilon uh, be greater than zero like this and then b r 
be cherry. Uh, that's cool too, you know. Uh, if you say something like this, you sound more like a mathematician. And if you write give an epsilon greater than zero, that's true and concise, and the people wouldn't get mad at you. So either way, but given I think it's okay. So you always start give an epsilon greater than zero. If I ever ask my students uh, epsilon delta definition on the test, if you put this down, I'll give you a point. Among like ten points. Anyway, though. anyway. <laughs> Next, you see that right here it says there exists. So to show that there exists, you are going to pick, you are going to select, you are going to choose. Uh, I like to use the word choose. So that means you can show that, hey, we do have such a delta. We are going to choose delta, but delta is what? We don't know yet. Just leave it blank for now. A lot of students get stuck with epsilon delta definitions because they just don't know what delta is and then they are stuck. I'm telling you, don't worry. Just write it down, leave it blank for now, and then we'll come back to it later. Okay? Okay, such that we are going to assume that we have this. So I'm just going to say suppose. If you would like, you can also say assume, but suppose. Suppose this is true, meaning that the absolute value, and here we have x minus 1. Right? x minus 1. Because this is x minus a, so it's x minus 1. Suppose the distance between x and 1 is small, meaning less than delta, but we don't want x to be 1. Okay? So we put this greater than 0 when you read it backwards. Because of this, that's why 5 hours ago, when we saw the graph, you see, we don't care when x is exactly 2 or 3. We don't care because we have this inequality. <laughs> anyway, we assume, we suppose we have this condition. With that, we hope to show this is true. And we hope to show, that means we better do the check. So we are going to check. Or you can also say, we see, put we see here and then just go ahead and do the computations and all that. But anyway, we check. Check what? The absolute value, our function is 6x minus 2, and then minus the L, which is 4. Okay? Function minus L. And then we hope to show that this right here is going to be less than epsilon. Okay? So this is the general framework. Now, this is the part that we will have to do the most amount of work and then just do some algebra first. Minus 2 minus 4 is minus 6. And um, we can also factor the 6 on the outside. So perhaps I'll show you guys like this 6x minus 6, and then factor out the 6, and then we get x minus 1. Okay? And this is great because you see how we have the x minus 1 in the absolute value. We know that right here, we have this. Absolute value of x minus 1 is less than delta. So we can say that this right here is less than delta. We replace this absolute value with less than delta, but we still have the 6 at the front. So you see we create this inequality, the less than that we want. Very nice. But keep in mind though, at the end, we want to end up with what? We want to end up with just epsilon. Huh? We just want to end up with epsilon. So what do we need? Well, check this out. This right here is 6. 6 times what will give us epsilon? Well, it's just epsilon over 6, isn't it? Because when we have that, check this out. 6 and 6 cancel, and then we get the epsilon. Cool, huh? So, once we figure this out, you see, delta is just epsilon over 6. We rush back to here, and then let's write down, let's write down epsilon over 6. And you see, because epsilon is greater than 0, and over 6 is still greater than 0, so if you would like, you can indicate that, but nobody really does that. Uh, I just want to say delta is greater than 0. Okay? And a few things though. You see how we pick delta to be exactly, we pick delta to be equal to epsilon over 6. So right here, I'm going to put an equal sign. Delta is equal to epsilon over 6. And I cancel, cancel, so after the simplification, this right here is still equal. But 
The way that you read this is that we have this inequality, which is equal to this, which is equal to that, and then this is less than this, and this is equal to that, it's equal to that. In another word, this inequality, sorry, this absolute value is less than epsilon. So we are done. Put a box. Yay. 20 more questions. It might be confusing the first few times that we are doing it. That's why we are doing 10 times. Okay? So, let's try another one. I'm going to erase everything. Not that. Uh, okay, Let, let's, let's erase this as well. Why? I want to show you guys, the more you write it down, the better that we remember it. Okay, let's try another one. Number 82. Here we have the limit, and then we have x approaching negative 2, and then 2x plus 7. Okay, and then to do this, you can just do this in your head. Negative 2 here, 2 times negative 2 is negative 4 plus 7 is 3. So this right here is equal to 3. Done. Now, epsilon delta definition means if we have the limit and if x is approaching a, if we have a function f of x, if this right here gives us a limit, let's call it l, this right here means no none. Where's the n, huh? This right here means here we go. For all epsilon greater than zero, there exists a delta greater than zero such that if the distance between x and a is less than delta but bigger than zero, so we write it as absolute value of x minus a is less than delta but we don't want x to be a, so we put greater than zero. This right here implies, that's the symbol for implies, implies that the distance between f of x and l is less than epsilon. So we write f of x minus l is less than epsilon. So just go ahead and write down a few more times and then watch the video where I showed you guys an actual example with picture with number and then you will see that it's like the epsilon stands for error. That's why it's E epsilon. It's kind of like it squeeze the just like kind of make the function as close to the limit as possible that kind of thing all right so now here we go what's the first thing yes pf okay for all go ahead and write down given epsilon greater than zero next there exists so we are going to write down choose Delta. Delta is what? I don't know yet. Don't worry. Leave it. We'll come back to you later. Then we are going to assume we have this condition. So I'm going to suppose. So given suppose. Right? Given choose suppose. And then check. Yeah? Suppose the absolute value. Here we have x. And then minus a, which is negative 2, so it becomes plus 2. Uh, suppose this right here is less than delta, which we also don't want x to be negative 2, so that's why uh, you have the greater than 0. And then check. Check what? Absolute value of the function minus the limit. So this minus that in the absolute value. 2x plus 7 and then minus 3. All right. given, given choose, suppose check. Given choose, suppose check. Now, focus on this and do the algebra. 7 minus 3 is 4, and then we can actually factor out 2. So let's just go ahead and factor that out. It should be okay. And then we'll end up with what? x plus 2. Absolute value of x plus 2. So good, because look back. This right here we know is less than delta. And then we have a 2 in the front. Yeah. Now, keep in mind, we want to end up with epsilon. So. We have 2 already, 2 times 4 will give us epsilon. We better have epsilon over 2, because this way, this 2 and that 2 cancel. So we know we should choose delta to be epsilon over 2. 
And of course, epsilon is positive, over 2 is still positive, so it satisfies it. And because delta is epsilon over 2, so we put equal. Likewise, this is just simplification, we put equal sign, and then we're well done. Done. Just like that. Okay? Okay, cool. Alright, let's do another linear situation. Usually, I'm, I'm just saying usually, you will see a linear situation on your exam, you usually. If not, then a quadratic. Yeah, but I'm going to cover both, so don't worry. However, if you are in the honor class, then that's a different story. You might see like a rational or like a exponential or like logarithm. But yeah. Okay, number 83. Limit x approaching 3, 2 over 3, x minus 5. Okay, let's do this in your head. Put 3 in here. Cancel is 2, 2 minus 5. Oh, it's a negative 3. Let me see. Yeah, okay, cool. Here. Proof. First, given epsilon greater than zero. Next, we are going to choose. Choose what? Choose delta to be what? Don't know. Leave it. Then, suppose suppose the distance between x and 3, so we say x minus 3, we want this to be less than delta, and we don't want x to be 3, so put a greater than zero, like looking at backwards. Then we check absolute value of the function minus the limit. So we are looking at 2 over 3x minus 5 minus negative 3. So it becomes plus 3. Okay, here we go. We have a fraction. So let's see how it goes. Okay, negative 5 plus 3 is negative 2. So here we have... 2 over 3x minus 2. Eh. Okay. Can we factor it? Yes. We can still factor out the 2 over 3. Check this out. So I break this up so it's x and then we have the minus. But originally here is a um, minus 2. We factor out the 2 over 3. So what should we do? We should look at this and divide it by. Eh? We should just lo look at this, divide it by that. Divide it by 2 over 3 is the same as multiply by 3 over 2. They cancel, so we just have just a 3. I'm not kidding. Check this out. Distribute it back, we get this. This times that, 3 cancels, 2 minus, yeah. What's this? Less than delta. So we know this right here is 2 over 3 times delta and at the end we want this to be equal to epsilon, right? So you know it, delta should be equal to what? Well this right here we will have to kind of work it out a little bit. 3 over 2 times, okay, we want to have a epsilon here and then perhaps we just need a reciprocal, right? Namely 3 over 2 because this way 2 and 2 cancel, 3 and 3 cancel, perfect. So that means delta is equal to 3 over 2 epsilon. Yeah. This is equal to that. Put it here. Done. Yeah. yeah. And as I said, you don't necessarily need to put a like, greater than 0. Uh, this is okay. Yeah. Because in my previous video, I don't think I put down like delta is this and then greater than zero. Usually you can just write down formula and uh, that's it. So here are the three examples for epsilon delta definition when the function is linear. Alright, number 84. 
let's look at a first situation that the function is not linear and then why don't I look at the okay it's um it's it's it's, it's going all right anyway take a limit as x approaching 4 and then we have the square root of x man this if it's a computational question it's super easy huh because the answer is just 2 yeah but for proof let's just go ahead and do it pf here we go given epsilon greater than 0 next we are going to choose delta I don't know just leave it then suppose suppose what absolute value of x minus 4 to be less than delta and then greater than 0 we go backwards and then lastly we check absolute value function minus the limit okay that's all you have all right now uh, we cannot factor this anymore huh but don't worry we did a lot of this example before when we have square roots what did we do today the count you get so let's go ahead and do that i'm going to just write it down right here i'm going to have square root of x minus let me write it down like this square root of x minus 2 right and i'm going to multiply the top and bottom by square root of x plus 2 and then over square root of x plus 2 aha yeah and then you see this right here will give us just x on the top and then minus 4 right so it's that and then um, over square root of x plus 2 all right so so far so good take a look hopefully it's okay so far it's hot it's warm here but it's okay almost done what do we do next though well here's the thing when we have an absolute value of a quotient this right here is the same as the quotient of the absolute value meaning that we can look at this and say this is just the absolute value of x minus 4 and then over absolute value of square root of x plus 2 but the thing is that the output of square root is always positive likewise when we add a 2 to it it's always positive so this square root on the bottom doesn't matter you can erase that good and then you see right here this is the place that we can use the less than delta which is yay but what exactly do we do with the button though we have square root of x plus 2 well I'm actually just going to get rid of it yeah I'm just going to get rid of it but you will have to say a few things for this though so I'm going to um, do like this I think it's clear if I write it down right here this right here is actually just equal to so this right here is actually just less than absolute value of x minus 4 just get rid of it why I'm going to give you guys an uh, explanation because square root of x plus 2 is always greater than 1 I'm not saying the bottom is always positive I'm saying that the bottom is always greater than 1 that's why when I get rid of this right this right here is smaller than just the top let me give you uh, an example to convince you guys so suppose you have 8 versus 8 of course they are the same but if today you have 8 and then divided by 2 then it becomes what this right here will become smaller than that right yeah however if you have 8 divided by let's say a number that's um, positive but it's 0 0.5 compared to 8 which one's bigger this is bigger now yeah if you divide it by 1 they are equal if you divide it by a number that's bigger than 1 then this right here will be smaller than this that's why I'm mentioning square root of x plus 2 is bigger than 1 so I can legitimately get rid of the bottom and then just say this is less than just the top so this is the idea so that should be clear right so that's pretty really good because now when we have just the absolute value of x minus 4 we can say this right here is less than delta 
Now we can say this is less than delta. Yeah, and then what exactly do we want at the end? We just want this to be less than epsilon, right? So we want the whole thing right here to be like epsilon. So what do we want? We want delta to be equal to epsilon. So we rush back here and just say delta is the same as epsilon and we are done. So this right here is less than delta, which is the same as epsilon. And then we are done. All right. So this right here might be a slightly um, difficult case, especially if you have not seen these kind of things before. But again, when we are working with inequalities or absolute values, uh, just be really careful. This is one of the things that we can do. This is the key that simplifies this equation tremendously. Draw tremendously. If you don't use this, you can still do it other ways, like the ones that we are going to do later. But this is so much better. Thanks to absolute, thanks to square root of x is always positive, and then add two to it, we know it's always greater than one. All right, so that's eighty-four. Right, 85, another square root example. Slightly trickier, uh, slightly more complicated, but we can handle it. Limit as x approaching 6. Square root of 3x minus 2. Okay, put 6 in here, we get square root of 18 minus 2. 18 minus 2 is 16. Square root of that is 4. Now, prove it. P F given epsilon greater than zero. Next, we are going to choose delta. I don't know yet, so leave it. Then we are going to suppose. Okay, and then we have x minus six. So just go ahead and put that in the absolute value. And then this is less than delta, and then greater than zero. Then we are going to check absolute value function minus the limit so we have square root of 3x minus 2 minus 4 cool now for this right here do the conjugate business again so this right here equals square root of 3x minus 2 minus 4 multiply the top and bottom by square root of 3x minus 2 plus 4 and then do the same on the bottom as well, square root of 3x minus 2, and then plus 4. Cool. Now, multiply out the top, we just get absolute value. It's just 3x minus 2, and then minus 4 squared, which is 16. And then the bottom, we just keep it, so it's over square root, ah, It's just over square root. There we go. I like to have a space between a square root and a sort of fraction bar. 3x minus 2 and then plus 4. Cool. Now, let's do more algebra. First though, we see that minus 2 minus 16 is minus 18. And then we can factor out 3. So on the top here, we can have 3 absolute value and then it's x minus 6. Okay. And then same idea like earlier, it's an absolute value of the top and then absolute value of the bottom. But the bottom is always positive, so we don't need the absolute value. So we can just say square root of 3x minus 2 and then plus 4. And what can we do? What can we say next? Well, we can just get rid of the bottom part and say this right here is less than 3 times the absolute value of x minus 6. Why? Because and we will mention that square root of 3x minus 2 plus 4 is greater than 1, right? That's what you have to mention. You don't mention this is greater than 0. You mention this is greater than 1. From here to here, 
we mentioned it's greater than zero because we can get rid of the absolute value. But from here to here, we mentioned this is greater than one because we want to have this inequality and then get rid of the whole thing. Cool. Now we have this, which is that, which is excellent. So this right here, it's again, another less than thanks to that. And we have the three right here. And then we have a delta. And we know it at the end, we want to have just epsilon. So now what's the delta? Epsilon over three. Yes, this is three times epsilon over three. And then we have this and that, bye bye. So we come back here and then say delta is equal to epsilon over three. This is so cool. It's symmetric if you rotate 180 degrees. <laughs> yeah, anyway, this is equal, delta is equal to epsilon over three and then we are done. We're done. Done. Yeah. We're done. Yeah. No, we have a couple more to go, of course. quadratic cases so two quadratic cases and then one cubic and then uh, two rational and then we'll move on to <laughs> remote sum and it will be done all right number 86 limit as x approaching we have 3 2x squared plus 1 Let's just work this out real quick. 3 squared is 9. Times 2 is 18. Plus 1 is 19. All right, here's the deal. If somehow you computed this wrong, let me tell you, later on the proof is going to be horrendous. If the proof does not go as smooth as the example that I've been showing you guys earlier, maybe we just added it wrong or did, did something wrong in the, at the beginning. I don't know. Anyway, PF proof given epsilon greater than zero, and then we are going to choose delta. I don't know yet, but you know, I'm not worried about it. Suppose absolute value x minus 3 is less than delta, and then you know, greater than zero, like this. Lastly, we are going to check and hopefully everything goes smoothly. Absolute value of the function 2x squared plus 1 minus the limit, which is 19. All right, here we go. This minus that is minus 18, and then we can factor out 2. So this right here is 2. All right. Let's see. All right, 2x squared. Two x squared. I'll show you guys all the steps. Minus eighteen, and then we factor out two, and then we get x squared minus nine. All right, and perhaps I'll, yeah, yeah, this is okay. And then, oh, okay, and then this is two times x minus three, times x plus three. Okay, so show all the steps. More legitimate. I was going to go from here to here, but now, yeah, show you guys everything, and. From here to here, we use the fact that the absolute value of a product is the product of the absolute value. So it's pretty clear. So you can skip that as another step. But anyway, though, this is nice because we can say that we can have less than two times delta. But now, here's the trouble sum. Absolute value of x minus three, how can we get rid of it? Well, how can we get a bound? Meaning that we want to show this right here is less than some number as well so that we can kind of maintain this inequality so we can go smoothly. Uh, how do we do it though? Okay, this is where the magic is. We are going to come back to the delta, come back here right now, and then put down minimum, and then like uh, this notation, like a uh, set notation, and then just use one. Keep in mind, just use one. Oh, I heard, can you use two? Can you use 17? 
Sure, up to you. If you want to have a smooth experience, then I highly recommend you to use one. If you want to have some ad ad um, adventures, use Pi. Use one over E. Just use one, please. No, no, no. Use one over Pi sometimes too. Yeah, yeah. I I don't know. But anyway, just put on one. Why? Because the moment that we have the minimum and also the one, the moment that we have the one right here, we are allowed to come here and say because delta, we have this one that we can use. So look at this inequality, just this side, and we can say absolute value of x minus 3 is less than this number that we put down earlier. We put down one, so we can use one. We put down one over e, you use one over e. You want to put on square root of 17, square root of 17 to you. Now, from here, we are going to somehow get an expression for absolute value of x plus 3. To do so, one systematic way is just you first open the absolute value, so we will know that when we do that, we get absolute value, we get x minus 3. This right here will be in between of 1 and negative 1. Right? That's how absolute value works, right? If this is less than 1, then that means the inside is in between of negative 1 and 1. And now you see, we want to have x plus 3. This is x minus 3. So let's just go ahead and add 6 to everybody. And this is of course legitimate because this is just a regular inequality. And then you see this is 5, and this is x plus 3, and then this is 7. Okay? Now, question for you guys. I want to go from here back to the absolute value. How do we do it? Well, here's the idea. Just compare the absolute value of this number and that number, which one is bigger? 7 has a bigger absolute value, so it's just absolute value of x minus so x plus 3. Absolute value of x plus 3 is less than this number, the bigger absolute value. Why? Because when we have this, of course, x plus 3, if it's greater than 5, it has to be greater than negative 7. So you see that we have negative 7 and also 7, so of course we can write this as absolute value of x plus 3 less than 7. Yeah. And later you are going to see a slightly strange case, but for now, just remember, look at which number has a bigger absolute value. So you know what? Now you see, we have this absolute value of x plus 3 is less than 7. This is great because this is less than, we have less than already. We don't have to write it again. This is not a list. You can just say that this right here is less than 7. Yay. Yay, seriously. Okay, now question. What should delta be though? Because again, at the very end, we want to have this to be just delta. So we just want to have this as just epsilon. So what should delta be? 2 times 7 is I wanted to say 17. 2 times 7 is 14. So we better have delta to be epsilon over 14. So that, you see, 2 times 7, this, this, and that will cancel. Now, delta we said is epsilon over 14. We come back here and then we put down epsilon over 14. Close this. Right here, though, we do not put an equal sign because we say delta is the minimum of 1 or epsilon over 3. So it's a minimum. We want this right here to be less than or equal to right? because delta is less than this or that. Okay? Well done. Well done. Huh? Well done. Okay? Cool, huh? Please, do not ask me to do 100 epsilon delta definition. Please, no. No. 10 is, is good. 10 is good. <laughs> Please don't. Because this right here are still like, to be honest, like an introductory level. When we're talking about real analysis, there are crazy stuff such as proof a function is uniformly continuous or dense. You have like so many. That's not good. Let's not talk about it. 
87 limit and we have x approaching negative 2 x squared minus 3x is that right cool all right put that in here you get 4 minus 3 6 so it's 10 Good. All right, so now, again, just go ahead and prove it. This is a quadratic case, so it will be very similar to what we did earlier. So here we go, PF. Let's go ahead and say, given epsilon greater than zero, and then suppose delta is equal to something. Then, no, 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 given choose. Sorry, I'm tired. Choose. Suppose, here we go. Absolute value of x minus negative 2, so it becomes plus 2, is less than delta, and then this is greater than 0. And then we want to check absolute value function minus the limit, so x squared minus 3x, and then minus 10. Oh my god, look at this, how beautiful is this? This is a quadratic trinomial. We can factor it the usual way. Okay, we need x minus 5 times x plus 2. So that's the factoring. So here we go. We have absolute value of x minus 5. Let's, let's put on x plus 2 first. Because that way we can put on the delta first. So x plus 2 times x minus 5. Okay, this right here is less than delta. That's nice. Now, we have to get a bound for absolute value of x minus 5. You know the deal. Come here and write down minimal. Put on 1. Just use 1, please. Alright. Come here, just this side, and just this part. So we can say, this right here gives us absolute value of x plus 2 is less than 1. And we want to somehow go from here to here. So let's open the absolute value. That means x plus 2 is in between of negative 1 and 1. We want to get to negative 5. So that's minus 7. Minus 7 here, minus 7 here, minus 7 here, right? So in the middle, we have x minus 5. This right here is negative 8. And then I'm just subtracting so the inequalities maintain the same. And then less than 1 minus 7 is negative 6. Hey, this is crazy because if we have the absolute value of x minus 5, this is negative, that's negative. I cannot say this is less than negative 6. That doesn't make sense. This doesn't make sense. But the deal is that, remember what I told you guys earlier? We are looking at which number has a bigger absolute value. I'm not talking about which number is bigger. So I'm telling you guys that, hey, just do absolute value of x minus 5. Put that as less than the absolute value of negative 8, which is just an 8. Why is this true? Because here, if you open this, we get what? x minus 5 is in between of negative 8 and positive 8. Negative 6 is right here. Of course, this covers that situation. All right? So, here we have it. This blue part is this. We can just say, hey, multiply that by 8. That's my delta. That's my 8. At the end, we want to end up with epsilon. So delta should be equal to what? Epsilon over 8. Yes. Let me just write it down nicer for you guys. Times 8. Cancel, cancel. Come back here. Epsilon over 8. Close that, make it legitimate, and then right here, less than or equal to because we use the minimum. So this is how you write the proof for it. Yeah. Could there be another choice for delta? Yes, because if you use SA2, then uh, this delta, this expression will be different and it will still work, uh, theoretically speaking. Yeah. 
But to really understand what's going on for Epson Delta definition, I will highly recommend you guys to watch my video because I use actual example, my actual numbers, and also the graph, and I explained it when I'm like when I was like 100% <laughs> energy. Right now, I don't know. I I use 78% of my life already, so I have like 13% more. <laughs> Okay. All right now, a uh, cubic e example. I also picked this one on purpose. Right? Number eighty-eight. What's a limit as x approaching two of x to the third power? You know it's eight. Why? Look, eight, eight, and an eight. <laughs> okay. All right. Proof. This is like the extension of the quadratic case. If you have understood uh, the quadratic cases, then this right here, not so bad. By the way, given epsilon greater than zero, choose delta, I don't know yet. Suppose absolute value of x minus two is less than delta, and put this check absolute value function minus the limit all right here we go algebra work this is the difference of two squares this is the same as two to the third power so we can factor this as absolute value of x minus two times absolute value of x minus two times x squared plus 2 times x which is just 2x and lastly we add 2 squared which is 4 cool what's this this is good yeah less than delta everybody likes it what's that don't worry come back to the delta part and then we just say minimum let's use one okay Starting right here, let's draw this a little bit longer because of that. Okay, so we're looking at absolute value of x minus 2 is less than 1. For here, we want to get to x squared part, so uh, it's a little bit tricky, so pay your attention right here. Um, but the idea is the same if you can like, get a bound for this, then you, you, you are in good shape. Anyway, open this so we get x minus 2 is in between of negative 1 and 1 and for this particular case I'm going to just because I cannot get to x square right? unless I square everybody no let's not do that let's just add 2 to everybody you'll see why so they cancel and then we see this is 1 this is x and this is 3 and then just about what we did earlier we can say absolute value of x is less than 3 so you pick the bigger absolute value, which is this. Now, here is the deal. We have this condition, thanks to that, and we want to see this. So I will just tell you guys that notice from here and there, we are going to make a connection. When we have the absolute value of x squared plus 2x plus 3, it's plus 4. <laughs> You see how we have the absolute value of a sum. This right here is going to be guaranteed less than or equal to the absolute value of the first plus the absolute value of the second plus the absolute value of the third. Yeah. So this is like the extended version of the so-called triangle inequality. So let me just write it down somewhere. By triangle in equality. Let me give you guys an example real quick. Suppose you have an absolute value. Let's say we have 5 plus 3. Well, is this less than or equal to absolute value of 5 plus absolute value of 3? Yes, in fact, they are equal because it's 8. It's actually equal to 8. But if you have, let's say, this, because you don't know if x is negative or not. I don't know, right? So let's say if we have 5 
plus negative 3. I'm going to put a 3 right here and make it negative 3. You see, here we actually just get 2, but then here we have 8. The right hand side is bigger. So again, when we have absolute value of a sum, this right here is less than or equal to the sum of the absolute values. This is the so-called triangle inequality. So that's another thing that you'll keep in mind. Because once we have this, check this out. I'm going to use equal sign because this is equal to absolute value of x. This right here is equal to absolute value of x squared. We can put a square on the outside. And the reason for that is absolute value of x squared is equal to absolute value of x times x. And per our discussion earlier, the absolute value of a product is the product of the absolute value. So this is the same as. It depends if you guys have seen this kind of proof or not in your class. Hopefully you can just go from here to here. But anyway, it's, it's this equal sign. And then you can put a 2 on the outside, so it's plus 2, absolute value of x. And then absolute value of 4 is just 4, so from here to here, it's just straightforward equal sign. Now, we know absolute value of x is less than 3, so we can re replace the real absolute value with less than, and then 3 squared plus 2 times 3, and then plus 4. And then from here to here, it's going to be equal sign because it's just computation. And let's see, this is 9 plus 6 plus 4, so 19. So all in all, we are saying that this absolute value expression is less than 19, which is exactly what we want. This is less than 19. Let's have a look. Because you know once you have that, we're almost done. At the end, you want epsilon. Delta shall be epsilon over 19. That way, when we multiply by 19, they cancel. So we can come back here and say, we also need it. epsilon over 19. And close this, less than or equal to. Finally, don't you ever forget. The box shading. Ah, cool. Absolute, I mean, um, absolute delta definition is a lot of fun when you know how to work it out, when you know how to write down a good proof for it. It's, it feels very satisfying. It feels very, very satisfying. Yeah, I think this is the reason why a lot of people like real analysis. Uh, only after they understand how to solve it all, because the process of like understanding it is super hard. But once you understand it, yeah, the feeling is super satisfying. Yeah, it's like running a marathon. The running process is not that enjoyable, but the after work, after you finish the marathon, you know, it feels good. Just like why I like to do 100 questions. All right. Rational example number 89. All right, this is a uh, limit as x approaching 2. Yeah, this is my, uh, what's that? My baby calculus versus adult calculus video question. Why? Well, it's super easy, huh? 1 over 2. Let's take a look at the proof of it. Here we go. P, F. Okay. Given epsilon greater than 0, choose, I don't know yet, leave it. Suppose we have the absolute value of x minus 2 is less than delta and then greater than zero, then hopefully we can get the absolute value to work for this. We want the function minus the limit. Now let's do the algebra for this. Get the common denominator, we get absolute value of 2 minus x over 2x. Okay. Flip the subtraction so we can use that legitimately. So on the top, this right here is the same as negative 
x minus 2, right? And then I can take the absolute value on the top and then the absolute value of 2x. Yeah? And then let's see. I'm going to write this down right here. The negative in the absolute value becomes positive, right? so it doesn't matter. So we just have absolute value of x minus 2 times 1 over, put a 2 on the outside, and then we have the absolute value of x. This right here, we know is less than delta. Excellent. But we don't know what this is. 1 over 2 absolute value of x. So you know the deal. We're going to come here and say delta is equal to the minimum. And then we say 1. That way, we can utilize this inequality, just this part. Absolute value of x minus 2 is less than 1. And we want to get this expression, huh? So hopefully you can find this right here to be less than something. That's the goal. We want this to be less than something. Okay, open this. Absolute value of x minus. This means x minus 2 is in between of negative 1 and 1. And then just add 2 to everybody. We know x is in between of 1 and 3. Uh, this means absolute value of x is less than 3. right? That's what we have done so far. And in fact, I picked the same number like the previous one on purpose. Because that's what we did earlier. Huh? And now, we have absolute value of x is less than 3. We want to get 1 over absolute value of x. So should we just do the reciprocal right now? Well, if we do that, keep in mind both sides are positive. So when we do the reciprocal on both sides, we have 1 over absolute value of x and then 1 over 3. But we will have to switch the inequality. Yeah, for example, we know 2 is less than 3. But if we do the reciprocal on both sides, in fact, 1 half is actually bigger than 1 over 3. Ah, oh, man. This is so bad because we cannot proceed. We really want to see this right here is less than something. But now we have 1 over absolute value of x is greater than something. No good. So what do we do? I'm so stuck. No, don't worry. The trick is that you do not do the absolute value right here, right now. In fact, we actually do the reciprocal first, and everything will go smoothly. Check this out. Everything's positive, so do the reciprocal. 1 over 1 is still 1, and here we have 1 over x, and this is 1 over 3. And then flip the inequalities, right? This, this. Do the reciprocals first, and then take the absolute value. Absolute value of 1 over x is just 1 over absolute value of x. That should be clear. And now which one has a bigger absolute value? 1. So in fact, this right here is less than 1. Yeah. <laughs> and then minus well, just put a 2 right here as well. Right? It's 2 on the bottom though. So let's multiply both sides by 2. So 1 over 2 absolute value of x. This right here is less than 1 half. This, and we have the less than already. Very good. Uh, we know this right here is less than one half. So, what do we need for the delta? This one is rather special, huh? We want the delta to be two epsilon because this way, when we multiply by one over two, the two and two will cancel. So, hurry up! Let's put delta to be two epsilon here, and then close this. And then it's a minimum zone. So choo -choo. And then finally, draw the box, shake this in. <sighs> yeah. Hey, if you feel good with epsilon delta definition, don't worry, there's one more. And for the last one, I'm going to erase that as well. Right? So I'm going to see if we can recall everything. I think we have been doing a good job recalling all the definitions, right? All the steps. So you see, after ten epsilon delta definition in a row, but it's not so bad, huh? Right. Limit as x approaching one. As I said, another 
rational case. And for this one, put one in there, worked out, <laughs> we could answer. So simple, but yet it's going to be also pretty difficult. Don't worry though, I'll take care of you guys. PF. First, given, given delta, sorry, given epsilon greater than zero, then choose delta, I don't know yet. Then, suppose, absolute value of this minus that, so x minus one is less than delta and greater than zero. Then, we want to check. Okay, absolute value, function minus the limit, so we have one over two x minus, one, sorry, two x plus one, minus one over three, right? Now let's just get the common denominator, all the good stuff. So just put it down right here, maybe we need more space. Okay, so three right here, minus, right? And now just distribute, so minus two x and then minus one, okay? And then on the bottom, I'm just going to write it as three times two x plus one. Yeah, something like this. Hopefully, you guys are okay with it. That's the value. All right. Okay. Three minus one is two, and then we can factor on negative two. So this right here becomes that's the value negative two, and then this is negative two x plus two. Yeah. So when we factor out a negative two, this becomes x minus one. Yeah. So far, so good. We see that, huh? And then, um, eh, the bottom is just that I can't really do too much, huh? so I'm just going to keep it as that. So three, two x plus one. Now break this apart. After the value of the top, and after the value of the two, just the negative two, just two, right? So we have two, and the absolute value, and then x minus one. Okay, and then we have this on the bottom. Put the three on the outside, so one over. 3 and then absolute value of this 2x plus 1 all right so that's the algebra that we have so far you know the deal come here minimal 1.7 no no please don't don't do that of course you should do 1 over pi okay 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 One. All right, here, let's see. Look at absolute value of x minus one is less than one. Open it, we get x minus one. It's in between of one here, and then put negative one here, and then just add one to everybody. So we see that's zero, and then that's x, and then, oh, I'm trying to get to there, huh? But let's, let's do the things that we did earlier. Uh, two. Okay. Okay, fine. I need a two x, so let's multiply everybody by two. So multiply by two, multiply by two, multiply by two. So two x is in between of zero and then four, and then let's add one to everybody. <laughs> uh, so yeah, add one, add one, add one. Things like this, pretty cool, I would say. So we have two x plus one. It's in between of one and five. What did we do earlier? We take the reciprocal first, right? So we take the reciprocal. This is going to be one over one, which is one, and flip one over two x plus one, and then flip, and then also reciprocal that. Which one has a bigger absolute value? This does. So this means. 1 over 2x plus 1 in the absolute value is less than 1. Really interesting, huh? Because we saw the 1 earlier too. Yeah, and we want the street right there, huh? So let's just say that, yeah, to have in the space, 1 over 3 absolute value 2x plus 1 is less than 1 third. Yeah. Okay. All right. This thing. We have the less than two is still two. This is less than delta. 
I forgot to say that earlier. I was too excited to work out that. All right, and this thing, let me just do like purple. There. <laughs> it's less than one over three. So multiply this and we get one over three. Now, ladies and gentlemen, all the way at the end, we want to end up with epsilon. So what should we pick for delta? We better have a delta, <laughs> we better have an epsilon here, right? We divide it by three, so we better multiply by three. We multiply by two here, so we shall divide it by two. And when we have that, we can see two and two cancel, three and three cancel, and we'll just end up with epsilon. And uh, delta is equal to that, so we will come here and put down three over two epsilon, and then hurry up, let's close this. And then put down, and then, yes, yes. Ooh. You think we are done? No. We have 10 more pretty hard questions. What are they? Remind some. Are they any easier? Uh, depends. They definitely look scarier because they are longer. You see this right here? They look like the question looks like this, but like the work is a lot. <laughs> for the remote sum, for the in definition of integral, pretty much. Um, the, 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 the question is like that long, and then the work is actually not bad. I'm going to simplify for you guys. Right? I'm not going to overcomplicate the remote sum. Because once you know what to look for, then yeah, you know the deal already. And I do have a very detailed explanation for remote sum as well. So, yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, number 91. Welcome to a very, very long limit. Limit as n goes to infinity. Ready? First one, 1 over n times 1 over n square next one 1 over n times 2 over n square next one 1 over n times 3 over n square i'm not going to write that down i'm just going to put on plus da 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 1 over n n over n square all right so there are a few ways that you can do it if you recognize what the region is then you can convert that into uh integral question right away so that's that but for this case right i want to show you guys at least one time because this is everybody's first definite integral so i'm showing you guys how to do it a very classic way all right so i'll show you firstly you keep the limit as n goes to infinity and notice everybody has the one over n so i'm going to flatten that out in the meantime though, n square, n square, everybody also has n square on the bottom as well, right? So I'm also going to factor that out right here. And you will notice that this right here will just have one square left. Next, we will have two square left, and then three square left, and then so on, so on, so on, up to the very last part, which is n squared, like so. Okay? Then you are going to see this is actually just very nice to be un approaching infinity this is 1 over n to the third power and all this we have extremely nice formula right? we have extremely nice formula what is it Ready? n times n plus 1 times 2n plus 1 all over 6. Check my other video to see how we can prove this formula. Alright? Yeah. In fact, this is really cool because this formula actually contains 1 plus, 2 plus, 3 plus, da da da, up to n. Because this right here is n times n plus 1 over 2. So we have the n times n plus 1. Break this down as 2 times 3. Yeah. 
but that's a discussion for another video. Anyway, does this look familiar? You should. The limit has something to the to approach infinity, right? <clears throat> so this is the limit as n goes to infinity. On the bottom, we have six n cube. On the top, just for fun, I'm going to multiply out for you guys. Here we have n square plus n, and then we multiply two n plus one. So this right here is two n to the third power, and then n square, and then two n square. Yes, together is three n square, and lastly we have n. Right? You really don't have to multiply out everything, but number question number number twenty one. My soul is loading, leaving my body. Limit is n approaching infinity. This is everybody's favorite calculus question. On the top, we care about two to the so we care about two n to the third power. On the bottom, we also have the same thing n eh? n to the third power. They cancel out, reduce two and six, we get one third. Hey, the answer is just one third. Very very nice. Very very nice. All right. Now it's about time to tell you guys what this represents. This, as I said, is everybody's first integral question, and it's just going to be the area under x squared from 0 to 1. How? Well, I'm going to show you. Don't worry. When we have 0 to 1, the idea is that we are going to cut this into n equal width rectangles. That's why we have all the 1 over n. So just imagine we cut into n equal piece rectangles. So this is the first piece. And I'm going to use the right end point to construct the rectangle. Meaning that, use this x value, go up, hit the curve, and then we are going to just construct our rectangle right here. And because we have n rectangles, just imagine a 10. Then in this case, it would be like 1 over 10, right? But again, it's n. So this right here is 1 over n. What's the height of this rectangle? It's just the y value. We use this x value, 1 over n, we put it here, and we get 1 over n squared. So this height is 1 over n squared, times the base is 1 over n. So this right here is the area of the first rectangle. Next, well, we have this rectangle here, but it go up by another 1 over n. So this x value is 2 over n. So go up, hit the curve, and then construct the rectangle. The width is still 1 over n though, but the height, we put 2 over n into the x, so we get 2 over n squared. So this right here represents the area of the second rectangle. So on, so on, so on. And the very last one is 1, which is just the same as n over n. We go up, hit the curve, and then we construct our rectangle. Yeah. Width is still 1 over n, the highest n over n square, the area of the last rectangle. As we have n approaches infinity, each rectangle is going to be so, 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 so thin, like infinitesimal, small. Yeah, so you can actually get the area. Okay? Alright, so that's cool, but I want to show you guys what's cooler. Check this out. This right here, it's just a way to say we have the limit as n goes to infinity. And then you see that we have all the addition, which is the summation, which we can use sigma for it. We can write it as sigma, like this. And then you see we have the 1, 2, 3 up to n. They change right, They change, right? So that's where we need to use the running index. We'll say i, just the running index. i goes from 1 to n. Inside here, we have i over n, yeah, and then we square that, and then we multiply by 1 over n. I just put a 1 over n at the end. This right here is the width, aka delta x. Delta x, another way to look at it is from where to where, and we write it as b minus a over n. So the range, right, it's only one unit away. If we start with 0, we end up with 1. If we start with 17, we end up at 18. 
So that's the structure. And guess what? If you know the structure of this, we can change this to a super version. That is the so-called integral. What's the function? You see, the input is i over n. That's what we talk about. We enter all this into the x. So that's the function. So the function in this case is x squared. Yeah. And then you can actually look at it from here, 1 over n, right? And based on this, we know b minus a is 1. So just go ahead and start with 0. You can always start with 0. You will see it in another question later on. So we can just go from 0 to 1. And then the delta x, that's so, I don't know. It's 2022 already. Don't write delta x, write dx. So anyway, this right here is the explanation of the integral notation. Right? So you can ignore that. I want you guys to be able to go from here to here. But of course, it's hard sometimes. So definitely draw the picture and convince you guys that all the setup is correct. It's correct though, because you see we just want the area going from 0 to 1 under x squared. And the dx is just the width of the rectangle. So it does make sense when we have the dx in the integral notation, right? So, how do we do integrals? Well, we are going to use the reverse power rule. So, if you haven't learned about the integrals by now, you can watch my 100 integrals video, or you can pause for a little bit. For now, if you are in Calc 1, then this is what you have to focus on, and may maybe come back after a week or two, then this is what you will be doing. Anyway, we use the reverse power rule, meaning that we find the antiderivative add one to the power, which is three, and then divided by the new power, so we have one third. So an antiderivative for that is just one over three x to the third power. And then we're going to plug in, plug in. Plug in one and then subtract plug in zero. This process is called the fundamental theorem of calculus part two. Anyway, I'll show you one over three. 1 to the third power, this is the first part, minus, plugging 0, we have 1 over 3, 0, third power, this is 0, this is, yes, you know it, 1 third. So yeah, this weird curve shape has the area of a very nice number, 1 third. <laughs> right? So, keep in mind of how we go from here to here. But I want to warn you guys though, a lot of times the questions will put one over to here. So you will see we have the limit as n goes to infinity and then one over n and then the sigma and then i goes from one to infinity and whatever this is. Right. But just worry about this right here will give you the function part. This right here will tell you from where to where and I change that to the integral, and that's it, all right? <clears throat> all right, the next example is going to illustrate why we can always just start with zero. The soda is not cold anymore, so I'm, I don't know if I should finish it. Anybody wants it? Probably not, don't. <laughs> Number 92. Here, it's very similar to earlier. You will see this is the limit as x of xn goes to infinity, and then we have 1 over n, and then we are going to have 2 plus 1 over n squared, and the next 1 over n times 2 plus 2 over n squared, and so on, so on, so on. The next one will be here 2 plus 3 over n, and then all that stuff, okay? You can see on the handout, but I'm just not writing it down. And then 1 over n, 2 plus n over n square. All right. So here we go. Let's combine this into a sigma notation. It will be the limit as n goes to infinity. Everybody has 1 over n. We can factor it. And then you see, I'm going to put it right here, okay? Usually nobody really put it at the end. 
but that's the dx point you just have to roll like that and then we have the sum i goes from 1 to n and i is this 1 2 3 4 and so on up to n that's the changing part and this time you see we have 2 plus i over n and then square okay now based on this what region are we talking about well again let's focus on this right here first we have 1 over n huh so this right here tells us b minus a will give us 1 if we start with 0 we end with 1 if we start with 25 we end up with 26 etc etc all right does that help not really okay just start with zero that helps just start with zero that helps okay just start with zero so i'm going to claim that this right here it's actually just the integral going from zero to one just start with zero and then the function is actually two plus this right here i over n it's just going to be the x and then square and then dx so you can change that to an integral and this integral of course represents the following have a look if you graph 2 plus x it's just like so if you graph 2 plus x square it's just like you have a parabola but you put to the left two units right so when x is negative 2 here we have a parabola something like this okay and I'm saying that the region that we want is from here to here 0 to 1 and then have a look this is y equals 2 plus x of, uh, to the second power does this satisfy our original it does have a look we go from here to here so the whole thing is 1 cut into n pieces so each piece is 1 over n so the first x value that we can use is 1 over n put it here the height is what? 1 over n in here so we have 2 plus 1 over n square the next x value 2 over n put it here we have 2 plus 2 over n square that's the height and then everything here the width is 1 over n so yeah that should convince you guys huh? okay what if you don't want to start with 0 ah i don't know if you want to start with 2 it's okay too show you if you start with 2 then you go up to 3 per our discussion earlier right and in that case the function it's no longer the same right here but you put it as just x square and dx why let me show you this right here will give you that as well check this out so we have our x square horrible picture no i'm sorry but if we go from 2 to 3 so this is the region that we are talking about now okay why we start with 2 because this right here is a 2 check this out from here to here the whole thing is still 1 cut into n pieces so this right here the width is still 1 over n so we still have 1 over n there good but what's the x value from here to here is 2 we have to add 1 over n so this x value is 2 plus 1 over n and then you see our function is x squared we are going to put this whole thing 2 plus 1 over n to here and then go up you see that's how we can get the height which is that same thing next yeah, this right here is what from here to here is 2 1 over n another 1 over n so all to get is 2 plus 2 over n <laughs> whoa look at that this is the x value put it here look at that same thing so that's why as i said just always start with zero for this kind of questions everybody will be so much happier if you don't want to start with um 
If you don't want to start with she wrote, that's totally okay. It's just that you kind of move the region around. This is a microphone. I moved to, to here. That's still the microphone. Same thing. So it doesn't matter how you move it horizontally, you will still have the same area under the curve. This right here is definitely easier to compute though. So that's the advantage compared to that. All right? So I'm going to compute this for you guys. Do the same thing, antiderivative, so you get one third x to the third power, and then we plug in two, three, this right here, one third, three to the third power, that's the first part, and then minus one third, two to the third power, yeah, okay, that's 27. Twenty-seven minus nine. Eighteen? No, that's eight. Oh my goodness. Twenty-seven minus eight. Nineteen, right? Twenty-seven minus eight is eight. This is this nineteen over three. There we go. <laughs> Almost got it right. I was like, oh, how can this be so nice to be like three? Not possible. If you do this you get the same answer. Alright? Let me see if the Okay, yes, my phone is recording. Almost seven hours, oh my god. I thought I was able to finish this in six, but no. All right, so with that being said, I'm just going to show you guys how we can quickly set all this up. And then if necessary, I'll show the pictures to convince you guys that it's actually correct. And then um, we'll do the integrals and then that's it, that's it. <laughs> Number 93. God, number 93. Yeah, I want to thank everybody though. Whoever is still watching right now, thank you guys so much. I want to thank all my subscribers, all my channel members, all my patrons. Thank you guys so, so, so much. Almost 1 million subscribers too. Thank you guys so much. <laughs> 93. Limit as an approach and infinity. It's just so much fun to do math questions um, and then you guys are watching and then participating and giving me your thoughts and all that stuff. So, so, so much fun. Love it so much. And it's a lot of fun to do 100 questions in one go. Why? Well, I run my results. So, yeah, same idea. But I'm hungry right now, though, so let me just finish it. <laughs> all right 6 over n square the next one will be 9 over n okay inside and then dot 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 cool now put this in the sigma summation form here we have the limit as n goes to infinity everybody has 3 over n so let's write it right here sigma i goes from 1 to n i want to see 1 2 3 4 all the way to n so you do this this is the same as 3 times 1 this is the same as 3 times 2 so on so on so on and here we have 3 times n right so that's the part that's changing so we have 3 i over n and then square so the question can be presented this way or this way, so be careful with both ways. And here's an important point. You see the three and three match. It's crucial, you'll see. But anyway though, let's do what we did earlier. Three over n, this three tells us b minus a is equal to three. So if we start with five, we go to eight. If we start with zero, which you should always start with zero, you go to three. So here's the deal, integral zero to three. Perfect. Now, what's the function? We have a three right here that's bothering us. Is the function three x squared, or are we having just like zero to three x squared dx? Which one? The answer is this right here, not that. This right here. Why? Because the reason that we have a 3 right here is because the whole thing is 3 and we cut into n pieces. So that's why. And uh, 
I'm going to perhaps just erase this and I'm going to just give you guys a picture here real quick so you see when we have uh, x to the sum power but it's actually just x to the third power but no 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 no, no. kidding just kidding x to the second power because we are going from 0 to 3 right so each width is 3 over n the next one is 6 over n so you see that's why I said 3 and 3 match so you see you put this to the x value we get that for the height you put this to be the x value in here you get the height so the function is actually just x squared it's not 3x squared be really careful with that so it's x squared dx work that out 1 third x to the third power 0 to 3 plus 3 in here 3 to the third power is 27 divided by 3 is 9 and then subtract plugging 0 just 0 so yeah we're good we're good so that's number 20 that's number 93 so be really careful huh? this and that match what if we don't have a 3 right here though? well you can put this 3 on the very outside that's that works too but the reason that I have these three questions so similar is just because I want to go over this more details with you guys so that way you guys can fully understand what's going on maybe you guys have heard my stomach already I'm so hungry <laughs> anyway next I'm going to illustrate what I mean by if the numbers they don't match anyway number 94 here we have limit and goes to infinity 1 over uh, it's meant to be a 1 okay oh the way I wrote it is this I don't know why I wrote it as 1 over n and then here we have sine pi over n plus sine of 2 pi over n and then sine of 3 pi over n and then so on so on so on and then sine of n pi over n all right let's put this in the sigma summation first which is just the limit as n goes to infinity 1 over n all this can be put it as the summation i goes from 1 to n 1 pi 2 pi 3 pi so on so on so on up to n pi so we are talking about sine of let's put it as i pi or pi i I pi over n okay now this number is just 1 and that's all means b minus a is equal to 1 so this right here is equal to what integral going from 0 to 1 only now the hard part is what's the function is this sine of x or sine of pi x the answer is sine of pi x if this is a 1 this pi will just be the coefficient and look at the i over n which is that will give you the x I'll convince you guys that this is actually legit sine of pi over x let's just say it looks like this somewhat like that Hopefully this is legit. If not, I will have to correct it. I'm tired, so we'll see. So you see, we have sine of pi over we have sine of pi x. So this is the curve. And the deal is that we are going from 0 to 1. When x is 1, sine of pi is 0. So we do have this part right here. Okay. We want to have oh the picture is wrong. Nah. Let me let me try to draw it slightly more realistic. Because this is zero, let's say this is one, and when x is one over two, you get one. So yeah. when x is one over two, you get sine of pi over two, which is one. Doesn't matter. Trust the computation, all that stuff. Anyway, going from zero to one, this right here is one over n. 
two over n, three over n, and so on. Put this into this x, pi over n. Put this into here, two pi over n, and so on, so on, so on. Okay, okay. Yeah. So I want to see how many of you guys are still. Uh, I want to see how many of you guys are still watching this. Question for you guys. What if today we have the limit as n goes to infinity? What if we have a pi here and over n and then summation i goes from 1 to n and then sine of i pi over n? So tell me what the function is and tell me from where to where. <laughs> I'll give you guys the dx there. Do not just put a pi at the front and just say, hey, that's the answer, multiply by pi. Don't do that. Don't do that. Do the things I said. Right? It's better that way. So the range will be going from 0 to pi. Okay, the range will be going from 0 to pi. And then tell me what the function is. But anyway, though, uh, what's the answer for this? All right, I'll show you guys how to do this. Anti-derivative of sine is negative cosine because the derivative negative cosine is positive sine and then the input is pi x but we will have to divide by this constant here how do we do all the entire derivative order i have 100 integrals already by the way trust me this right here is the answer for that yes now put a one put the zero so here be really careful though one over pi, negative one over pi cosine of pi times 1 that's the first part minus put a 0 so we have negative 1 over pi cosine of pi times 0 <sighs> okay cosine of pi is negative 1 cosine of 0 that's pi times 0 is 0 is 1 so here this right here gives us positive 1 over pi and then negative negative becomes a positive 1 over pi wow this was crazy the answer for that is 2 over pi how pretty is this <laughs> right, cool huh All right, now I'm just going to uh, put the question in the summation form. It's uh, better that way. So we have the limit. Let me just see. I don't know why I just want to check. Wow, seven hours. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Seriously? Yeah. Limit and uh, we have n goes to infinity yeah of course n goes to infinity what am i talking about huh? 3 over n and then times the summation i goes from 1 to n square root of 1 plus 3i over n whoa so how to do this? First thing first, 3, right? B minus A is 3. Just start with 0, yeah? 0 to 3. And this right here will give you the function. What's the function though? 3 and 3 match, so you pick the whole thing to be the x. So just square root of 1 plus x. Just like that. Work this out real quick, yeah? Uh, Okay, to do this right here, a uh, uh, 
Okay, this right here might not be the easiest to integrate at the moment. What we can do is, right here inside, I'm just going to minus one, and I'm just going to move it. And then here, I'm just going to add one. This is the same idea, like shifting, okay? But anyway, I'll give you guys the area argument. I think that's much better. Okay, so here, yeah, because I don't want to get into the use substitution thing in this video, that's why. Anyway, I'll say I knew so many times. <laughs> anyway, this picture is like this, okay? And we go from zero to three. Okay, but the truth is, we can move it to the right one unit and that will give us the integral going from 1 to 4 and then you can see that it's just like this it's the same area okay and we can just look at the square root of x much easier to integrate because now we can look at this as integral x to the one half power dx one to four and then just do the entire derivative that i showed you add one to the power which is three half divided by the new power which is two over three and this right here is two over three x to the three over two and then plug in plug in here putting the four and then putting the one Putting the one. Okay. Okay. Four to the three over two is you take the square root of four first, and then you do the third power, which is two to the third power, which is eight. So it's eight times that, which is sixteen over three. This is one, so it's minus two over three. So on all, fourteen over three. It's almost like pi, but the other way around, huh? Wait, this is actually four point. No, it's now, no, sorry. Yeah, three, one, four, I just put the upside down. By the way, that will be easier. Okay. So it does have the advantage if you don't start with zero sometimes, but like that's, um, if you just want to get the region, then start with zero, much easier. And then especially if you are familiar with like, how to do the integral that you can do the so-called use substitution or some kind of magic and then you can figure out the answer one way or the other i wonder what if i don't do all 100 questions is there anybody who's going to notice if you have watched the whole thing definitely leave a comment down below link you know, but don't lie though be honest um, i did the whole thing <laughs> okay 97 no 96 limit n goes to infinity and then we have 1 over n sum i goes from 1 to infinity and then we have no 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 i always want to write like sigma dancing to the infinity because that's what we do in cal 2 all the time but no e to the 2i over n's power okay okay ready cool it's 1 over n so just integral going from 0 to 1 here this is 1 this is 2 so the function is e to the 2x okay integrate this e to the 2x stays but divided by 2 because that's the derivative of 2x and then just plug in numbers 0 and 1 be really careful with when you plug in zeros sometimes it does matter so don't ignore it so here we have 1 half e to the 2 times 1 and then minus plugging 0 1 half e to the 2 times 0 okay this is just 1 over 2 e squared and this is just 1 so just minus 1 half done 97 okay limit as n goes to infinity and we have 
pi over 4n sum i goes from 1 to n and then secant square pi i over 4n pi over 4 pi over 4 match this means we go from 0 to pi over 4 and the input is just what? secant square x dx okay yeah very different very different okay and now let's just work this out the real of the whole function will give us secant square the answer is tangent so tangent x 0 pi over 4 plugging pi over 4 tangent of pi over 4 is 1 plugging 0 tangent of 0 is 0 so all in all the answer is just 1 so nice yeah so I'm just going to write it right here because I want to fit another question here <laughs> number 98 number 98 okay here's the limit as n goes to infinity and then we have 1 over n sigma i goes from 1 to n and then we have cosine this is crazy it's just i over n wow how do we do this well same idea integral 0 to 1 because it's still 1 yeah 1 over n 1 over n match so this is just cosine x dx okay yeah and then let's just go ahead integrate this the root of the four the root of the four function will give us cosine the answer for that is just sine x positive though plugging one sine of one it's a number it's legit just leave it it's not like a special value you cannot really simplify so just sine of one plugging zero sine of zero is zero so the answer is just sine of one yeah so once you know what exactly you are looking for these right here are so beautiful <laughs> Let me see if I have a better marker here. Maybe. Ladies and gentlemen, number 99. All right. Limit. This is another expanded version. You guys will see why this is not. Oh, this is number 99 already. OK, focus. And over n square plus 1 plus n over n square plus 4 plus n over n square plus 9 so on so on so on up to wow n square over n square plus n square oh my god where's the over n part huh where is it? Pause the video and give this a try first. Done. By the way, let's do this. Huh? When you see this kind of question, do not just do the following and say, put the infinity here and here and say, hey, the degree right here is bigger than that so the answer is zero for the first one and then the next one is zero likewise zero and then just zero so we're just adding a bunch of zeros huh so the answer should just be zero no because the limit is zero think about this as zero plus and another thing is that as n goes to infinity we have how many terms you see the plus da 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 and this has n we actually have infinitely many of these kind of things so this is almost like saying 0 times infinity in determinant form. So cannot say any answer unless we do more work. It's a different kind of indeterminate form. OK, so how exactly do we do it though? Again, we want to see the sum number over n part. <sighs> hmm. 
Let's see. I know the answer, but like I just have to think about how to explain it so that I don't give it away right away. <laughs> Number ninety nine is tough. It's not a. It's not easy. <laughs> All right. One, four, nine. Hi. They look suspicious. Aren't they just a like one square, two square, three square, and so on? And remember. We want to have like i over n, huh? And then because it's a one square, two square, three square, so maybe we want to produce i over n square somehow. So let's do the following. Right here, let's divide this by n square, and of course do the same on the top. Divide this by n square, and do the same right here. And divide this by n square. Do the same, and then divide this by n square, and then do the same. What good does this do? Let's see. Okay, now I have to look for a marker that works. This is the one that I let it rest earlier. All right, here we have the limit. As n goes to infinity, check this out. If we have n over n square on the top, everybody has a one over n now. Perfect. Let's factor that out. Put it here, and then sum i goes from one to n. All right, and then let's see. Now because I put that over there already, so we have a one on the top and over. This over that is just one, and one square over n square. As we said earlier, that's exactly what we want, huh? That's plus parentheses i over n n square. This is two square over n square. This is three square over n square. So on, so on, so on. Good. All right. One over n and then one i over n. Right. So this is good. This becomes the integral going from zero to one. The function is one over one plus x squared dx. Integrating this, we get inverse tangent because the derivative inverse tangent is one over one plus x squared, and then we plug in, plug in, plugging one in here. Inverse tangent of one is pi over four. Plugging zero is zero. So this right here is it. That's number ninety-nine. So cool, huh? And you know what? Let let me let me actually write it down right here. This is zero to one, one over one plus x squared, and this is just inverse tangent of x going from zero to one. Final answer, pi over four. Yeah, because this way I can use the rest right here to do number one hundred. Number one hundred. Limit as n goes to infinity. Here we have that this marker is about to dry out too. It's just too warm inside here. Two over n plus two, and then two over n plus four, and then two over n plus six, two over n plus two n. So quite similar, huh? This time though, we have to recognize that two is the same as two times one. Um, and then this right here is the same as two times two, and then two times three, and so on. So maybe we can just divide the top and bottom by n, just like what we did earlier. Yes, or we can just factor all the n from the bottom. So it depends on how you like to look at it. Perhaps let's divide everybody by n. It's more consistent than what we did earlier. So let's do that. Perfect. So, so this right here is the limit as n goes to infinity, and then we have our two over n. Let's put.
put that right here. Sum i goes from 1 to n, and then now on the top is just 1, and then we have 1, right? And then I'm going to write it as plus, and we have this is like 2i, yeah? 2i over n. Yes, so it's like this. Yeah. Is it? Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, so yeah, here we have the integral going from 0 to 2. And then the function is 1 over 1 plus is x or 2x? x. Match, right? So x. Okay, dx. Integrating this is ln of 1 plus x. We don't need the absolute value because everything is positive. Ladies and gentlemen, plugging 2, we get ln 3. Plugging 0, ln 1 is 0. Final answer, ln 3. 100 limits. There you have it. You know it. I don't just do 100 limits. Let's see if we can fit in number 101 here as well. Yes, of course. All right, question number 101. What's the question? Limit as n goes to infinity, and then we have the nth root of n factorial over n to the nth power. Why is this one number 101? Yeah, because this right here has the most amount of view. Right, I have a video just on this, over 1 million views, right, my brilliant limit. Yeah, yeah. thanks to Brilliant for sponsoring me for throughout this year. I really appreciate everybody's help and everybody's watching video and then all the sponsors that I have, I'm very grateful. I'm debating to see if I can show you guys two solutions here. Do you guys want two solutions? I, I think just to honor the, the brilliant limit, I am going to do the same thing, uh, kind of consistent of what we did. Let me see if I can fit in everything. Firstly, actually no, I, I cannot fit in everything. So if you want to see the original way that I solved this, go ahead and check out my other video right here. I would like to show you guys another way to solve it. This is true. I don't have a place to prove. So I'll just tell you, note, if we have the limit as n goes to infinity of an nth root of some sequence, now a n like this, this right here is actually the same as the limit as n goes to infinity of a n plus 1 over a n. Yeah. Where did I saw this? Where, 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 where did I see this? I, I saw this on Wikipedia. <laughs> so yeah, this fits this condition. And then I can finish this nicely. Remember, the answer that we got from the brilliant limit is 1 over e, so keep that in mind. I will show you that this is actually 1 over e as well. Okay, This is 1 over e. Right, so... Cool. Now, this right here is our inner limit, so it's just a n, yeah? So, let's just go ahead and check. I don't know this yet, okay, of course. So, this right here is the limit as n goes to infinity, it's like whenever we have the nth root, just look at inside and then just do a n plus 1, meaning that we do n plus 1, and then we factorial that, sorry, n plus 1, so n plus 1, factorial that, and then n plus 1, raised to the n plus 1 power. And then we want to divide it by a, a n, which is the same as just multiply by its reciprocal. So I'm just going to put n to the nth power over n factorial. 
So if you have done some Calc 2 stuff, the ratio test or whatsoever, yeah, pretty much that. Now, break this apart as n plus 1 times n factorial, and you see that n factorial cancels off very nicely. What's this though? We can also break it apart. Write this as n plus 1 to the nth power first times n plus 1 to the first power. And then we see that it happens to be that like n plus 1 and n plus 1 cancel very nicely. And this is so wonderful because this has the nth power likewise that, so we can put them together as the one's n power like this. So this is the limit as n goes to infinity. n over that, so n over n plus 1 power raised to the nth power. Now, how do we do this? We have done something similar like this, right? Yes, the secret weapon. Flip this, negate that. Here, this is the limit as n goes to infinity. n plus 1 over n raised to the negative nth power. And you know it, this right here is just the limit as n goes to infinity. 1 plus 1 over n raised to the negative nth power. And you know it, ladies and gentlemen, a is 1, b is equal to negative 1, so all in all, the answer is e to the 1 times negative 1, which is negative 1. This is how dirty my hand is. Yeah, because this thing is so dirty. Uh, I should wash it. Yeah. I, I do wash it occasionally, like every other week or so. Yeah, I have a couple of those. But anyway though, 101 limits. Hopefully this video uh, can help you with your calculus one, calculus two class. If you are my student, hopefully you're watching it. Uh, maybe I'll pick some questions from here to be to put on her test. Yeah, and you know it. I told you guys I run marathons, so I'll show you guys. Yes, this is the marathon medal that I have. Yeah, the very first one definitely means the most to me. I put it up. Ah, let me. Oy. So finally you have some limits. <laughs> I, I don't know what else to say. Thank you guys so much. Thank you for all my subscribers, all my viewers and all the sponsors all my Patreons and all my channel members, everybody. Almost 1 million subscribers, can you guys believe that? Insane. Fun fact, uh, I remember I reached, I reached 10,000 subscribers on October 20th, 2016. So it would be kind of interesting or funny that I reached exactly 100 exactly 1 million subscribers on the same day but uh, six years later that, that's kind of cool I don't know though <sighs> anyway you guys know it as always that's it <laughs>